The Dark Lady of the Sonnets Preface to the Dark Lady of the Sonnets How the play came to be written I had better explain why, in this little piece the occasion. Written for a performance in aid of the funds of the project for establishing a national theater as a memorial to Shakespeare, I have identified the Dark Lady with Mistress Mary Fitton. First, let me say that I do not contend that the Dark Lady was Mary Fitton, because when the case in Mary's favor, or against her. If you please to consider that the Dark Lady was no better than she ought to have been, was complete, a portrait of Mary came to light and turned out to be that of a fair lady, not of a dark one. That settles the question, if the portrait is authentic, which I see no reason to doubt, and the lady's hair undyed, which is perhaps less certain. Shakespeare rubbed in the lady's complexion in his sonnets mercilessly, for in his day black hair was as unpopular as red hair was in the early days of Queen Victoria. Any tinge lighter than raven black must be held fatal to the strongest claim to be the dark lady. And so, unless it can be shown that Shakespeare's sonnets exasperated Mary Fitton into dyeing her hair and getting painted in false colors, I must give up all pretense that my play is historical. The later suggestion of Mr. Atchison that the dark lady, far from being a maid of honor, kept a tavern in Oxford and was the mother of Davenant the poet, is the one I should have adopted had I wished to be up to date. Why, then, did I introduce the dark lady as Mistress Fitton? Well, I had two reasons. The play was not to have been written by me at all, but by Mrs. Alfred Littleton. And it was she who suggested a scene of jealousy between Queen Elizabeth and the Dark Lady at the expense of the unfortunate bard. Now this, if the Dark Lady was a maid of honor, was quite easy. If she were a tavern landlady, it would have strained all probability. So I stuck to Mary Fitton. But I had another and more personal reason. I was, in a manner, present at the birth of the Fitton theory. Its parent and I had become acquainted. And he used to consult me on obscure passages in the sonnets, on which, as far as I can remember, I never succeeded in throwing the faintest light, at a time when nobody else thought my opinion. On that or any other subject, of the slightest importance. I thought it would be friendly to immortalize him, as the silly literary saying is, much as Shakespeare immortalized Mr. W. H., as he said he would, simply by writing about him. Let me tell the story formally. Thomas Tyler. Throughout the eighties at least, and probably for some years before. The British Museum reading room was used daily by a gentleman of such astonishing and crushing ugliness that no one who had once seen him could ever thereafter forget him. He was of fair complexion, rather golden red than sandy, aged between forty-five and sixty, and dressed in frock coat and tall hat of presentable but never new appearance. His figure was rectangular, waistless, neckless, ankleless, of middle height, looking shortish because, though he was not particularly stout, there was nothing slender about him. His ugliness was not unamiable, it was accidental, external, excrescential. Attached to his face from the left ear to the point of his chin was a monstrous goiter, which hung down to his collar bone, and was very inadequately balanced by a smaller one on his right eyelid. Nature's malice was so overdone in his case that it somehow failed to produce the effect of repulsion it seemed to have aimed at. When you first met Thomas Tyler you could think of nothing else but whether surgery could really do nothing for him. But after a very brief acquaintance you never thought of his disfigurements at all, and talked to him as you might to Romeo or Lovelace. Only, so many people, especially women, would not risk the preliminary ordeal, that he remained a man apart and a bachelor all his days. I am not to be frightened or prejudiced by a tumor and I struck up a cordial acquaintance with him, in the course of which he kept me pretty closely on the track of his work at the museum, in which I was then, like himself, a daily reader. He was by profession a man of letters of an uncommercial kind. He was a specialist in pessimism, had made a translation of Ecclesiastes of which eight copies a year were sold, and followed up the pessimism of Shakespeare and Swift with keen interest. He delighted in a hideous conception which he called the theory of the cycles. According to which the history of mankind and the universe keeps eternally repeating itself without the slightest variation throughout all eternity. 
so that he had lived and died and had his goiter before and would live and die and have it again and again and again. He liked to believe that nothing that happened to him was completely novel, he was persuaded that he often had some recollection of its previous occurrence in the last cycle. He hunted out allusions to this favorite theory in his three favorite pessimists. He tried his hand occasionally at deciphering ancient inscriptions, reading them as people seem to read the stars, by discovering bears and bulls and swords and goats where, as it seems to me, no sane human being can see anything but stars higgledy-piggledy. Next to the translation of Ecclesiastes, his magnum opus was his work on Shakespeare's sonnets, in which he accepted a previous identification of Mr. W. H. The online begetter of the sonnets, with the Earl of Pembroke, William Herbert, and promulgated his own identification of Mistress Mary Fitton with the Dark Lady. Whether he was right or wrong about the Dark Lady did not matter urgently to me, she might have been Maria Tompkins for all I cared. But Tyler would have it that she was Mary Fitton. And he tracked Mary down from the first of her marriages in her teens to her tomb in Cheshire, whither he made a pilgrimage and whence returned in triumph with a picture of her statue. And the news that he was convinced she was a dark lady by traces of paint still discernible. In due course he published his edition of the sonnets, with the evidence he had collected. He lent me a copy of the book, which I never returned. But I reviewed it in the Pall Mall Gazette on the 7th of January 1886, and thereby let loose the Fitton theory in a wider circle of readers than the book could reach. Then Tyler died, sinking unnoted like a stone in the sea. I observe that Mr. Acheson, Mrs. Davenant's champion, calls him reverend. It may very well be that he got his knowledge of Hebrew in reading for the church, and there was always something of the clergyman or the schoolmaster in his dress and air. Possibly he may actually have been ordained. But he never told me that or anything else about his affairs. And his black pessimism would have shot him violently out of any church at present established in the West. We never talked about affairs, we talked about Shakespeare, and the Dark Lady, and Swift, and Koheleth, and the Cycles. And the mysterious moments when a feeling came over us that this had happened to us before, and about the forgeries of the Pentateuch which were offered for sale to the British Museum. And about literature and things of the spirit generally. He always came to my desk at the museum and spoke to me about something or other, no doubt finding that people who were keen on this sort of conversation were rather scarce. He remains a vivid spot of memory in the void of my forgetfulness, a quite considerable and dignified soul in a grotesquely disfigured body. Frank Harris To the review in the Pall Mall Gazette I attribute, rightly or wrongly, the introduction of Mary Fitton to Mr. Frank Harris. My reason for this is that Mr. Harris wrote a play about Shakespeare and Mary Fitton. And when I, as a pious duty to Tyler's ghost, reminded the world that it was to Tyler we owed the Fitton theory, Frank Harris, who clearly had not a notion of what had first put Mary into his head, believed, I think, that I had invented Tyler expressly for his discomfiture. For the stress I laid on Tyler's claims must have seemed unaccountable and perhaps malicious on the assumption that he was to me a mere name among the thousands of names in the British Museum. Catalogue. Therefore I make it clear that I had and have personal reasons for remembering Tyler, and for regarding myself as in some sort charged with the duty of reminding the world of his work. I am sorry for his sake that Mary's portrait is fair, and that Mr. W. H. has veered round again from Pembroke to Southampton. But even so his work was not wasted, it is by exhausting all the hypotheses that we reach the verifiable one, and after all, the wrong road always leads somewhere. Frank Harris's play was written long before mine. I read it in manuscript before the Shakespeare Memorial National Theatre was mooted. And if there is anything except the Fitton theory, which is Tyler's property, in my play which is also in Mr. Harris's it was I who annexed it from him and not he from me. It does not matter anyhow, because this play of mine is a brief trifle, and full of manifest impossibilities at that, whilst Mr. Harris's play is serious both in size, intention, and quality. But there could not in the nature of things be much resemblance, because Frank conceives Shakespeare to have been a broken-hearted, melancholy, enormously sentimental person. 
Whereas I am convinced that he was very like myself, in fact, if I had been born in 1556 instead of in 1856. I should have taken to blank verse and given Shakespeare a harder run for his money than all the other Elizabethans put together. Yet the success of Frank Harris's book on Shakespeare gave me great delight. To those who know the literary world of London there was a sharp stroke of ironic comedy in the irresistible verdict in its favor. In critical literature there is one prize that is always open to competition, one blue ribbon that always carries the highest critical rank with it. To win, you must write the best book of your generation on Shakespeare. It is felt on all sides that to do this a certain fastidious refinement, a delicacy of taste, a correctness of manner and tone. And high academic distinction in addition to the indispensable scholarship and literary reputation, are needed. And men who pretend to these qualifications are constantly looked to with a gentle expectation that presently they will achieve the great feat. Now if there is a man on earth who is the utter contrary of everything that this description implies, whose very existence is an insult to the ideal it realizes, whose eye disparages, whose resonant voice denounces, whose cold shoulder jostles every decency, every delicacy, every amenity, every dignity, every sweet usage of that quiet life of mutual admiration in which perfect Shakespearean appreciation is expected to arise, that man is Frank Harris. Here is one who is extraordinarily qualified, by a range of sympathy and understanding that extends from the ribaldry of a buccaneer to the shyest tendernesses of the most sensitive poetry. To be all things to all men, yet whose proud humor it is to be to every man, provided the man is eminent and pretentious, the champion of his enemies. To the archbishop he is an atheist, to the atheist a Catholic mystic, to the Bismarckian imperialist an Anacarsis Klutz, to Anacarsis Klutz a Washington, to Mrs. Proudy a Don Juan, to Aspasia a John Knox, in short, to everyone his complement rather than his counterpart, his antagonist rather than his fellow creature. Always provided, however, that the persons thus confronted are respectable persons. Sophie Perovskaya, who perished on the scaffold for blowing Alexander II to fragments, may perhaps have echoed Hamlet's. O oh God, Horatio! What a wounded name! Things standing thus unknown, I leave behind. But Frank Harris, in his Sonia, has rescued her from that injustice, and enshrined her among the saints. He has lifted the Chicago anarchists out of their infamy, and shown that, compared with the capitalism that killed them, they were heroes and martyrs. He has done this with the most unusual power of conviction. The story, as he tells it, inevitably and irresistibly displaces all the vulgar, mean, purblind, spiteful versions. There is a precise realism and an unsmiling, measured, determined sincerity which gives a strange dignity to the work of one whose fixed practice and ungovernable impulse it is to kick conventional dignity whenever he sees it. Harris, Der Schmidlade with Send. Frank Harris is everything except a humorist, not, apparently, from stupidity, but because scorn overcomes humor in him. Nobody ever dreamt of reproaching Milton's Lucifer for not seeing the comic side of his fall, and nobody who has read Mr. Harris's stories desires to have them lightened by chapters from the hand of Artemis Ward. Yet he knows the taste and the value of humor. He was one of the few men of letters who really appreciated Oscar Wilde, though he did not rally fiercely to Wilde's side until the world deserted Oscar in his ruin. I myself was present at a curious meeting between the two, when Harris, on the eve of the Queensberry trial, prophesied to Wilde with miraculous precision exactly what immediately afterwards happened to him, and warned him to leave the country. It was the first time within my knowledge that such a forecast proved true. Wilde, though under no illusion as to the folly of the quite unselfish suit at law he had been persuaded to begin, nevertheless so miscalculated the force of the social vengeance he was unloosing on himself that he fancied it could be stayed by putting up the editor of the Saturday Review, as Mr. Harris then was, to declare that he considered Dorian Gray a highly moral book, which it certainly is. When Harris foretold him the truth, Wilde denounced him as a faint-hearted friend who was failing him in his hour of need, and left the room in anger. 
Harris's idiosyncratic power of pity saved him from feeling or showing the smallest resentment. And events presently proved to Wilde how insanely he had been advised in taking the action, and how accurately Harris had gauged the situation. The same capacity for pity governs Harris's study of Shakespeare, whom, as I have said, he pities too much. But that he is not insensible to humor is shown not only by his appreciation of Wilde, but by the fact that the group of contributors who made his editorship of the Saturday Review so remarkable, and of whom I speak none the less highly because I happen to be one of them myself, were all, in their various ways, humorists. Sidney's sister, Pembroke's mother. And now to return to Shakespeare. Though Mr. Harris followed Tyler in identifying Mary Fitton as the Dark Lady, and the Earl of Pembroke as the addressee of the other sonnets and the man who made love successfully to Shakespeare's mistress. He very characteristically refuses to follow Tyler on one point, though for the life of me I cannot remember whether it was one of the surmises which Tyler published. Or only one which he submitted to me to see what I would say about it, just as he used to submit difficult lines from the sonnets. This surmise was that, Sidney's sister, Pembroke's mother, set Shakespeare on to persuade Pembroke to marry. And that this was the explanation of those earlier sonnets which so persistently and unnaturally urged matrimony on Mr. W. H. I take this to be one of the brightest of Tyler's ideas. Because the persuasions in the sonnets are unaccountable and out of character unless they were offered to please somebody whom Shakespeare desired to please. And who took a motherly interest in Pembroke. There is a further temptation in the theory for me. The most charming of all Shakespeare's old women, indeed the most charming of all his women, young or old, is the Countess of Roussillon in All's Well That Ends Well. It has a certain individuality among them which suggests a portrait. Mr. Harris will have it that all Shakespeare's nice old women are drawn from his beloved mother. But I see no evidence whatever that Shakespeare's mother was a particularly nice woman or that he was particularly fond of her. That she was a simple incarnation of extravagant maternal pride like the mother of Coriolanus in Plutarch, as Mr. Harris asserts, I cannot believe, she is quite as likely to have borne her son a grudge for becoming one of these harlotry players and disgracing the Ardens. Anyhow, as a conjectural model for the Countess of Roussillon, I prefer that one of whom Johnson wrote. Sidney's sister, Pembroke's mother. Death, ere thou hast slain another. Learned and fair and good as she. Time shall throw a dart at thee. But Frank will not have her at any price, because his ideal Shakespeare is rather like a sailor in a melodrama, and a sailor in a melodrama must adore his mother. I do not at all belittle such sailors. They are the emblems of human generosity, but Shakespeare was not an emblem, he was a man and the author of Hamlet, who had no illusions about his mother. In weak moments one almost wishes he had. Shakespeare's Social Standing On the vexed question of Shakespeare's social standing Mr. Harris says that Shakespeare had not had the advantage of a middle-class training. I suggest that Shakespeare missed this questionable advantage, not because he was socially too low to have attained to it. But because he conceived himself as belonging to the upper class from which our public school boys are now drawn. Let Mr. Harris survey for a moment the field of contemporary journalism. He will see there some men who have the very characteristics from which he infers that Shakespeare was at a social disadvantage through his lack of middle-class training. They are rowdy, ill-mannered, abusive, mischievous, fond of quoting obscene schoolboy anecdotes. Adepts in that sort of blackmail which consists in mercilessly libeling and insulting every writer whose opinions are sufficiently heterodox to make it almost impossible for him to risk perhaps five years of a slender income by an appeal to a prejudiced orthodox jury. And they see nothing in all this cruel blaggardism but an uproariously jolly rag, although they are by no means without genuine literary ability, a love of letters and even some artistic conscience. But he will find not one of the models of this type, I say nothing of mere imitators of it, below the rank that looks at the middle class, not humbly and enviously from below, but insolently from above. Mr. Harris himself notes Shakespeare's contempt for the tradesman and mechanic, 
and his incorrigible addiction to smutty jokes. He does us the public service of sweeping away the familiar plea of the bardolatrous ignoramus, that Shakespeare's coarseness was part of the manners of his time. Putting his pen with precision on the one name, Spencer, that is necessary to expose such a libel on Elizabethan decency. There was nothing whatever to prevent Shakespeare from being as decent as Moore was before him, or Bunyan after him, and as self-respecting as Raleigh or Sidney, except the tradition of his class. In which education or statesmanship may no doubt be acquired by those who have a turn for them, but in which insolence, derision, profligacy, obscene jesting, debt contracting, and rowdy mischievousness, give continual scandal to the pious, serious, industrious, solvent bourgeois. No other class is infatuated enough to believe that gentlemen are born and not made by a very elaborate process of culture. Even kings are taught and coached and drilled from their earliest boyhood to play their part. But the man of family, I am convinced that Shakespeare took that view of himself, will plunge into society without a lesson in table manners, into politics without a lesson in history, into the city without a lesson in business, and into the army without a lesson in honor. It has been said, with the object of proving Shakespeare a laborer, that he could hardly write his name. Why? Because he had not the advantage of a middle-class training. Shakespeare himself tells us, through Hamlet, that gentlemen purposely wrote badly lest they should be mistaken for scriveners. But most of them, then as now, wrote badly because they could not write any better. In short, the whole range of Shakespeare's foibles, the snobbishness, the naughtiness, the contempt for tradesmen and mechanics. The assumption that witty conversation can only mean smutty conversation, the flunkyism toward social superiors and insolence toward social inferiors. The easy ways with servants which is seen not only between the two gentlemen of Verona and their valets. But in the affection and respect inspired by a great servant like Adam, all these are the characteristics of Eton and Harrow, not of the public elementary or private adventure school. They prove, as everything we know about Shakespeare suggests, that he thought of the Shakespeare's and Arden's as families of consequence. And regarded himself as a gentleman under a cloud through his father's ill luck in business, and never for a moment as a man of the people. This is at once the explanation of an excuse for his snobbery. He was not a parvenu trying to cover his humble origin with a purchased coat of arms, he was a gentleman resuming what he conceived to be his natural position as soon as he gained the means to keep it up. This side idolatry. There is another matter which I think Mr. Harris should ponder. He says that Shakespeare was but little esteemed by his own generation. He even describes Johnson's description of his little Latin and less Greek as a sneer, whereas it occurs in an unmistakably sincere eulogy of Shakespeare, written after his death and is clearly meant to heighten the impression of Shakespeare's prodigious natural endowments by pointing out that they were not due to scholastic acquirements. Now there is a sense in which it is true enough that Shakespeare was too little esteemed by his own generation, or, for the matter of that, by any subsequent generation. The barges on the Regent's Canal do not chant Shakespeare's verses as the gondoliers in Venice are said to chant the verses of Tasso, a practice which was suspended for some reason during my stay in. Venice, at least no gondolier ever did it in my hearing. Shakespeare is no more a popular author than Rodin is a popular sculptor or Richard Strauss a popular composer. But Shakespeare was certainly not such a fool as to expect the Toms, Dicks, and Harrys of his time to be any more interested in dramatic poetry than Newton, later on. Expected them to be interested in fluxions. And when we come to the question whether Shakespeare missed that assurance which all great men have had from the more capable and susceptible members of their generation that they were great men, Ben Jonson's evidence disposes of so improbable a notion at once and forever. I loved the man, says Ben, this side idolatry, as well as any. Now why in the name of common sense should he have made that qualification unless there had been, not only idolatry, but idolatry fulsome enough to irritate Johnson into an express disavowal of it. Johnson, the bricklayer, must have felt sore sometimes when Shakespeare spoke and wrote of bricklayers as his inferiors. He must have felt it a little hard that being a better scholar, 
and perhaps a braver and tougher man physically than Shakespeare, he was not so successful or so well liked. But in spite of this he praised Shakespeare to the utmost stretch of his powers of eulogy, in fact, notwithstanding his disclaimer, he did not stop this side idolatry. If, therefore, even Johnson felt himself forced to clear himself of extravagance and absurdity in his appreciation of Shakespeare. There must have been many people about who idolized Shakespeare as American ladies idolized Paderewski, and who carried bardolatry, even in the bard's own time. To an extent that threatened to make his reasonable admirers ridiculous. Shakespeare's Pessimism I submit to Mr. Harris that by ruling out this idolatry, and its possible effect in making Shakespeare think that his public would stand anything from him. He has ruled out a far more plausible explanation of the faults of such a play as Timon of Athens than his theory that Shakespeare's passion for the Dark Lady cankered and took on proud flesh in him. And tortured him to nervous breakdown and madness. In Timon the intellectual bankruptcy is obvious enough, Shakespeare tried once too often to make a play out of the cheap pessimism which is thrown into despair by a comparison of actual human nature with theoretical morality. Actual law and administration with abstract justice, and so forth. But Shakespeare's perception of the fact that all men, judged by the moral standard which they apply to others and by which they justify their punishment of others, are fools and scoundrels. Does not date from the dark lady complication he seems to have been born with it. If in the comedy of errors and a midsummer night's dream the persons of the drama are not quite so ready for treachery and murder as Laertes and even Hamlet himself, not to mention the procession of ruffians who pass through the latest plays, it is certainly not because they have any more regard for law or religion. There is only one place in Shakespeare's plays where the sense of shame is used as a human attribute. And that is where Hamlet is ashamed, not of anything he himself has done, but of his mother's relations with his uncle. This scene is an unnatural one, the son's reproaches to his mother, even the fact of his being able to discuss the subject with her, is more repulsive than her relations with her deceased husband's brother. Here, too, Shakespeare betrays for once his religious sense by making Hamlet, in his agony of shame, declare that his mother's conduct makes sweet religion a rhapsody of words. But for that passage we might almost suppose that the feeling of Sunday morning in the country which Orlando describes so perfectly in As You Like It was the beginning and end of Shakespeare's notion. Of religion. I say almost, because Isabella in measure for measure has religious charm, in spite of the conventional theatrical assumption that female religion means an inhumanly ferocious chastity. But for the most part Shakespeare differentiates his heroes from his villains much more by what they do than by what they are. Don John in Much Ado is a true villain, a man with a malicious will. But he is too dull a duffer to be of any use in a leading part, and when we come to the great villains like Macbeth, we find, as Mr. Harris points out, that they are precisely identical with the heroes, Macbeth is only Hamlet incongruously committing murders and engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combats. And Hamlet, who does not dream of apologizing for the three murders he commits, is always apologizing because he has not yet committed a fourth, and finds, to his great bewilderment, that he does not want to commit it. It cannot be, he says, but I am pigeon-livered, and lack gall to make oppression bitter, else, ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful. Really one is tempted to suspect that when Shylock asks, hates any man the thing he would not kill? He is expressing the natural and proper sentiments of the human race as Shakespeare understood them, and not the vindictiveness of a stage Jew. Gaiety of Genius In view of these facts, it is dangerous to cite Shakespeare's pessimism as evidence of the despair of a heart broken by the Dark Lady. There is an irrepressible gaiety of genius which enables it to bear the whole weight of the world's misery without blenching. There is a laugh always ready to avenge its tears of discouragement. In the lines which Mr. Harris quotes only to declare that he can make nothing of them, and to condemn them as out of character, Richard III. Immediately after pitying himself because There is no creature loves me. And if I die no soul will pity me adds, with a grin. Nay, 
wherefore should they? Since that I myself find in myself no pity for myself? Let me again remind Mr. Harris of Oscar Wilde. We all dreaded to read De Profundis, our instinct was to stop our ears, or run away from the wail of a broken, though by no means contrite, heart. But we were throwing away our pity. De Profundis was De Profundis indeed, Wilde was too good a dramatist to throw away so powerful an effect, but nonetheless it was De Profundis in Excelsis. There was more laughter between the lines of that book than in a thousand farces by men of no genius. Wilde, like Richard and Shakespeare, found in himself no pity for himself. There is nothing that marks the born dramatist more unmistakably than this discovery of comedy in his own misfortunes almost in proportion to the pathos with which the ordinary man announces there. Tragedy I cannot for the life of me see the broken heart in Shakespeare's latest works. Hark, hark! The lark at heaven's gate sings, is not the lyric of a broken man. Nor is Cloden's comment that if Imogen does not appreciate it, it is a vice in her ears which horse hairs, and cat's guts, and the voice of unpaved eunuch to boot, can never amend. The sally of a saddened one. Is it not clear that to the last there was in Shakespeare an incorrigible divine levity, an inexhaustible joy that derided sorrow? Think of the poor dark lady having to stand up to this unbearable power of extracting a grim fun from everything. Mr. Harris writes as if Shakespeare did all the suffering and the dark lady all the cruelty. But why does he not put himself in the dark lady's place for a moment as he has put himself so successfully in Shakespeare's? Imagine her reading the hundred and thirtieth sonnet. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are dun. If hairs be wire, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked, red and white. But no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight. Than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know. That music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare. As any she belied with false compare. Take this as a sample of the sort of compliment from which she was never for a moment safe with Shakespeare. Bear in mind that she was not a comedian. That the Elizabethan fashion of treating brunettes as ugly woman must have made her rather sore on the subject of her complexion. That no human being, male or female, can conceivably enjoy being chaffed on that point in the fourth couplet about the perfumes. That Shakespeare's revulsions, as the sonnet immediately preceding shows, were as violent as his ardors. And were expressed with the realistic power and horror that makes Hamlet say that the heavens got sick when they saw the Queen's conduct. And then ask Mr. Harris whether any woman could have stood it for long, or have thought that the sugred compliment worth the cruel wounds, the cleaving of the heart in twain. That seemed to Shakespeare as natural and amusing a reaction as the burlesquing of his heroics by Pistol, his sermons by Falstaff, and his poems by Cloten and Touchstone. Jupiter and Semele. This does not mean that Shakespeare was cruel, evidently he was not. But it was not cruelty that made Jupiter reduce Semele to ashes, it was the fact that he could not help being a god nor she help being a mortal. The one thing Shakespeare's passion for the dark lady was not, was what Mr. Harris in one passage calls it, idolatrous. If it had been, she might have been able to stand it. The man who dotes yet doubts, suspects, yet strongly loves, is tolerable even by a spoilt and tyrannical mistress, but what woman could possibly endure a man who dotes without doubting? Who knows, and who is hugely amused at the absurdity of his infatuation for a woman of whose mortal imperfections not one escapes him, a man always exchanging grins with Yorick's skull. And inviting, my lady, to laugh at the sepulchral humor of the fact that though she paint an inch thick, which the dark lady may have done, to Yorick's favor she must come at last. To the dark lady he must sometimes have seemed cruel beyond description, an intellectual Caliban. 
True, a Caliban who could say. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises. Sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments. Will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices. That, if I then had waked after long sleep. Will make me sleep again. And then, in dreaming. The clouds, methought, would open and show riches. Ready to drop on me, that when I whacked. I cried to dream again. Which is very lovely. But the dark lady may have had that vice in her ears which Cloten dreaded, she may not have seen the beauty of it. Whereas there can be no doubt at all that of, my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun, etc. Not a word was lost on her. And is it to be supposed that Shakespeare was too stupid or too modest not to see at last that it was a case of Jupiter and Semele? Shakespeare was most certainly not modest in that sense. The timid cough of the minor poet was never heard from him. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments. Of princes. Shall outlive this powerful rhyme. Is only one out of a dozen passages in which he, possibly with a keen sense of the fun of scandalizing the modest coffers, proclaimed his place and his power in the wide world dreaming of things to come. The dark lady most likely thought this side of him insufferably conceited. For there is no reason to suppose that she liked his plays any better than Minna Wagner liked Richard's music dramas, as likely as not, she thought the Spanish tragedy worth six hamlets. He was not stupid either if his class limitations and a profession that cut him off from actual participation in great affairs of state had not confined his opportunities of intellectual and political training to private conversation and to the mermaid tavern. He would probably have become one of the ablest men of his time instead of being merely its ablest playwright. One might surmise that Shakespeare found out that the dark lady's brains could no more keep pace with his than in Hathaway's. If there were any evidence that their friendship ceased when he stopped writing sonnets to her. As a matter of fact the consolidation of a passion into an enduring intimacy generally puts an end to sonnets. That the dark lady broke Shakespeare's heart, as Mr. Harris will have it she did, is an extremely unshakespearean hypothesis. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love, says Rosalind. Richard of Gloucester, into whom Shakespeare put all his own impish superiority to vulgar sentiment, exclaims. And this word, love, which greybeards call divine. Be resident in men like one another. And not in me, I am myself alone. Hamlet has not a tear for Ophelia, her death moves him to fierce disgust for the sentimentality of Laertes by her grave. And when he discusses the scene with Horatio immediately after, he utterly forgets her, though he is sorry he forgot himself, and jumps at the proposal of a fencing match to finish the day with. As against this view Mr. Harris pleads Romeo, Orsino, and even Antonio, and he does it so penetratingly that he convinces you that Shakespeare did betray himself again and again in these characters. But self-betrayal is one thing, and self-portrayal, as in Hamlet and Mercutio, is another. Shakespeare never saw himself, as actors say, in Romeo or Orsino or Antonio. In Mr. Harris's own play Shakespeare is presented with the most pathetic tenderness. He is tragic, bitter, pitiable, wretched and broken among a robust crowd of Johnsons and Elizabeths. But to me he is not Shakespeare because I miss the Shakespearean irony and the Shakespearean gaiety. Take these away and Shakespeare is no longer Shakespeare, all the bite, the impetus, the strength, the grim delight in his own power of looking terrible facts in the face with a chuckle, is gone. And you have nothing left but that most depressing of all things, a victim. Now who can think of Shakespeare as a man with a grievance? Even in that most thoroughgoing and inspired of all Shakespeare's loves, his love of music, which Mr. Harris has been the first to appreciate at anything like its value, there is a dash of mockery. Spit in the hole, man, and tune again divine air. Now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail the souls out of men's bodies? And he had been a dog that should have howled thus, they would have hanged him. 
There is just as much Shakespeare here as in the inevitable quotation about the sweet south and the bank of violets. I lay stress on this irony of Shakespeare's, this impish rejoicing in pessimism, this exultation in what breaks the hearts of common men. Not only because it is diagnostic of that immense energy of life which we call genius, but because its omission is the one glaring defect in Mr. Harris's otherwise extraordinarily penetrating book. Fortunately, it is an omission that does not disable the book as, in my judgment, it disabled the hero of the play, because Mr. Harris left himself out of his play, whereas he pervades his book, mordant, deep-voiced, and with an unconquerable style which is the man. The Idol of the Bartolators There is even an advantage in having a book on Shakespeare with the Shakespearean irony left out of account. I do not say that the missing chapter should not be added in the next edition, the hiatus is too great, it leaves the reader too uneasy before this touching picture of a writhing worm substituted for. The Invulnerable Giant But it is nonetheless probable that in no other way could Mr. Harris have got at his man as he has. For, after all, what is the secret of the hopeless failure of the academic bartolators to give us a credible or even interesting Shakespeare, and the easy triumph of Mr. Harris in giving us both. Simply that Mr. Harris has assumed that he was dealing with a man, whilst the others have assumed that they were writing about a god, and have therefore rejected every consideration of fact, tradition, or interpretation, that pointed to any human imperfection in their hero. They thus leave themselves with so little material that they are forced to begin by saying that we know very little about Shakespeare. As a matter of fact, with the plays and sonnets in our hands. We know much more about Shakespeare than we know about Dickens or Thackeray, the only difficulty is that we deliberately suppress it because it proves that Shakespeare was not only very unlike the conception of a god current in Clapham, but was not, according to the same reckoning, even a respectable man. The academic view starts with a Shakespeare who was not scurrilous. Therefore the verses about Lousy Lucy cannot have been written by him, and the cognate passages in the plays are either strokes of character drawing or gags interpolated by the actors. This ideal Shakespeare was too well behaved to get drunk. Therefore the tradition that his death was hastened by a drinking bout with Johnson and Drayton must be rejected, and the remorse of Cassio treated as a thing observed, not experienced, nay. The disgust of Hamlet at the drinking customs of Denmark is taken to establish Shakespeare as the superior of Alexander in self-control, and the greatest of teetotalers. Now this system of inventing your great man to start with, and then rejecting all the materials that do not fit him. With the ridiculous result that you have to declare that there are no materials at all, with your wastepaper basket full of them. Ends in leaving Shakespeare with a much worse character than he deserves. For though it does not greatly matter whether he wrote the lousy Lucy lines or not, and does not really matter at all whether he got drunk when he made a night of it with Johnson and Drayton. The sonnets raise an unpleasant question which does matter a good deal. And the refusal of the academic bartolators to discuss or even mention this question has had the effect of producing a silent verdict against Shakespeare. Mr. Harris tackles the question openly and has no difficulty whatever in convincing us that Shakespeare was a man of normal constitution sexually, and was not the victim of that most cruel and pitiable of all the freaks of nature, the freak which transposes the normal aim of the affections. Silence on this point means condemnation, and the condemnation has been general throughout the present generation, though it only needed Mr. Harris's fearless handling of the matter to sweep away what is nothing but a morbid and very disagreeable modern fashion. There is always some stock accusation brought against eminent persons. When I was a boy every well-known man was accused of beating his wife. Later on, for some unexplained reason, he was accused of psychopathic derangement. And this fashion is retrospective. The cases of Shakespeare and Michelangelo are cited as proving that every genius of the first magnitude was a sufferer. And both here and in Germany there are circles in which such derangement is grotesquely reverenced as part of the stigmata of heroic powers. All of which is gross nonsense. Unfortunately, in Shakespeare's case, prudery, 
which cannot prevent the accusation from being whispered, does prevent the refutation from being shouted. Mr. Harris, the deep-voiced, refuses to be silenced. He dismisses with proper contempt the stupidity which places an outrageous construction on Shakespeare's apologies in the sonnets for neglecting that perfect ceremony of love which consists in returning calls and making protestations and giving presents and paying the trumpery attentions which men of genius always refuse to bother about, and to which touchy people who have no genius attach so much importance. No leader who had not been tampered with by the psychopathic monomaniacs could ever put any construction but the obvious and innocent one on these passages. But the general vocabulary of the sonnets to Pembroke, or whoever, Mr. W. H., really was, is so overcharged according to modern ideas that a reply on the general case is necessary. Shakespeare's alleged sycophancy and perversion. That reply, which Mr. Harris does not hesitate to give, is twofold. First, that Shakespeare was, in his attitude towards earls, a sycophant. And, second, that the normality of Shakespeare's sexual constitution is only too well attested by the excessive susceptibility to the normal impulse shown in the whole mass of his writings. This latter is the really conclusive reply. In the case of Michelangelo, for instance, one must admit that if his works are set beside those of Titian or Paul Veronese, it is impossible not to be struck by the absence in the Florentine of that susceptibility to feminine charm which pervades the pictures of the Venetians. But, as Mr. Harris points out, though he does not use this particular illustration, Paul Veronese is an anchorite compared to Shakespeare. The language of the sonnets addressed to Pembroke, extravagant as it now seems, is the language of compliment and fashion, transfigured no doubt by Shakespeare's verbal magic, and hyperbolical. As Shakespeare always seems to people who cannot conceive so vividly as he, but still unmistakable for anything else than the expression of a friendship delicate enough to be wounded, and a manly loyalty deep enough to be outraged. But the language of the sonnets to the dark lady is the language of passion, their cruelty shows it. There is no evidence that Shakespeare was capable of being unkind in cold blood. But in his revulsions from love, he was bitter, wounding, even ferocious. Sparing neither himself or the unfortunate woman whose only offense was that she had reduced the great man to the common human denominator. In seizing on these two points Mr. Harris has made so sure a stroke, and placed his evidence so featly that there is nothing left for me to do but to plead that the second is sounder than the first, which is, I think. Marked by the prevalent mistake as to Shakespeare's social position, or, if you prefer it. The confusion between his actual social position as a penniless tradesman's son taking to the theatre for a livelihood, and his own conception of himself as a gentleman of good family. I am prepared to contend that though Shakespeare was undoubtedly sentimental in his expressions of devotion to Mr. W. H. Even to a point which nowadays makes both ridiculous, he was not sycophantic if Mr. W. H. was really attractive and promising, and Shakespeare deeply attached to him. A sycophant does not tell his patron that his fame will survive, not in the renown of his own actions, but in the sonnets of his sycophant. A sycophant, when his patron cuts him out in a love affair, does not tell his patron exactly what he thinks of him. Above all, a sycophant does not write to his patron precisely as he feels on all occasions, and this rare kind of sincerity is all over the sonnets. Shakespeare, we are told, was a very civil gentleman. This must mean that his desire to please people and be liked by them, and his reluctance to hurt their feelings, led him into amiable flattery even when his feelings were not strongly stirred. If this be taken into account along with the fact that Shakespeare conceived and expressed all his emotions with a vehemence that sometimes carried him into ludicrous extravagance, making Richard offer his kingdom for a horse and Othello declare of Cassio that, had all his hairs been lives, my great revenge, had stomach for them all. We shall see more civility and hyperbole than sycophancy even in the earlier and more cold-blooded sonnets. Shakespeare and Democracy. Now take the general case pled against Shakespeare as an enemy of democracy by Tolstoy, the late Ernest Crosby and others, and endorsed by Mr. Harris. Will it really stand fire? Mr. 
Harris emphasizes the passages in which Shakespeare spoke of mechanics and even of small master tradesmen as base persons whose clothes were greasy, whose breath was rank, and whose political imbecility and caprice moved Coriolanus to say to the Roman radical who demanded at least good words from him. He that will give good words to thee will flatter. Beneath abhorring. But let us be honest. As political sentiments these lines are an abomination to every Democrat. But suppose they are not political sentiments. Suppose they are merely a record of observed fact. John Stuart Mill told our British workmen that they were mostly liars. Carlyle told us all that we are mostly fools. Matthew Arnold and Ruskin were more circumstantial and more abusive. Everybody, including the workers themselves, know that they are dirty, drunken, foul-mouthed, ignorant, gluttonous, prejudiced, in short, heirs to the peculiar ills of poverty and slavery, as well as co-heirs with the plutocracy to all the failings of human nature. Even Shelley admitted, two hundred years after Shakespeare wrote Coriolanus, that universal suffrage was out of the question. Surely the real test, not of democracy, which was not a live political issue in Shakespeare's time, but of impartiality in judging classes, which is what one demands from a great human poet. Is not that he should flatter the poor and denounce the rich, but that he should weigh them both in the same balance. Now whoever will read Lear and Measure for Measure will find stamped on his mind such an appalled sense of the danger of dressing man in a little brief authority. Such a merciless stripping of the purple from the poor, bare, forked animal, that calls itself a king and fancies itself a god that one wonders what was the real nature of the mysterious restraint that kept Eliza and R. James from teaching Shakespeare to be civil to crowned heads. Just as one wonders why Tolstoy was allowed to go free when so many less terrible levelers went to the galleys or Siberia. From the mature Shakespeare we get no such scenes of village snobbery as that between the stage country gentleman Alexander Iden and the stage radical Jack Cade. We get the shepherd in as you like it, and many honest, brave, human, and loyal servants, beside the inevitable comic ones. Even in the Jingo play, Henry V, we get Bates and Williams drawn with all respect and honor as normal rank and file men. In Julius Caesar, Shakespeare went to work with a will when he took his cue from Plutarch in glorifying regicide and transfiguring the Republicans. Indeed hero worshippers have never forgiven him for belittling Caesar and failing to see that side of his assassination which made Goethe denounce it as the most senseless of crimes. Put the play beside the Charles I of Wills, in which Cromwell is written down to a point at which the Jack Cade of Henry VI becomes a hero in comparison. And then believe, if you can, that Shakespeare was one of them that crook the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift may follow fawning. Think of Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, Osric, the fop who annoyed Hotspur, and a dozen passages concerning such people. If such evidence can prove anything, and Mr. Harris relies throughout on such evidence, Shakespeare loathed courtiers. If, on the other hand, Shakespeare's characters are mostly members of the leisured classes, the same thing is true of Mr. Harris's own plays and mine. Industrial slavery is not compatible with that freedom of adventure, that personal refinement and intellectual culture, that scope of action, which the higher and subtler drama demands. Even Cervantes had finally to drop Don Quixote's troubles with innkeepers demanding to be paid for his food and lodging, and make him as free of economic difficulties as Amadis de Gaulle. Hamlet's experiences simply could not have happened to a plumber. A poor man is useful on the stage only as a blind man is, to excite sympathy. The poverty of the apothecary in Romeo and Juliet produces a great effect, and even points the sound moral that a poor man cannot afford to have a conscience. But if all the characters of the play had been as poor as he, it would have been nothing but a melodrama of the sort that the Sicilian players gave us here. And that was not the best that lay in Shakespeare's power. When poverty is abolished, and leisure and grace of life become general. The only plays surviving from our epoch which will have any relation to life as it will be lived then will be those in which none of the persons represented are troubled with want of money or wretched drudgery. Our plays of poverty and squalor, 
now the only ones that are true to the life of the majority of living men, will then be classed with the records of misers and monsters. And read only by historical students of social pathology. Then consider Shakespeare's kings and lords and gentlemen. Would even John Ball or Jeremiah complain that they are flattered? Surely a more mercilessly exposed string of scoundrels never crossed the stage. The very monarch who paralyzes a rebel by appealing to the divinity that hedges a king, is a drunken and sensual assassin. And is presently killed contemptuously before our eyes in spite of his hedge of divinity. I could write as convincing a chapter on Shakespeare's Dickensian prejudice against the throne and the nobility and gentry in general as Mr. Harris or Ernest Crosby on the other side. I could even go so far as to contend that one of Shakespeare's defects is his lack of an intelligent comprehension of feudalism. He had of course no provision of democratic collectivism. He was, except in the commonplaces of war and patriotism, a privateer through and through. Nobody in his plays, whether king or citizen, has any civil public business or conception of such a thing, except in the method of appointing constables. To the abuses in which he called attention quite in the vein of the Fabian society. He was concerned about drunkenness and about the idolatry and hypocrisy of our judicial system. But his implied remedy was personal sobriety and freedom from idolatrous illusion in so far as he had any remedy at all, and did not merely despair of human nature. His first and last word on Parliament was, Get thee glass eyes, and, like a scurvy politician, seem to see the thing thou dost not. He had no notion of the feeling with which the land nationalizers of today regard the fact that he was a party to the enclosure of common lands at welcome. The explanation is, not a general deficiency in his mind, but the simple fact that in his day what English land needed was individual appropriation and cultivation. And what the English constitution needed was the incorporation of Whig principles of individual liberty. Shakespeare and the British Public I have rejected Mr. Harris's view that Shakespeare died broken-hearted of, the pangs of love despised. I have given my reasons for believing that Shakespeare died game, and indeed in a state of levity which would have been considered unbecoming in a bishop. But Mr. Harris's evidence does prove that Shakespeare had a grievance and a very serious one. He might have been jilted by ten dark ladies and been none the worse for it. But his treatment by the British public was another matter. The idolatry which exasperated Ben Jonson was by no means a popular movement. And, like all such idolatries, it was excited by the magic of Shakespeare's art rather than by his views. He was launched on his career as a successful playwright by the Henry VI trilogy, a work of no originality, depth, or subtlety except the originality, depth and subtlety of the feelings and fancies of the common people. But Shakespeare was not satisfied with this. What is the use of being Shakespeare if you are not allowed to express any notions but those of Autolycus? Shakespeare did not see the world as Autolycus did, he saw it, if not exactly as Ibsen did, for it was not quite the same world. At least with much of Ibsen's power of penetrating its illusions and idolatries, and with all Swift's horror of its cruelty and uncleanliness. Now it happens to some men with these powers that they are forced to impose their fullest exercise on the world because they cannot produce popular work. Take Wagner and Ibsen for instance. Their earlier works are no doubt much cheaper than their later ones, still, they were not popular when they were written. The alternative of doing popular work was never really open to them, had they stooped they would have picked up less than they snatched from above the people's heads. But Handel and Shakespeare were not held to their best in this way. They could turn out anything they were asked for, and even heap up the measure. They reviled the British public, and never forgave it for ignoring their best work and admiring their splendid commonplaces. But they produced the commonplaces all the same, and made them sound magnificent by mere brute faculty for their art. When Shakespeare was forced to write popular plays to save his theatre from ruin, he did it mutinously, calling the plays, as you like it, and, much ado about nothing. All the same, he did it so well that to this day these two genial vulgarities are the main Shakespearean stock-in-trade of our theatres. 
Later on Burbage's power and popularity as an actor enabled Shakespeare to free himself from the tyranny of the box office. And to express himself more freely in plays consisting largely of monologue to be spoken by a great actor from whom the public would stand a good deal. The history of Shakespeare's tragedies has thus been the history of a long line of famous actors, from Burbage and Betterton to Forbes Robertson. And the man of whom we are told that, when he would have said that Richard died, and cried a horse. A horse. He Burbage cried, was the father of nine generations of Shakespearean playgoers, all speaking of Garrick's Richard, and Keane's Othello, and Irving's Shylock. And Forbes Robertson's Hamlet without knowing or caring how much these had to do with Shakespeare's Richard and Othello and so forth. And the plays which were written without great and predominant parts, such as Troilus and Cressida, All's Well That Ends Well, and Measure for Measure have dropped on our stage as dead as the second part of Goethe's Faust or Ibsen's Emperor and Galilean. Here, then, Shakespeare had a real grievance. And though it is a sentimental exaggeration to describe him as a broken-hearted man in the face of the passages of reckless jollity and serenely happy poetry in his latest plays. Yet the discovery that his most serious work could reach success only when carried on the back of a very fascinating actor who was enormously overcharging his part and that the serious plays which did not contain parts big enough to hold the overcharge were left on the shelf. Amply accounts for the evident fact that Shakespeare did not end his life in a glow of enthusiastic satisfaction with mankind and with the theatre, which is all that Mr. Harris can allege in support of his broken heart theory. But even if Shakespeare had had no failures, it was not possible for a man of his powers to observe the political and moral conduct of his contemporaries without perceiving that they were incapable of dealing with the problems raised by their own civilization. And that their attempts to carry out the codes of law and to practice the religions offered to them by great prophets and lawgivers were and still are so foolish that we now call for the Superman. Virtually a new species, to rescue the world from mismanagement. This is the real sorrow of great men. And in the face of it the notion that when a great man speaks bitterly or looks melancholy he must be troubled by a disappointment in love seems to me sentimental trifling. If I have carried the reader with me thus far, he will find that trivial as this little play of mine is, its sketch of Shakespeare is more complete than its levity suggests. Alas! Its appeal for a national theatre as a monument to Shakespeare failed to touch the very stupid people who cannot see that a national theatre is worth having for the sake of the national soul. I had unfortunately represented Shakespeare as treasuring and using, as I do myself, the jewels of unconsciously musical speech which common people utter and throw away every day. And this was taken as a disparagement of Shakespeare's originality. Why was I born with such contemporaries? Why is Shakespeare made ridiculous by such a posterity? Dramatis Personae. A Beefeater. William Shakespeare. Queen Elizabeth. The Dark Lady. The Dark Lady of the Sonnets. Fin de siècle 15, 1600. Midsummer Night on the Terrace of the Palace at Whitehall, Overlooking the Thames. The Palace Clock Chimes for Quarters and Strikes Eleven. A beefeater on guard. A cloaked man approaches. The beefeater. Stand. Who goes there? Give the word. The man. Mary. I cannot. I have clean forgotten it. The beefeater. Then cannot you pass here. What is your business? Who are you? Are you a true man? The man. Far from it, Master Warder. I am not the same man two days together, sometimes Adam, sometimes Benvolio, and anon the ghost. The Beefeater. Recoiling. A ghost. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. The man. Well said, Master Warder. With your leave I will set that down in writing. For I have a very poor and unhappy brain for remembrance. He takes out his tablets and writes. Methinks this is a good scene, with you on your lonely watch, and I approaching like a ghost in the moonlight. Stare not so amazedly at me, but mark what I say. 
I keep tryst here tonight with a dark lady. She promised to bribe the warder. I gave her the wherewithal, for tickets for the Globe Theater. The bee feeder. Plague on her. She gave me two only. The man. Detaching a tablet. My friend, present this tablet, and you will be welcomed at any time when the plays of Will Shakespeare are in hand. Bring your wife. Bring your friends. Bring the whole garrison. There is ever plenty of room. The beefeater. I care not for these newfangled plays. No man can understand a word of them. They are all talk. Will you not give me a pass for the Spanish tragedy? The man. To see the Spanish tragedy one pays, my friend. Here are the means. He gives him a piece of gold. The beefeater. Overwhelmed. Gold. Oh, sir, you are a better paymaster than your dark lady. The man. Women are thrifty, my friend. The beefeater. Tis so, sir. And you have to consider that the most open-handed of us must e'en cheapen that which we buy every day. This lady has to make a present to a warder nigh every night of her life. The man. Turning pale. I'll not believe it. The beefeater. Now you, sir, I dare be sworn, do not have an adventure like this twice in the year. The man. Villain, wouldst tell me that my dark lady hath ever done thus before? That she mocketh occasions to meet other men? The beefeater. Now the Lord bless your innocence, sir, do you think you are the only pretty man in the world? A merry lady, sir, a warm bit of stuff. Go to, I'll not see her pass a deceit on a gentleman that hath given me the first piece of gold I ever handled. The man. Master Warder, is it not a strange thing that we, knowing that all women are false, should be amazed to find our own particular drab a no better than the rest? The beefeater. Not all, sir. Decent bodies, many of them. The man. Intolerantly. No. All false. All. If thou deny it, thou least. The beefeater. You judge too much by the court, sir. There, indeed, you may say of frailty that its name is woman. The man. Pulling out his tablets again. Prithee say that again, that about frailty, the strain of music. The beefeater. What strain of music, sir? I'm no musician, God knows. The man. There is music in your soul, many of your degree have it very notably. Writing. Frailty, thy name is woman. Repeating it affectionately. Thy name is woman. The beefeater. Well, sir, it is but four words. Are you a snapper-up of such unconsidered trifles? The man. Eagerly. Snapper-up of, he gasps. Oh! Immortal phrase. He writes it down. This man is a greater than I. The beefeater. You have my Lord Pembroke's trick, sir. The man. Like enough, he is my near friend. But what call you his trick? The beefeater. Making sonnets by moonlight. And to the same lady too. The man. No. The beefeater. Last night he stood here on your errand, and in your shoes. The man. Thou, too, Brutus. And I called him friend. The beefeater. Tis ever so, sir. The man. Tis ever so. Twas ever so. He turns away, overcome. Two gentlemen of Verona. Judas. Judas. The beefeater. Is he so bad as that, sir? The man. Recovering his charity and self-possession. Bad? Oh no. Human, Master Warder, human. We call one another names when we are offended, as children do. That is all. The beefeater. I, sir, words, words, words. Mere wind, 
sir. We fill our bellies with the east wind, sir, as the scripture hath it. You cannot feed capon so. The man. A good cadence. By your leave. He makes a note of it. The beefeater. What manner of thing is a cadence, sir? I have not heard of it. The man. A thing to rule the world with, friend. The beefeater. You speak strangely, sir, no offense. But, and like you, you are a very civil gentleman. And a poor man feels drawn to you, you being, as, twere, willing to share your thought with him. The man. Tis my trade. But alas! The world for the most part will none of my thoughts. Lamplight streams from the palace door as it opens from within. The beefeater. Here comes your lady, sir. I'll to t'other end of my ward. You may e'en take your time about your business, I shall not return too suddenly unless my sergeant comes prowling round. Tis a fell sergeant, sir, strict in his arrest. Go den, sir, and good luck. He goes. The man. Strict in his arrest. Fell sergeant. As if tasting a ripe plum. O O O H. He makes a note of them. A cloaked lady gropes her way from the palace and wanders along the terrace, walking in her sleep. The lady. Rubbing her hands as if washing them. Out, damned spot. You will mar all with these cosmetics. God made you one face, and you make yourself another. Think of your grave, woman, not ever of being beautified. All the perfumes of Arabia will not whiten this Tudor hand. The man. All the perfumes of Arabia. Beautified. Beautified. A poem in a single word. Can this be my Mary? To the lady. Why do you speak in a strange voice, and utter poetry for the first time? Are you ailing? You walk like the dead. Mary. Mary. The lady. Echoing him. Mary. Mary. Who would have thought that woman to have had so much blood in her? Is it my fault that my counselors put deeds of blood on me? Fie! If you were women you would have more wit than to stain the floor so foully. Hold not up her head so, the hair is false. I tell you yet again, Mary's buried, she cannot come out of her grave. I fear her not, these cats that dare jump into thrones though they be fit only for men's laps must be put away. What's done cannot be undone. Out, I say. Fie. A queen, and freckled. The man. Shaking her arm. Mary, I say, art asleep? The lady wakes, starts, and nearly faints. He catches her on his arm. The lady. Where am I? What art thou? The man. I cry your mercy. I have mistook your person all this while. Methought you were my Mary, my mistress. The lady. Outraged. Profane fellow, how do you dare? The man. Be not wroth with me, lady. My mistress is a marvelous proper woman. But she does not speak so well as you. All the perfumes of Arabia. That was well said, spoken with good accent and excellent discretion. The lady. Have I been in speech with you here? The man. Why, yes, fair lady. Have you forgot it? The lady. I have walked in my sleep. The man. Walk ever in your sleep, fair one, for then your words drop like honey. The lady. With cold majesty. Know you to whom you speak, sir, that you dare express yourself so saucily? The man. Unabashed. Not I, nor care neither. You are some lady of the court, belike. To me there are but two sorts of women, those with excellent voices, sweet and low, and cackling hens that cannot make me dream. Your voice has all manner of loveliness in it. Grudge me not a short hour of its music. The lady. Sir, you are overbold. 
season your admiration for a while with the man holding up his hand to stop her. Season your admiration for a while. The lady. Fellow, do you dare mimic me to my face? The man. Tis music. Can you not hear? When a good musician sings a song, do you not sing it and sing it again till you have caught and fixed its perfect melody? Season your admiration for a while, God. The history of man's heart is in that one word admiration. Admiration. Taking up his tablets. What was it? Suspend your admiration for a space. The lady. A very vile jingle of essies. I said, season your. The man. Hastily. Season, I, season, season, season. Plague on my memory, my wretched memory. I must e'en write it down. He begins to write, but stops, his memory failing him. Yet tell me which was the vile jingle? You said very justly, mine own ear caught it even as my false tongue said it. The lady. You said, for a space. I said, for a while. The man. For a while. He corrects it. Good. Ardently. And now be mine neither for a space nor a while, but forever. The lady. Odds my life. Are you by chance making love to me, knave? The man. Nay, tis you who have made the love, I but pour it out at your feet. I cannot but love a lass that set such store by an apt word. Therefore vouchsafe, divine perfection of a woman, no, I have said that before somewhere. And the wordy garment of my love for you must be fire new. The lady. You talk too much, sir. Let me warn you, I am more accustomed to be listened to than preached at. The man. The most are like that that do talk well. But though you spake with the tongues of angels, as indeed you do, yet know that I am the king of words. The lady. A king, ha. The man. No less. We are poor things, we men and women. The lady. Dare you call me woman? The man. What nobler name can I tender you? How else can I love you? Yet you may well shrink from the name, have I not said we are but poor things? Yet there is a power that can redeem us. The lady. Gramercy for your sermon, sir. I hope I know my duty. The man. This is no sermon, but the living truth. The power I speak of is the power of immortal poesy. For know that vile as this world is, and worms as we are. You have but to invest all this vileness with a magical garment of words to transfigure us and uplift our souls till earth flowers into a million heavens. The lady. You spoil your heaven with your million. You are extravagant. Observe some measure in your speech. The man. You speak now as Ben does. The lady. And who, pray, is Ben? The man. A learned bricklayer who thinks that the sky is at the top of his ladder, and so takes it on him to rebuke me for flying. I tell you there is no word yet coined and no melody yet sung that is extravagant and majestical enough for the glory that lovely words can reveal. It is heresy to deny it, have you not been taught that in the beginning was the word? That the word was with God? Nay, that the word was God? The lady. Beware, fellow, how you presume to speak of holy things. The queen is the head of the church. The man. You are the head of my church when you speak as you did at first. All the perfumes of Arabia. Can the queen speak thus? They say she playeth well upon the virginals. Let her play so to me and I'll kiss her hands. But until then, you are my queen. And I'll kiss those lips that have dropped music on my heart. He puts his arms about her. The lady. Unmeasured impudence. On your life, take your hands from me. The dark lady comes stooping along the terrace behind them like a running thrush. When she sees how they are employed, she rises angrily to her full height, 
and listens jealously. The man. Unaware of the dark lady. Then cease to make my hands tremble with the streams of life you pour through them. You hold me as the lodestar holds the iron, I cannot but cling to you. We are lost, you and I, nothing can separate us now. The dark lady. We shall see that, false lying hound, you and your filthy trull. With two vigorous cuffs, she knocks the pair asunder, sending the man, who is unlucky enough to receive a right-handed blow, sprawling in the flags. Take that, both of you. The cloaked lady. In towering wrath, throwing off her cloak and turning in outraged majesty on her assailant. High treason. The dark lady. Recognizing her and falling on her knees in abject terror. Will, I am lost, I have struck the queen. The man. Sitting up as majestically as his ignominious posture allows. Woman, you have struck William Shakespeare. Queen Elizabeth. Stupent. Mary, come up. Struck William Shakespeare quotha. And who in the name of all the sluts and jades and light o' loves and fly-by nights that infest this palace of mine, may William Shakespeare be? The dark lady. Madam, he is but a player. Oh, I could have my hand cut off. Queen Elizabeth. Belike you will, mistress. Have you bethought you that I am like to have your head cut off as well? The dark lady. Will, save me. Oh, save me. Elizabeth. Save you. A likely savior, on my royal word. I had thought this fellow at least an esquire. For I had hoped that even the vilest of my ladies would not have dishonored my court by wantoning with a baseborn servant. Shakespeare. Indignantly scrambling to his feet. Baseborn. I, a Shakespeare of Stratford. I, whose mother was an Arden. Baseborn. You forget yourself, madam. Elizabeth. Furious. Splod. Do I so? I will teach you. The dark lady. Rising from her knees and throwing herself between them. Will, in God's name anger her no further. It is death. Madam, do not listen to him. Shakespeare. Not were it e'en to save your life, Mary, not to mention mine own, will I flatter a monarch who forgets what is due to my family. I deny not that my father was brought down to be a poor bankrupt, but t'was his gentle blood that was ever too generous for trade. Never did he disown his debts. Tis true he paid them not. But it is an attested truth that he gave bills for them, and t'was those bills, in the hands of base hucksters, that were his undoing. Elizabeth. Grimly. The son of your father shall learn his place in the presence of the daughter of Harry the Eighth. Shakespeare. Swelling with intolerant importance. Name not that inordinate man in the same breath with Stratford's worthiest alderman. John Shakespeare wedded but once, Harry Tudor was married six times. You should blush to utter his name. Crying out together. The Dark Lady. Will, for pity's sake. Elizabeth. Insolent dog. Shakespeare. Cutting them short. How know you that King Harry was indeed your father? Elizabeth. Zounds. Now by, she stops to grind her teeth with rage. The Dark Lady. She will have me whipped through the streets. Oh God. Oh God. Shakespeare. Learn to know yourself better, madam. I am an honest gentleman of unquestioned parentage, and have already sent in my demand for the coat of arms that is lawfully mine. Can you say as much for yourself? Elizabeth. Almost beside herself. Another word, and I begin with mine own hands the work the hangman shall finish. Shakespeare. You are no true tutor, this baggage here has as good a right to your royal seat as you. What maintains you on the throne of England? Is it your renowned wit? Your wisdom that sets at naught the craftiest statesman of the Christian world? No. 
Tis the mere chance that might have happened to any milkmaid, the caprice of nature that made you the most wondrous piece of beauty the age hath seen. Elizabeth's raised fists, on the point of striking him, fall to her side. That is what hath brought all men to your feet, and founded your throne on the impregnable rock of your proud heart, a stony island in a sea of desire. There, madam, is some wholesome blunt honest speaking for you. Now do your worst. Elizabeth. With dignity. Master Shakespeare, it is well for you that I am a merciful prince. I make allowance for your rustic ignorance. But remember that there are things which be true, and are yet not seemly to be said, I will not say to a queen. For you will have it that I am none, but to a virgin. Shakespeare. Bluntly. It is no fault of mine that you are a virgin, madam, albeit, tis my misfortune. The dark lady. Terrified again. In mercy, madam, hold no further discourse with him. He hath ever some lewd jest on his tongue. You hear how he useth me. Calling me baggage and the like to your majesty's face. Elizabeth. As for you, mistress, I have yet to demand what your business is at this hour in this place. And how you come to be so concerned with a player that you strike blindly at your sovereign in your jealousy of him. The Dark Lady. Madam, as I live and hope for salvation. Shakespeare. Sardonically. Ha! The Dark Lady. Angrily. I, I'm as like to be saved as thou that believest not save some black magic of words and verses, I say, madam, as I am a living woman I came here to break with him forever. Oh, madam, if you would know what misery is, listen to this man that is more than man and less at the same time. He will tie you down to anatomize your very soul, he will wring tears of blood from your humiliation, and then he will heal the wound with flatteries that no woman can resist. Shakespeare flatteries. Kneeling. Oh, madam, I put my case at your royal feet. I confess to much. I have a rude tongue, I am unmannerly, I blaspheme against the holiness of anointed royalty. But oh, my royal mistress, am I a flatterer? Elizabeth. I absolve you as to that. You are far too plain a dealer to please me. He rises gratefully. The Dark Lady. Madam, he is flattering you even as he speaks. Elizabeth. A terrible flash in her eye. Ha! Is it so? Shakespeare. Madam, she is jealous, and, heaven help me. Not without reason. Oh, you say you are a merciful prince, but that was cruel of you, that hiding of your royal dignity when you found me here. For how can I ever be content with this black-haired, black-eyed, black of this devil again now that I have looked upon real beauty and real majesty? The Dark Lady. Wounded and desperate. He hath swore to me ten times over that the day shall come in England when black women, for all their foulness, shall be more thought on than fair ones. T.O. Shakespeare, scolding at him. Deny it if thou canst. Oh, he is compact of lies and scorns. I am tired of being tossed up to heaven and dragged down to hell at every whim that takes him. I am ashamed to my very soul that I have abased myself to love one that my father would not have deemed fit to hold my stirrup, one that will talk to all the world about me, that will put my love and my shame into his plays and make me blush for myself there, that will write sonnets about me that no man of gentle strain would put his hand to. I am all disordered, I know not what I am saying to your majesty. I am of all ladies most deject and wretched. Shakespeare. Ha! At last sorrow hath struck a note of music out of thee. Of all ladies most deject and wretched. He makes a note of it. The Dark Lady. Madam, I implore you give me leave to go. I am distracted with grief and shame. I. Elizabeth. Go. The dark lady tries to kiss her hand. No more. Go. The dark lady goes, convulsed. You have been cruel to that poor fond wretch, Master Shakespeare. Shakespeare. I am not cruel, madam. 
but you know the fable of Jupiter and Semele. I could not help my lightning scorching her. Elizabeth. You have an overweening conceit of yourself, sir, that displeases your queen. Shakespeare. Oh, madam, can I go about with the modest cough of a minor poet, belittling my inspiration and making the mightiest wonder of your reign a thing of naught? I have said that, not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive, the words with which I make the world glorious or foolish at my will. Besides, I would have you think me great enough to grant me a boon. Elizabeth. I hope it is a boon that may be asked of a virgin queen without offence, sir. I mistrust your forwardness. And I bid you remember that I do not suffer persons of your degree, if I may say so without offence to your father the alderman, to presume too far. Shakespeare. Oh, madam, I shall not forget myself again. Though by my life, could I make you a serving wench, neither a queen nor a virgin should you be for so much longer as a flash of lightning might take to cross the river to the bankside. But since you are a queen and will none of me, nor of Philip of Spain, nor of any other mortal man, I must e'en contain myself as best I may, and ask you only for a boon of state. Elizabeth. A boon of state already. You are becoming a courtier like the rest of them. You lack advancement. Shakespeare. Lack advancement. By your majesty's leave, a queenly phrase. He is about to write it down. Elizabeth. Striking the tablets from his hand. Your tables begin to anger me, sir. I am not here to write your plays for you. Shakespeare. You are here to inspire them, madam. For this, among the rest, were you ordained. But the boon I crave is that you do endow a great playhouse, or, if I may make bold to coin a scholarly name for it, a national theatre. For the better instruction and gracing of your majesty's subjects. Elizabeth. Why, sir, are there not theatres enow on the bankside and in Blackfriars? Shakespeare. Madam, these are the adventures of needy and desperate men that must, to save themselves from perishing of want, give the sillier sort of people what they best like. And what they best like, God knows, is not their own betterment and instruction, as we well see by the example of the churches, which must needs compel men to frequent them. Though they be open to all without charge. Only when there is a matter of a murder, or a plot, or a pretty youth in petticoats, or some naughty tale of wantonness, will your subjects pay the great cost of good players and their finery. With a little profit to boot. To prove this I will tell you that I have written two noble and excellent plays setting forth the advancement of women of high nature and fruitful industry even as your majesty is, the one a skillful physician. The other a sister devoted to good works. I have also stole from a book of idle wanton tales two of the most damnable foolishnesses in the world, in the one of which a woman goeth in man's attire and mocketh impudent love to her swain. Who pleaseth the groundlings by overthrowing a wrestler. Whilst, in the other, one of the same kidney showeth her wit by saying endless naughtinesses to a gentleman as lewd as herself. I have writ these to save my friends from penury, yet showing my scorn for such follies and for them that praise them by calling the one as you like it, meaning that it is not as I like it. And the other much ado about nothing, as it truly is. And now these two filthy pieces drive their nobler fellows from the stage, where indeed I cannot have my lady physician presented at all, she being too honest a woman for the taste of the town. Wherefore I humbly beg your majesty to give order that a theatre be endowed out of the public revenue for the playing of those pieces of mine which no merchant will touch. Seeing that his gain is so much greater with the worse than with the better. Thereby you shall also encourage other men to undertake the writing of plays who do now despise it and leave it wholly to those whose counsels will work little good to your realm. For this writing of plays is a great matter, forming as it does the minds and affections of men in such sort that whatsoever they see done in show on the stage. They will presently be doing in earnest in the world, which is but a larger stage. Of late, as you know, the church taught the people by means of plays, but the people flocked only to such as were full of superstitious miracles and bloody martyrdoms. 
And so the church, which also was just then brought into straits by the policy of your royal father, did abandon and discountenance the art of playing. And thus it fell into the hands of poor players and greedy merchants that had their pockets to look to and not the greatness of this your kingdom. Therefore now must your majesty take up that good work that your church hath abandoned, and restore the art of playing to its former use and dignity. Elizabeth. Master Shakespeare, I will speak of this matter to the Lord Treasurer. Shakespeare. Then am I undone, madam. For there was never yet a Lord Treasurer that could find a penny for anything over and above the necessary expenses of your government, save for a war or a salary for his own nephew. Elizabeth. Master Shakespeare, you speak sooth, yet cannot I in any wise mend it. I dare not offend my unruly Puritans by making so lewd a place as the playhouse a public charge. And there be a thousand things to be done in this London of mine before your poetry can have its penny from the general purse. I tell thee, Master Will, it will be three hundred years and more before my subjects learn that man cannot live by bread alone. But by every word that cometh from the mouth of those whom God inspires. By that time you and I will be dust beneath the feet of the horses, if indeed there be any horses then, and men be still riding instead of flying. Now it may be that by then your works will be dust also. Shakespeare. They will stand, madam, fear and or for that. Elizabeth. It may prove so. But of this I am certain, for I know my countrymen, that until every other country in the Christian world, even to barbarian Muscovy and the hamlets of the boorish Germans, have its playhouse at the public charge, England will never adventure. And she will adventure then only because it is her desire to be ever in the fashion, and to do humbly and dutifully whatso she seeth everybody else doing. In the meantime you must content yourself as best you can by the playing of those two pieces which you give out as the most damnable ever writ, but which your countrymen, I warn you, will swear are the best you have ever done. But this I will say, that if I could speak across the ages to our descendants, I should heartily recommend them to fulfill your wish. For the Scottish minstrel hath well said that he that mocketh the songs of a nation is mightier than he that mocketh its laws, and the same may well be true of plays and interludes. The clock chimes the first quarter. The warder returns on his round. And now, sir, we are upon the hour when it better beseems a virgin queen to be Abed than to converse alone with the naughtiest of her subjects. Ho there! Who keeps ward on the queen's lodgings tonight? The warder. I do, and please your majesty. Elizabeth. See that you keep it better in future. You have let pass a most dangerous gallant even to the very door of our royal chamber. Lead him forth and bring me word when he is safely locked out. For I shall scarce dare disrobe until the palace gates are between us. Shakespeare. Kissing her hand. My body goes through the gate into the darkness, madam, but my thoughts follow you. Elizabeth. How? To my bed. Shakespeare. No, madam, to your prayers, in which I beg you to remember my theatre. Elizabeth. That is my prayer to posterity. Forget not your own to God. And so good night, Master Will. Shakespeare. Good night, great Elizabeth. God save the Queen. Elizabeth. Amen. Exeunt severally, she to her chamber, he, in custody of the warder, to the gate nearest Blackfriars. Overruled. Preface to Overruled. The Alleviations of Monogamy. This piece is not an argument for or against polygamy. It is a clinical study of how the thing actually occurs among quite ordinary people, innocent of all unconventional views concerning it. The enormous majority of cases in real life are those of people in that position. Those who deliberately and conscientiously profess what are oddly called advanced views by those others who believe them to be retrograde, are often, and indeed mostly, the last people in the world to engage in unconventional adventures of any kind, not only because they have neither time nor disposition for them. 
but because the friction set up between the individual and the community by the expression of unusual views of any sort is quite enough hindrance to the heretic without being complicated by personal scandals. Thus the theoretic libertine is usually a person of blameless family life, whilst the practical libertine is mercilessly severe on all other libertines. And excessively conventional in professions of social principle. What is more, these professions are not hypocritical, they are for the most part quite sincere. The common libertine, like the drunkard, succumbs to a temptation which he does not defend, and against which he warns others with an earnestness proportionate to the intensity of his own remorse. He, or she, may be a liar and a humbug, pretending to be better than the detected libertines, and clamoring for their condign punishment, but this is mere self-defense. No reasonable person expects the burglar to confess his pursuits, or to refrain from joining in the cry of stop thief when the police get on the track of another burglar. If society chooses to penalize candor, it has itself to thank if its attack is countered by falsehood. The clamorous virtue of the libertine is therefore no more hypocritical than the plea of not guilty which is allowed to every criminal. But one result is that the theorists who write most sincerely and favorably about polygamy know least about it. And the practitioners who know most about it keep their knowledge very jealously to themselves. Which is hardly fair to the practice. Inaccessibility of the facts. Also it is impossible to estimate its prevalence. A practice to which nobody confesses may be both universal and unsuspected, just as a virtue which everybody is expected, under heavy penalties, to claim, may have no existence. It is often assumed, indeed it is the official assumption of the churches and the divorce courts, that a gentleman and a lady cannot be alone together innocently. And that is manifest blazing nonsense, though many women have been stoned to death in the East, and divorced in the West, on the strength of it. On the other hand, the innocent and conventional people who regard gallant adventures as crimes of so horrible a nature that only the most depraved and desperate characters engage in them or would listen to advances in that direction without raising an alarm with the noisiest indignation, are clearly examples of the fact that most sections of society do not know how the other sections live. Industry is the most effective check on gallantry. Women may, as Napoleon said, be the occupation of the idle man just as men are the preoccupation of the idle woman. But the mass of mankind is too busy and too poor for the long and expensive sieges which the professed libertine lays to virtue. Still, wherever there is idleness or even a reasonable supply of elegant leisure there is a good deal of coquetry and philandering. It is so much pleasanter to dance on the edge of a precipice than to go over it that leisured society is full of people who spend a great part of their lives in flirtation, and conceal nothing but the humiliating secret that they have never gone any further. For there is no pleasing people in the matter of reputation in this department, every insult is a flattery. Every testimonial is a disparagement, Joseph is despised and promoted, Potiphar's wife admired and condemned, in short, you are never on solid ground until you get away from the subject altogether. There is a continual and irreconcilable conflict between the natural and conventional sides of the case. Between spontaneous human relations between independent men and women on the one hand and the property relation between husband and wife on the other. Not to mention the confusion under the common name of love of a generous and natural attraction and interest with the murderous jealousy that fastens on and clings to its mate, especially a hated mate, as a tiger fastens on a carcass. And the confusion is natural, for these extremes are extremes of the same passion. And most cases lie somewhere on the scale between them, and are so complicated by ordinary likes and dislikes, by incidental wounds to vanity or gratifications of it, and by class feeling. That A will be jealous of B and not of C and will tolerate infidelities on the part of D whilst being furiously angry when they are committed by E. The Convention of Jealousy That jealousy is independent of sex is shown by its intensity in children. And by the fact that very jealous people are jealous of everybody without regard to relationship or sex. And cannot bear to hear the person they love speak favorably of anyone under any circumstances, many women, for instance. 
are much more jealous of their husband's mothers and sisters than of unrelated women whom they suspect him of fancying. But it is seldom possible to disentangle the two passions in practice. Besides, jealousy is an inculcated passion, forced by society on people in whom it would not occur spontaneously. In Briou's bourgeois AUX champs, the benevolent hero finds himself detested by the neighboring peasants and farmers, not because he preserves game and sets mantraps for poachers, and defends his legal rights over his land to the extremest point of unsocial savagery, but because, being an amiable and public spirited person, he refuses to do all this and thereby offends and disparages the sense of property in his neighbors. The same thing is true of matrimonial jealousy, the man who does not at least pretend to feel it and behave as badly as if he really felt it is despised and insulted. And many a man has shot or stabbed a friend or been shot or stabbed by him in a duel, or disgraced himself and ruined his own wife in a divorce scandal, against his conscience, against his instinct. And to the destruction of his home, solely because society conspired to drive him to keep its own lower morality in countenance in this miserable and undignified manner. Morality is confused in such matters. In an elegant plutocracy, a jealous husband is regarded as a boor. Among the tradesmen who supply that plutocracy with its meals, a husband who is not jealous, and refrains from assailing his rival with his fists, is regarded as a ridiculous, contemptible and cowardly cuckold and the laboring class is divided into the respectable section which takes the tradesman's view, and the disreputable section which enjoys the license of the plutocracy without its money, creeping below the law as its exemplars prance above it, cutting down all expenses of respectability and even decency, and frankly accepting squalor and disrepute as the price of anarchic self-indulgence. The conflict between Malvolio and Sir Toby, between the Marquis and the Bourgeois, the cavalier and the puritan, the ascetic and the voluptuary, goes on continually. And goes on not only between class and class and individual and individual, but in the selfsame breast in a series of reactions and revulsions in which the irresistible becomes the unbearable. And the unbearable the irresistible, until none of us can say what our characters really are in this respect. The missing data of a scientific natural history of marriage. Of one thing I am persuaded, we shall never attain to a reasonable healthy public opinion on sex questions until we offer. As the data for that opinion, our actual conduct and our real thoughts instead of a moral fiction which we agree to call virtuous conduct. And which we then, and here comes in the mischief, pretend is our conduct and our thoughts. If the result were that we all believed one another to be better than we really are, there would be something to be said for it. But the actual result appears to be a monstrous exaggeration of the power and continuity of sexual passion. The whole world shares the fate of Lucrezia Borgia, who, though she seems on investigation to have been quite a suitable wife for a modern British bishop, has been invested by the popular historical imagination with all the extravagances of a Messalina or a Cenci. Writers of Bell's Lettres who are rash enough to admit that their whole life is not one constant preoccupation with adored members of the opposite sex. And who even countenance La Rochefoucauld's remark that very few people would ever imagine themselves in love if they had never read anything about it. Are gravely declared to be abnormal or physically defective by critics of crushing unadventurousness and domestication. French authors of saintly temperament are forced to include in their retinue countesses of ardent complexion with whom they are supposed to live in sin. Sentimental controversies on the subject are endless, but they are useless, because nobody tells the truth. Rousseau did it by an extraordinary effort, aided by a superhuman faculty for human natural history, but the result was curiously disconcerting because Though the facts were so conventionally shocking that people felt that they ought to matter a great deal, they actually mattered very little. And even at that everybody pretends not to believe him. Artificial Retribution The worst of that is that busybodies with perhaps rather more than a normal taste for mischief are continually trying to make negligible things matter as much in fact as they do in convention by deliberately inflicting injuries, sometimes atrocious injuries, on the parties concerned. 
few people have any knowledge of the savage punishments that are legally inflicted for aberrations and absurdities to which no sanely instructed community would call any attention. We create an artificial morality, and consequently an artificial conscience, by manufacturing disastrous consequences for events which, left to themselves, would do very little harm, sometimes not any, and be forgotten in a few days. But the artificial morality is not therefore to be condemned offhand. In many cases it may save mischief instead of making it, for example, though the hanging of a murderer is the duplication of a murder. Yet it may be less murderous than leaving the matter to be settled by blood feud or vendetta. As long as human nature insists on revenge, the official organization and satisfaction of revenge by the state may be also its minimization. The mischief begins when the official revenge persists after the passion it satisfies has died out of the race. Stoning a woman to death in the East because she has ventured to marry again after being deserted by her husband may be more merciful than allowing her to be mobbed to death. But the official stoning or burning of an adulteress in the West would be an atrocity because few of us hate an adulteress to the extent of desiring such a penalty. Or of being prepared to take the law into our own hands if it were withheld. Now what applies to this extreme case applies also in due degree to the other cases. Offenses in which sex is concerned are often needlessly magnified by penalties, ranging from various forms of social ostracism to long sentences of penal servitude, which would be seen to be monstrously disproportionate to the real feeling against them if the removal of both the penalties and the taboo on their discussion made it possible for us to ascertain their real prevalence and estimation. Fortunately there is one outlet for the truth. We are permitted to discuss in jest what we may not discuss in earnest. A serious comedy about sex is taboo, a farcical comedy is privileged. The favorite subject of farcical comedy. The little piece which follows this preface accordingly takes the form of a farcical comedy. Because it is a contribution to the very extensive dramatic literature which takes as its special department the gallantries of married people. The stage has been preoccupied by such affairs for centuries, not only in the jesting vein of restoration comedy and polaire royal farce, but in the more tragically turned adulteries of the Parisian school which dominated the stage until Ibsen put them out of countenance and relegated them to their proper place as articles of commerce. Their continued vogue in that department maintains the tradition that adultery is the dramatic subject par excellence, and indeed that a play that is not about adultery is not a play at all. I was considered a heresiarch of the most extravagant kind when I expressed my opinion, at the outset of my career as a playwright, that adultery is the dullest of themes on the stage. And that from Francesca and Paolo down to the latest guilty couple of the school of Dumas Phils, the romantic adulterers have all been intolerable bores. The pseudo-sex play. Later on, I had occasion to point out to the defenders of sex as the proper theme of drama. That though they were right in ranking sex as an intensely interesting subject, they were wrong in assuming that sex is an indispensable motive in popular plays. The plays of Moliere are, like the novels of the Victorian epoch or Don Quixote, as nearly sexless as anything not absolutely inhuman can be. And some of Shakespeare's plays are sexually on a par with the census, they contain women as well as men, and that is all. This had to be admitted. But it was still assumed that the plays of the 19th century Parisian school are, in contrast with the sexless masterpieces, saturated with sex, and this I strenuously denied. A play about the convention that a man should fight a duel or come to fisticuffs with his wife's lover if she has won, or the convention that he should strangle her like Othello. Or turn her out of the house and never see her or allow her to see her children again. Or the convention that she should never be spoken to again by any decent person and should finally drown herself. Or the convention that persons involved in scenes of recrimination or confession by these conventions should call each other certain abusive names and describe their conduct as guilty and frail and so on, all these may provide material for very effective plays. But such plays are not dramatic studies of sex, one might as well say that Romeo and Juliet is a dramatic study of pharmacy because the catastrophe is brought about through an apothecary. Duels are not sex. Divorce cases are not sex, 
the trade unionism of married women is not sex. Only the most insignificant fraction of the gallantries of married people produce any of the conventional results. And plays occupied wholly with the conventional results are therefore utterly unsatisfying as sex plays, however interesting they may be as plays of intrigue and plot puzzles. The world is finding this out rapidly. The Sunday papers, which in the days when they appealed almost exclusively to the lower middle class were crammed with police intelligence, and more especially with divorce and murder cases. Now lay no stress on them. And police papers which confined themselves entirely to such matters, and were once eagerly read, have perished through the essential dullness of their topics. And yet the interest in sex is stronger than ever, in fact. The literature that has driven out the journalism of the divorce courts is a literature occupied with sex to an extent and with an intimacy and frankness that would have seemed utterly impossible to Thackeray or Dickens if they had been told that the change would complete itself within fifty years of their own time. Art and Morality It is ridiculous to say, as inconsiderate amateurs of the arts do, that art has nothing to do with morality. What is true is that the artist's business is not that of the policeman. And that such factitious consequences and put-up jobs as divorces and executions and the detective operations that lead up to them are no essential part of life, though. Like poisons and buttered slides and red-hot pokers, they provide material for plenty of thrilling or amusing stories suited to people who are incapable of any interest in psychology. But the fine artist must keep the policeman out of his studies of sex and studies of crime. It is by clinging nervously to the policeman that most of the pseudo-sex plays convince me that the writers have either never had any serious personal experience of their ostensible subject, or else have never conceived it possible that the stage dare present the phenomena of sex as they appear in nature. The Limits of Stage Presentation but the stage presents much more shocking phenomena than those of sex. There is, of course, a sense in which you cannot present sex on the stage, just as you cannot present murder. Macbeth must no more really kill Duncan than he must himself be really slain by Macduff. But the feelings of a murderer can be expressed in a certain artistic convention. And a carefully prearranged sword exercise can be gone through with sufficient pretense of earnestness to be accepted by the willing imaginations of the younger spectators as a desperate combat. The tragedy of love has been presented on the stage in the same way. In Tristan and Isolde, the curtain does not, as in Romeo and Juliet, rise with the lark, the whole night of love is played before the spectators. The lovers do not discuss marriage in an elegantly sentimental way they utter the visions and feelings that come to lovers at the supreme moments of their love. Totally forgetting that there are such things in the world as husbands and lawyers and dueling codes and theories of sin and notions of propriety and all the other irrelevancies which provide hackneyed and bloodless material for our so-called plays of passion. Pruderies of the French Stage To all stage presentations there are limits. If Macduff were to stab Macbeth, the spectacle would be intolerable and even the pretense which we allow on our stage is ridiculously destructive to the illusion of the scene. Yet pugilists and gladiators will actually fight and kill in public without sham, even as a spectacle for money. But no sober couple of lovers of any delicacy could endure to be watched. We in England, accustomed to consider the French stage much more licentious than the British, are always surprised and puzzled when we learn as we may do any day if we come within reach of such information, that French actors are often scandalized by what they consider the indecency of the English stage. And that French actresses who desire a greater license in appealing to the sexual instincts than the French stage allows them, learn and establish themselves on the English stage. The German and Russian stages are in the same relation to the French and perhaps more or less all the Latin stages. The reason is that, partly from a want of respect for the theatre, partly from a sort of respect for art in general which moves them to accord moral privileges to artists. Partly from the very objectionable tradition that the realm of art is Alsatia and the contemplation of works of art a holiday from the burden of virtue. Partly because French prudery does not attach itself to the same points of behaviour as British prudery, and has a different code of the mentionable and the unmentionable, and for many other reasons. 
The French tolerate plays which are never performed in England until they have been spoiled by a process of bodlerization. Yet French taste is more fastidious than ours as to the exhibition and treatment on the stage of the physical incidents of sex. On the French stage a kiss is as obvious a convention as the thrust under the arm by which Macduff runs Macbeth through. It is even a purposely unconvincing convention, the actors rather insisting that it shall be impossible for any spectator to mistake a stage kiss for a real one. In England, on the contrary, realism is carried to the point at which nobody except the two performers can perceive that the caress is not genuine. And here the English stage is certainly in the right. For whatever question there arises as to what incidents are proper for representation on the stage or not. My experience as a playgoer leaves me in no doubt that once it is decided to represent an incident, it will be offensive, no matter whether it be a prayer or a kiss. Unless it is presented with a convincing appearance of sincerity. Our disillusive scenery. For example, the main objection to the use of elusive scenery, in most modern plays scenery is not elusive. Everything visible is as real as in your drawing room at home, is that it is unconvincing. Whilst the imaginary scenery with which the audience provides a platform or tribune like the Elizabethan stage or the Greek stage used by Sophocles, is quite convincing. In fact, the more scenery you have the less illusion you produce. The wise playwright, when he cannot get absolute reality of presentation, goes to the other extreme, and aims at atmosphere and suggestion of mood rather than at direct simulative illusion. The theater, as I first knew it, was a place of wings and flats which destroyed both atmosphere and illusion. This was tolerated, and even intensely enjoyed, but not in the least because nothing better was possible, for all the devices employed in the productions of Mr. Granville Barker or Max Reinhardt or the Moscow Art Theatre were equally available for Kali Sibber and Garrick, except the intensity of our artificial light. When Garrick played Richard II in slashed trunk hose and plumes, it was not because he believed that the Plantagenets dressed like that. Or because the costumes could not have made him a 15th century dress as easily as a nondescript combination of the state robes of George III with such scraps of older fashions as seemed to playgoers for some reason to be romantic. The charm of the theatre in those days was its make-believe. It has that charm still, not only for the amateurs, who are happiest when they are most unnatural and impossible and absurd, but for audiences as well. I have seen performances of my own plays which were to me far wilder burlesques than Sheridan's Critic or Buckingham's Rehearsal. Yet they have produced sincere laughter and tears such as the most finished metropolitan productions have failed to elicit. Fielding was entirely right when he represented Partridge as enjoying intensely the performance of the King in Hamlet because anybody could see that the King was an actor and resenting Garrick's Hamlet because it might have been a real man. Yet we have only to look at the portraits of Garrick to see that his performances would nowadays seem almost as extravagantly stagey as his costumes. In our day Caves' intensely real Carmen never pleased the mob as much as the obvious fancy ball masquerading of suburban young ladies in the same character. Holding the mirror up to nature. Theatrical art begins as the holding up to nature of a distorting mirror. In this phase it pleases people who are childish enough to believe that they can see what they look like and what they are when they look at a true mirror. Naturally they think that a true mirror can teach them nothing. Only by giving them back some monstrous image can the mirror amuse them or terrify them. It is not until they grow up to the point at which they learn that they know very little about themselves, and that they do not see themselves in a true mirror as other people see them that they become consumed with curiosity as to what they really are like, and begin to demand that the stage shall be a mirror of such accuracy and intensity of illumination that they shall be able to get glimpses of their real selves in it, and also learn a little how they appear to other people. For audiences of this highly developed class, sex can no longer be ignored or conventionalized or distorted by the playwright who makes the mirror. The old sentimental extravagances and the old grossnesses are of no further use to him. Don Giovanni and Zerlina are not gross, Tristan and Isolde are not extravagant or sentimental. They say and do nothing that you cannot bear to hear and see, and yet they give you, the one pair briefly and slightly, 
and the other fully and deeply, what passes in the minds of lovers. The love depicted may be that of a philosophic adventurer tempting an ignorant country girl. Or of a tragically serious poet entangled with a woman of noble capacity in a passion which has become for them the reality of the whole universe. No matter, the thing is dramatized and dramatized directly, not talked about as something that happened before the curtain rose, or that will happen after it falls. Farcical comedy shirking its subject. Now if all this can be done in the key of tragedy and philosophic comedy, it can, I have always contended, be done in the key of farcical comedy. And, overruled, is a trifling experiment in that manner. Conventional farcical comedies are always finally tedious because the heart of them, the inevitable conjugal infidelity, is always evaded. Even its consequences are evaded. Mr. Granville Barker has pointed out rightly that if the third acts of our farcical comedies dared to describe the consequences that would follow from the first and second in real life, they would end as squalid tragedies. And in my opinion they would be greatly improved thereby even as entertainments. For I have never seen a three-act farcical comedy without being bored and tired by the third act, and observing that the rest of the audience were in the same condition though they were not vigilantly introspective enough to find that out, and were apt to blame one another, especially the husbands and wives, for their crossness. But it is happily by no means true that conjugal infidelities always produce tragic consequences, or that they need produce even the unhappiness which they often do produce. Besides, the more momentous the consequences, the more interesting become the impulses and imaginations and reasonings, if any, of the people who disregard them. If I had an opportunity of conversing with the ghost of an executed murderer, I have no doubt he would begin to tell me eagerly about his trial. With the names of the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who honored him with their presence on that occasion, and then about his execution. All of which would bore me exceedingly. I should say, my dear sir, such manufactured ceremonies do not interest me in the least. I know how a man is tried, and how he is hanged. I should have had you killed in a much less disgusting, hypocritical, and unfriendly manner if the matter had been in my hands. What I want to know about is the murder. How did you feel when you committed it? Why did you do it? What did you say to yourself about it? If, like most murderers, you had not been hanged, would you have committed other murders? Did you really dislike the victim, or did you want his money, or did you murder a person whom you did not dislike? and from whose death you had nothing to gain, merely for the sake of murdering? If so, can you describe the charm to me? Does it come upon you periodically, or is it chronic? Has curiosity anything to do with it? I would ply him with all manner of questions to find out what murder is really like. And I should not be satisfied until I had realized that I, too, might commit a murder, or else that there is some specific quality present in a murderer and lacking in me and, if so, what that quality is. In just the same way, I want the unfaithful husband or the unfaithful wife in a farcical comedy not to bother me with their divorce cases or the stratagems they employ to avoid a divorce case. But to tell me how and why married couples are unfaithful. I don't want to hear the lies they tell one another to conceal what they have done, but the truths they tell one another when they have to face what they have done without concealment or excuse. No doubt prudent and considerate people conceal such adventures, when they can, from those who are most likely to be wounded by them. But it is not to be presumed that, when found out, they necessarily disgrace themselves by irritating lies and transparent subterfuges. My playlet, which I offer as a model to all future writers of farcical comedy, may now, I hope, be read without shock. I may just add that Mr. Sibthorpe Juno's view that morality demands, not that we should behave morally, an impossibility to our sinful nature, but that we shall not attempt to defend our immoralities, is a standard view in England, and was advanced in all seriousness by an earnest and distinguished British moralist shortly after the first performance of Overruled. My objection to that aspect of the doctrine of original sin is that no necessary and inevitable operation of human nature can reasonably be regarded as sinful at all. 
and that a morality which assumes the contrary is an absurd morality, and can be kept in countenance only by hypocrisy. When people were ashamed of sanitary problems, and refused to face them, leaving them to solve themselves clandestinely in dirt and secrecy, the solution arrived at was the Black Death. A similar policy as to sex problems has solved itself by an even worse plague than the Black Death. And the remedy for that is not salversan, but sound moral hygiene. The first foundation of which is the discontinuance of our habit of telling not only the comparatively harmless lies that we know we ought not to tell but the ruinous lies that we foolishly think we ought to tell. Dramatis Personi Mrs. Juno Mr. Gregory Lunn Mr. Sibthorpe Juno Mrs. Seraphita Lunn Overruled A lady and gentleman are sitting together on a Chesterfield in a retired corner of the lounge of a seaside hotel. It is a summer night, the French window behind them stands open. The terrace without overlooks a moonlit harbor. The lounge is dark. The Chesterfield, upholstered in silver gray, and the two figures on it in evening dress, catch the light from an arc lamp somewhere, but the walls, covered with a dark green paper, are in gloom. There are two stray chairs, one on each side. On the gentleman's right, behind him up near the window, is an unused fireplace. Opposite it on the lady's left is a door. The gentleman is on the lady's right. The lady is very attractive, with a musical voice and soft appealing manners. She is young, that is, one feels sure that she is under thirty-five and over twenty-four. The gentleman does not look much older. He is rather handsome, and has ventured as far in the direction of poetic dandyism in the arrangement of his hair as any man who is not a professional artist can afford to in England. He is obviously very much in love with the lady, and is, in fact, yielding to an irresistible impulse to throw his arms around her. The lady. Don't, oh don't be horrid. Please, Mr. Lunn. She rises from the lounge and retreats behind it. Promise me you won't be horrid. Gregory Lunn. I'm not being horrid, Mrs. Juno. I'm not going to be horrid. I love you, that's all. I'm extraordinarily happy. Mrs. Juno. You will really be good? Gregory. I'll be whatever you wish me to be. I tell you I love you. I love loving you. I don't want to be tired and sorry, as I should be if I were to be horrid. I don't want you to be tired and sorry. Do come and sit down again. Mrs. Juno. Coming back to her seat. You're sure you don't want anything you oughtn't to? Gregory. Quite sure. I only want you. She recoils. Don't be alarmed, I like wanting you. As long as I have a want, I have a reason for living. Satisfaction is death. Mrs. Juno. Yes, but the impulse to commit suicide is sometimes irresistible. Gregory. Not with you. Mrs. Juno. What? Gregory. Oh, it sounds uncomplimentary, but it isn't really. Do you know why half the couples who find themselves situated as we are now behave horridly? Mrs. Juno. Because they can't help it if they let things go too far. Gregory. Not a bit of it. It's because they have nothing else to do and no other way of entertaining each other. You don't know what it is to be alone with a woman who has little beauty and less conversation. What is a man to do? She can't talk interestingly. And if he talks that way himself she doesn't understand him. He can't look at her, if he does, he only finds out that she isn't beautiful. Before the end of five minutes they are both hideously bored. There's only one thing that can save the situation and that's what you call being horrid. With a beautiful, witty, kind woman, there's no time for such follies. It's so delightful to look at her, to listen to her voice, to hear all she has to say, that nothing else happens. That is why the woman who is supposed to have a thousand lovers seldom has one, whilst the stupid, graceless animals of women have dozens. Mrs. Juno. I wonder. 
It's quite true that when one feels in danger one talks like mad to stave it off, even when one doesn't quite want to stave it off. Gregory. One never does quite want to stave it off. Danger is delicious. But death isn't. We court the danger, but the real delight is in escaping, after all. Mrs. Juno. I don't think we'll talk about it any more. Danger is all very well when you do escape, but sometimes one doesn't. I tell you frankly I don't feel as safe as you do, if you really do. Gregory. But surely you can do as you please without injuring anyone, Mrs. Juno. That is the whole secret of your extraordinary charm for me. Mrs. Juno. I don't understand. Gregory. Well, I hardly know how to begin to explain. But the root of the matter is that I am what people call a good man. Mrs. Juno. I thought so until you began making love to me. Gregory. But you knew I loved you all along. Mrs. Juno. Yes, of course, but I depended on you not to tell me so, because I thought you were good. Your blurting it out spoilt it. And it was wicked besides. Gregory. Not at all. You see, it's a great many years since I've been able to allow myself to fall in love. I know lots of charming women. But the worst of it is, they're all married. Women don't become charming, to my taste, until they're fully developed, and by that time, if they're really nice, they're snapped up and married. And then, because I am a good man, I have to place a limit to my regard for them. I may be fortunate enough to gain friendship and even very warm affection from them. But my loyalty to their husbands and their hearths and their happiness obliges me to draw a line and not overstep it. Of course I value such affectionate regard very highly indeed. I am surrounded with women who are most dear to me. But every one of them has a post sticking up, if I may put it that way, with the inscription, Trespassers will be prosecuted. How we all loathe that notice. In every lovely garden, in every dell full of primroses, on every fair hillside, we meet that confounded board, and there is always a gamekeeper round the corner. But what is that to the horror of meeting it on every beautiful woman, and knowing that there is a husband round the corner? I have had this accursed board standing between me and every dear and desirable woman until I thought I had lost the power of letting myself fall really and wholeheartedly in love. Mrs. Juno. Wasn't there a widow? Gregory. No. Widows are extraordinarily scarce in modern society. Husbands live longer than they used to. And even when they do die, their widows have a string of names down for their next. Mrs. Juno. Well, what about the young girls? Gregory. Oh, who cares for young girls? They're sympathetic. They're beginners. They don't attract me. I'm afraid of them. Mrs. Juno. That's the correct thing to say to a woman of my age. But it doesn't explain why you seem to have put your scruples in your pocket when you met me. Gregory. Surely that's quite clear. I. Mrs. Juno. No, please don't explain. I don't want to know. I take your word for it. Besides, it doesn't matter now. Our voyage is over, and tomorrow I start for the north to my poor father's place. Gregory. Surprised. Your poor father. I thought he was alive. Mrs. Juno. So he is. What made you think he wasn't? Gregory. You said your poor father. Mrs. Juno. Oh, that's a trick of mine. Rather a silly trick, I suppose, but there's something pathetic to me about men, I find myself calling them poor so-and-so when there's nothing whatever the matter with them. Gregory. Who has listened in growing alarm? But, I, is, wa. Oh Lord! Mrs. Juno! What's the matter? Gregory! Nothing! Mrs. Juno! Nothing! Rising anxiously! Nonsense, you're ill! Gregory! No! 
It was something about your late husband. Mrs. Juno. My late husband. What do you mean? Clutching him, horror-stricken. Don't tell me he's dead. Gregory. Rising, equally appalled. Don't tell me he's alive. Mrs. Juno. Oh, don't frighten me like this. Of course he's alive, unless you've heard anything. Gregory. The first day we met, on the boat, you spoke to me of your poor dear husband. Mrs. Juno. Releasing him, quite reassured. Is that all? Gregory. Well, afterwards you called him poor tops. Always poor tops, or poor dear tops. What could I think? Mrs. Juno. Sitting down again. I wish you hadn't given me such a shock about him, for I haven't been treating him at all well. Neither have you. Gregory. Relapsing into his seat, overwhelmed. And you mean to tell me you're not a widow? Mrs. Juno. Gracious, no. I'm not in black. Gregory. Then I have been behaving like a blackguard. I have broken my promise to my mother. I shall never have an easy conscience again. Mrs. Juno. I'm sorry. I thought you knew. Gregory. You thought I was a libertine. Mrs. Juno. No, of course I shouldn't have spoken to you if I had thought that. I thought you liked me, but that you knew, and would be good. Gregory. Stretching his hands towards her breast. I thought the burden of being good had fallen from my soul at last. I saw nothing there but a bosom to rest on, the bosom of a lovely woman of whom I could dream without guilt. What do I see now? Mrs. Juno. Just what you saw before. Gregory. Despairingly. No, no. Mrs. Juno. What else? Gregory. Trespassers will be prosecuted, trespassers will be prosecuted. Mrs. Juno. They won't if they hold their tongues. Don't be such a coward. My husband won't eat you. Gregory. I'm not afraid of your husband. I'm afraid of my conscience. Mrs. Juno. Losing patience. Well. I don't consider myself at all a badly behaved woman, for nothing has passed between us that was not perfectly nice and friendly, but really. To hear a grown-up man talking about promises to his mother. Gregory. Interrupting her. Yes, yes, I know all about that. It's not romantic, it's not Don Juan, it's not advanced. But we feel it all the same. It's far deeper in our blood and bones than all the romantic stuff. My father got into a scandal once, that was why my mother made me promise never to make love to a married woman. And now I've done it I can't feel honest. Don't pretend to despise me or laugh at me. You feel it too. You said just now that your own conscience was uneasy when you thought of your husband. What must it be when you think of my wife? Mrs. Juno. Rising aghast. Your wife. You don't dare sit there and tell me coolly that you're a married man. Gregory. I never led you to believe I was unmarried. Mrs. Juno. Oh. You never gave me the faintest hint that you had a wife. Gregory. I did indeed. I discuss things with you that only married people really understand. Mrs. Juno. Oh. Gregory. I thought it the most delicate way of letting you know. Mrs. Juno. Well, you are a daisy, I must say. I suppose that's vulgar, but really. Really. You and your goodness. However, now we've found one another out there's only one thing to be done. Will you please go? Gregory. Rising slowly. I ought to go. Mrs. Juno. Well, go. Gregory. Yes. Ere, he tries to go. I, I somehow can't. He sits down again helplessly. 
My conscience is active, my will is paralyzed. This is really dreadful. Would you mind ringing the bell and asking them to throw me out? You ought to, you know. Mrs. Juno. What? Make a scandal in the face of the whole hotel. Certainly not. Don't be a fool. Gregory. Yes, but I can't go. Mrs. Juno. Then I can. Goodbye. Gregory. Clinging to her hand. Can you really? Mrs. Juno. Of course I, she wavers. Oh, dear. They contemplate one another helplessly. I can't. She sinks on the lounge, hand in hand with him. Gregory. For heaven's sake pull yourself together. It's a question of self-control. Mrs. Juno. Dragging her hand away and retreating to the end of the Chesterfield. No, it's a question of distance. Self-control is all very well two or three yards off, or on a ship, with everybody looking on. Don't come any nearer. Gregory. This is a ghastly business. I want to go away, and I can't. Mrs. Juno. I think you ought to go he makes an effort, and she adds quickly but if you try I shall grab you round the neck and disgrace myself. I implore you to sit still and be nice. Gregory. I implore you to run away. I believe I can trust myself to let you go for your own sake. But it will break my heart. Mrs. Juno. I don't want to break your heart. I can't bear to think of your sitting here alone. I can't bear to think of sitting alone myself somewhere else. It's so senseless, so ridiculous, when we might be so happy. I don't want to be wicked, or coarse. But I like you very much, and I do want to be affectionate and human. Gregory. I ought to draw a line. Mrs. Juno. So you shall, dear. Tell me, do you really like me? I don't mean love me, you might love the housemaid. Gregory. Vehemently. No. Mrs. Juno. Oh, yes you might, and what does that matter, anyhow? Are you really fond of me? Are we friends, comrades? Would you be sorry if I died? Gregory. Shrinking. Oh, don't. Mrs. Juno. Or was it the usual aimless man's lark, a mere shipboard flirtation? Gregory. Oh, no, no, nothing half so bad, so vulgar, so wrong. I assure you I only meant to be agreeable. It grew on me before I noticed it. Mrs. Juno. And you were glad to let it grow? Gregory. I let it grow because the board was not up. Mrs. Juno. Bother the board. I am just as fond of Sibthorpe as. Gregory. Sibthorpe. Mrs. Juno. Sibthorpe is my husband's Christian name. I oughtn't to call him tops to you now. Gregory. Chuckling. It sounded like something to drink. But I have no right to laugh at him. My Christian name is Gregory, which sounds like a powder. Mrs. Juno. Chilled. That is so like a man. I offer you my heart's warmest friendliest feeling, and you think of nothing but a silly joke. A quip like that makes you forget me. Gregory. Forget you. Oh, if I only could. Mrs. Juno. If you could, would you? Gregory. Burying his shamed face in his hands. No, I'd die first. Oh, I hate myself. Mrs. Juno. I glory in myself. It's so jolly to be reckless. Can a man be reckless, I wonder? Gregory. Straightening himself desperately. No. I'm not reckless. I know what I'm doing, my conscience is awake. Oh, where is the intoxication of love? The delirium? The madness that makes a man think the world well lost for the woman he adores? 
I don't think anything of the sort, I see that it's not worth it, I know that it's wrong, I have never in my life been cooler, more businesslike. Mrs. Juno. Opening her arms to him. But you can't resist me. Gregory. I must. I ought throwing himself into her arms. Oh, my darling, my treasure, we shall be sorry for this. Mrs. Juno. We can forgive ourselves. Could we forgive ourselves if we let this moment slip? Gregory. I protest to the last. I'm against this. I have been pushed over a precipice. I'm innocent. This wild joy, this exquisite tenderness, this ascent into heaven can thrill me to the uttermost fiber of my heart with a gesture of ecstasy she hides her face on his shoulder. But it can't subdue my mind or corrupt my conscience, which still shouts to the skies that I'm not a willing party to this outrageous conduct. I repudiate the bliss with which you are filling me. Mrs. Juno. Never mind your conscience. Tell me how happy you are. Gregory. No, I recall you to your duty. But oh, I will give you my life with both hands if you can tell me that you feel for me one millionth part of what I feel for you now. Mrs. Juno. Oh, yes, yes. Be satisfied with that. Ask for no more. Let me go. Gregory. I can't. I have no will. Something stronger than either of us is in command here. Nothing on earth or in heaven can part us now. You know that, don't you? Mrs. Juno. Oh, don't make me say it. Of course I know. Nothing, not life nor death nor shame nor anything can part us. A matter-of-fact male voice in the corridor. All right. This must be it. The two recover with a violent start, release one another, and spring back to opposite sides of the lounge. Gregory. That did it. Mrs. Juno. In a thrilling whisper. SHSHSH. That was my husband's voice. Gregory. Impossible, it's only our guilty fancy. A woman's voice. This is the way to the lounge. I know it. Gregory. Great heaven. We're both mad. That's my wife's voice. Mrs. Juno. Ridiculous. Oh. We're dreaming it all. We, the door opens. And Sibthorpe Juno appears in the roseate glow of the corridor, which happens to be papered in pink, with Mrs. Lunn, like Tannhauser in the Hill of Venus. He is a fussily energetic little man, who gives himself an air of gallantry by greasing the points of his mustaches and dressing very carefully. She is a tall, imposing, handsome, languid woman, with flashing dark eyes and long lashes. They make for the Chesterfield, not noticing the two palpitating figures blotted against the walls in the gloom on either side. The figures flit away noiselessly through the window and disappear. Juno. Officiously. Ah, here we are. He leads the way to the sofa. Sit down, I'm sure you're tired. She sits. That's right. He sits beside her on her left. Hello. He rises this sofa's quite warm. Mrs. Lunn. Bored. Is it? I don't notice it. I expect the sun's been on it. Juno. I felt it quite distinctly, I'm more thinly clad than you. He sits down again, and proceeds, with a sigh of satisfaction. What a relief to get off the ship and have a private room. That's the worst of a ship. You're under observation all the time. Mrs. Lunn. But why not? Juno. Well, of course there's no reason, at least I suppose not. But, you know, part of the romance of a journey is that a man keeps imagining that something might happen. And he can't do that if there are a lot of people about and it simply can't happen. Mrs. Lunn. Mr. Juno, romance is all very well on board ship. But when your foot touches the soil of England there's an end of it. Juno. No, 
Believe me, that's a foreigner's mistake, we are the most romantic people in the world, we English. Why, my very presence here is a romance. Mrs. Lunn. Faintly ironical. Indeed? Juno. Yes. You've guessed, of course, that I'm a married man. Mrs. Lunn. Oh, that's all right. I'm a married woman. Juno. Thank heaven for that. To my English mind, passion is not real passion without guilt. I am a red-blooded man, Mrs. Lunn, I can't help it. The tragedy of my life is that I married, when quite young, a woman whom I couldn't help being very fond of. I longed for a guilty passion, for the real thing, the wicked thing. And yet I couldn't care tuppence for any other woman when my wife was about. Year after year went by, I felt my youth slipping away without ever having had a romance in my life. For marriage is all very well, but it isn't romance. There's nothing wrong in it, you see. Mrs. Lunn. Poor man. How you must have suffered. Juno. No, that was what was so tame about it. I wanted to suffer. You get so sick of being happily married. It's always the happy marriages that break up. At last my wife and I agreed that we ought to take a holiday. Mrs. Lunn. Hadn't you holidays every year? Juno. Oh, the seaside and so on. That's not what we meant. We meant a holiday from one another. Mrs. Lunn. How very odd. Juno. She said it was an excellent idea, that domestic felicity was making us perfectly idiotic, that she wanted a holiday, too. So we agreed to go round the world in opposite directions. I started for Suez on the day she sailed for New York. Mrs. Lunn. Suddenly becoming attentive. That's precisely what Gregory and I did. Now I wonder did he want a holiday from me. What he said was that he wanted the delight of meeting me after a long absence. Juno. Could anything be more romantic than that? Would anyone else than an Englishman have thought of it? I dare say my temperament seems tame to your boiling southern blood. Mrs. Lunn. My what? Juno. Your southern blood. Don't you remember how you told me, that night in the saloon when I sang, Farewell and Adieu to you dear Spanish ladies, that you were by birth a lady of Spain? Your splendid Andalusian beauty speaks for itself. Mrs. Lunn. Stuff. I was born in Gibraltar. My father was Captain Jenkins. In the artillery. Juno. Ardently. It is climate and not race that determines the temperament. The fiery sun of Spain blazed on your cradle, and it rocked to the roar of British cannon. Mrs. Lunn. What eloquence! It reminds me of my husband when he was in love, before we were married. Are you in love? Juno. Yes, and with the same woman. Mrs. Lunn. Well, of course, I didn't suppose you were in love with two women. Juno. I don't think you quite understand. I meant that I am in love with you. Mrs. Lunn. Relapsing into deepest boredom. Oh, that. Men do fall in love with me. They all seem to think me a creature with volcanic passions, I'm sure I don't know why. For all the volcanic women I know are plain little creatures with sandy hair. I don't consider human volcanoes respectable. And I'm so tired of the subject. Our house is always full of women who are in love with my husband and men who are in love with me. We encourage it because it's pleasant to have company. Juno. And is your husband as insensible as yourself? Mrs. Lunn. Oh, Gregory's not insensible, very far from it, but I am the only woman in the world for him. Juno. But you? Are you really as insensible as you say you are? Mrs. Lunn. I never said anything of the kind. I'm not at all insensible by nature. But, I don't know whether you've noticed it, I am what people call rather a fine figure of a woman. 
Juno. Passionately. Noticed it. Oh, Mrs. Lunn. Have I been able to notice anything else since we met? Mrs. Lunn. There you go, like all the rest of them. I ask you, how do you expect a woman to keep up what you call her sensibility when this sort of thing has happened to her about three times a week ever since she was seventeen? It used to upset me and terrify me at first. Then I got rather a taste for it. It came to a climax with Gregory, that was why I married him. Then it became a mild lark, hardly worth the trouble. After that I found it valuable once or twice as a spinal tonic when I was run down, but now it's an unmitigated bore. I don't mind your declaration, I dare say it gives you a certain pleasure to make it. I quite understand that you adore me, but, if you don't mind, I'd rather you didn't keep on saying so. Juno. Is there then no hope for me? Mrs. Lunn. Oh, yes. Gregory has an idea that married women keep lists of the men they'll marry if they become widows. I'll put your name down, if that will satisfy you. Juno. Is the list a long one? Mrs. Lunn. Do you mean the real list? Not the one I show to Gregory, there are hundreds of names on that. But the little private list that he'd better not see? Juno. Oh, will you really put me on that? Say you will. Mrs. Lunn. Well, perhaps I will. He kisses her hand. Now don't begin abusing the privilege. Juno. May I call you by your Christian name? Mrs. Lunn. No, it's too long. You can't go about calling a woman Seraphita. Juno. Ecstatically. Seraphita. Mrs. Lunn. I used to be called Sally at home, but when I married a man named Lunn, of course that became ridiculous. That's my one little pet joke. Call me Mrs. Lunn for short. And change the subject, or I shall go to sleep. Juno. I can't change the subject. For me there is no other subject. Why else have you put me on your list? Mrs. Lunn. Because you're a solicitor. Gregory's a solicitor. I'm accustomed to my husband being a solicitor and telling me things he oughtn't to tell anybody. Juno. Ruefully. Is that all? Oh, I can't believe that the voice of love has ever thoroughly awakened you. Mrs. Lunn. No, it sends me to sleep. Juno appeals against this by an amorous demonstration. It's no use, Mr. Juno, I'm hopelessly respectable, the Jenkinses always were. Don't you realize that unless most women were like that, the world couldn't go on as it does? Juno. Darkly. You think it goes on respectably, but I can tell you as a solicitor. Mrs. Lunn. Stuff. Of course all the disreputable people who get into trouble go to you, just as all the sick people go to the doctors, but most people never go to a solicitor. Juno. Rising, with a growing sense of injury. Look here, Mrs. Lunn, do you think a man's heart is a potato? Or a turnip? Or a ball of knitting wool? That you can throw it away like this? Mrs. Lunn. I don't throw away balls of knitting wool. A man's heart seems to me much like a sponge, it sops up dirty water as well as clean. Juno. I have never been treated like this in my life. Here am I, a married man, with a most attractive wife, a wife I adore, and who adores me, and has never as much as looked at any other man since we were married. I come and throw all this at your feet. I. I, a solicitor. Braving the risk of your husband putting me into the divorce court and making me a beggar and an outcast. I do this for your sake. And you go on as if I were making no sacrifice, as if I had told you it's a fine evening, or asked you to have a cup of tea. It's not human. It's not right. Love has its rights as well as respectability. He sits down again, aloof and sulky. Mrs. Lunn. Nonsense. Here, here's a flower. She gives him one. 
Go and dream over it until you feel hungry. Nothing brings people to their senses like hunger. Juno. Contemplating the flower without rapture. What good's this? Mrs. Lunn. Snatching it from him. Oh. You don't love me a bit. Juno. Yes I do. Or at least I did. But I'm an Englishman, and I think you ought to respect the conventions of English life. Mrs. Lunn. But I am respecting them, and you're not. Juno. Pardon me. I may be doing wrong, but I'm doing it in a proper and customary manner. You may be doing right, but you're doing it in an unusual and questionable manner. I am not prepared to put up with that. I can stand being badly treated, I'm no baby, and can take care of myself with anybody. And of course I can stand being well treated. But the thing I can't stand is being unexpectedly treated. It's outside my scheme of life. So come now. You've got to behave naturally and straightforwardly with me. You can leave husband and child, home, friends, and country, for my sake, and come with me to some southern isle, or say South America, where we can be all in all to one another. Or you can tell your husband and let him jolly well punch my head if he can. But I'm damned if I'm going to stand any eccentricity. It's not respectable. Gregory. Coming in from the terrace and advancing with dignity to his wife's end of the Chesterfield. Will you have the goodness, sir, in addressing this lady, to keep your temper and refrain from using profane language? Mrs. Lunn. Rising, delighted. Gregory. Darling. She enfolds him in a copious embrace. Juno. Rising. You make love to another man to my face. Mrs. Lunn. Why, he's my husband. Juno. That takes away the last rag of excuse for such conduct. A nice world it would be if married people were to carry on their endearments before everybody. Gregory. This is ridiculous. What the devil business is it of yours what passes between my wife and myself? You're not her husband, are you? Juno. Not at present, but I'm on the list. I'm her prospective husband, you're only her actual one. I'm the anticipation, you're the disappointment. Mrs. Lunn. Oh, my Gregory is not a disappointment. Fondly. Are you, dear? Gregory. You just wait, my pet. I'll settle this chap for you. He disengages himself from her embrace, and faces Juno. She sits down placidly. You call me a disappointment, do you? Well, I suppose every husband's a disappointment. What about yourself? Don't try to look like an unmarried man. I happen to know the lady you disappointed. I traveled in the same ship with her. Anne. Juno. And you fell in love with her. Gregory. Taken aback. Who told you that? Juno. Aha. You confess it. Well, if you want to know, nobody told me. Everybody falls in love with my wife. Gregory. And do you fall in love with everybody's wife? Juno. Certainly not. Only with yours. Mrs. Lunn. But what's the good of saying that, Mr. Juno? I'm married to him, and there's an end of it. Juno. Not at all. You can get a divorce. Mrs. Lunn. What for? Juno. For his misconduct with my wife. Gregory. Deeply indignant. How dare you, sir, asperse the character of that sweet lady. A lady whom I have taken under my protection. Juno. Protection. Mrs. Juno. Returning hastily. Really you must be more careful what you say about me, Mr. Lunn. Juno. My precious. He embraces her. Pardon this betrayal of my feeling, but I've not seen my wife for several weeks. And she is very dear to me. Gregory. I call this cheek. 
Who is making love to his own wife before people now, pray? Mrs. Lunn. Won't you introduce me to your wife, Mr. Juno? Mrs. Juno. How do you do? They shake hands, and Mrs. Juno sits down beside Mrs. Lunn, on her left. Mrs. Lunn. I'm so glad to find you do credit to Gregory's taste. I'm naturally rather particular about the women he falls in love with. Juno. Sternly. This is no way to take your husband's unfaithfulness. To Lun. You ought to teach your wife better. Where's her feelings? It's scandalous. Gregory. What about your own conduct, pray? Juno. I don't defend it, and there's an end of the matter. Gregory. Well, upon my soul. What difference does your not defending it make? Juno. A fundamental difference. To serious people I may appear wicked. I don't defend myself, I am wicked, though not bad at heart. To thoughtless people I may even appear comic. Well, laugh at me, I have given myself away. But Mrs. Lund seems to have no opinion at all about me. She doesn't seem to know whether I'm wicked or comic. She doesn't seem to care. She has no moral sense. I say it's not right. I repeat, I have sinned, and I'm prepared to suffer. Mrs. Juno. Have you really sinned, Tops? Mrs. Lunn. Blandly. I don't remember your sinning. I have a shocking bad memory for trifles, but I think I should remember that, if you mean me. Juno. Raging. Trifles. I have fallen in love with a monster. Gregory. Don't you dare call my wife a monster. Mrs. Juno. Rising quickly and coming between them. Please don't lose your temper, Mr. Lunn, I won't have my tops bullied. Gregory. Well, then, let him not brag about sinning with my wife. He turns impulsively to his wife, makes her rise and takes her proudly on his arm. What pretension has he to any such honor? Juno. I sinned in intention. Mrs. Juno abandons him and resumes her seat, chilled. I'm as guilty as if I had actually sinned. And I insist on being treated as a sinner, and not walked over as if I'd done nothing, by your wife or any other man. Mrs. Lunn. Tush. She sits down again contemptuously. Juno. Furious. I won't be belittled. Mrs. Lunn. To Mrs. Juno. I hope you'll come and stay with us now that you and Gregory are such friends, Mrs. Juno. Juno. This insane magnanimity. Mrs. Lunn. Don't you think you've said enough, Mr. Juno? This is a matter for two women to settle. Won't you take a stroll on the beach with my Gregory while we talk it over? Gregory is a splendid listener. Juno. I don't think any good can come of a conversation between Mr. Lunn and myself. We can hardly be expected to improve one another's morals. He passes behind the Chesterfield to Mrs. Lunn's end, seizes a chair, deliberately pushes it between Gregory and Mrs. Lunn. And sits down with folded arms, resolved not to budge. Gregory. Oh. Indeed. Oh, all right. If you come to that, he crosses to Mrs. Juno, plants a chair by her side. And sits down with equal determination. Juno. Now we are both equally guilty. Gregory. Pardon me. I'm not guilty. Juno. In intention. Don't quibble. You were guilty in intention, as I was. Gregory. No. I should rather describe myself guilty in fact, but not in intention. Rising and exclaiming simultaneously. Juno. What? Mrs. Juno. No, really. Mrs. Lunn. Gregory. Gregory. Yes, I maintain that I am responsible for my intentions only, 
and not for reflex actions over which I have no control. Mrs. Juno sits down, ashamed. I promised my mother that I would never tell a lie, and that I would never make love to a married woman. I never have told a lie. Mrs. Lunn. Remonstrating. Gregory. She sits down again. Gregory. I say never. On many occasions I have resorted to prevarication, but on great occasions I have always told the truth. I regard this as a great occasion. And I won't be intimidated into breaking my promise. I solemnly declare that I did not know until this evening that Mrs. Juno was married. She will bear me out when I say that from that moment my intentions were strictly and resolutely honorable. Though my conduct, which I could not control and am therefore not responsible for, was disgraceful, or would have been had this gentleman not walked in and begun making love to my wife under my very nose. Juno. Flinging himself back into his chair. Well, I like this. Mrs. Lunn. Really, darling, there's no use in the pot calling the kettle black. Gregory. When you say darling, may I ask which of us you are addressing? Mrs. Lunn. I really don't know. I'm getting hopelessly confused. Juno. Why don't you let my wife say something? I don't think she ought to be thrust into the background like this. Mrs. Lunn. I'm sorry, I'm sure. Please excuse me, dear. Mrs. Juno. Thoughtfully. I don't know what to say. I must think over it. I have always been rather severe on this sort of thing, but when it came to the point I didn't behave as I thought I should behave. I didn't intend to be wicked. But somehow or other, nature, or whatever you choose to call it, didn't take much notice of my intentions. Gregory instinctively seeks her hand and presses it. And I really did think, Tops, that I was the only woman in the world for you. Juno. Cheerfully. Oh, that's all right, my precious. Mrs. Lunn thought she was the only woman in the world for him. Gregory. Reflectively. So she is, in a sort of way. Juno. Flaring up. And so is my wife. Don't you set up to be a better husband than I am, for you're not. I've owned I'm wrong. You haven't. Mrs. Lunn. Are you sorry, Gregory? Gregory. Perplexed. Sorry? Mrs. Lunn. Yes, sorry. I think it's time for you to say you're sorry, and to make friends with Mr. Juno before we all dine together. Gregory. Seraphita, I promised my mother. Mrs. Juno. Involuntarily. Oh, bother your mother. Recovering herself. I beg your pardon. Gregory. A promise is a promise. I can't tell a deliberate lie. I know I ought to be sorry, but the flat fact is that I'm not sorry. I find that in this business, somehow or other, there is a disastrous separation between my moral principles and my conduct. Juno. There's nothing disastrous about it. It doesn't matter about your conduct if your principles are all right. Gregory. Bosh. It doesn't matter about your principles if your conduct is all right. Juno. But your conduct isn't all right, and my principles are. Gregory. What's the good of your principles being right if they won't work? Juno. They will work, sir, if you exercise self-sacrifice. Gregory. Oh yes, if, if, if. You know jolly well that self-sacrifice doesn't work either when you really want a thing. How much have you sacrificed yourself, pray? Mrs. Lunn. Oh, a great deal, Gregory. Don't be rude. Mr. Juno is a very nice man, he has been most attentive to me on the voyage. Gregory. And Mrs. Juno's a very nice woman. She oughtn't to be, but she is. Juno. Why oughtn't she to be a nice woman, pray? Gregory. I mean she oughtn't to be nice to me. 
and you oughtn't to be nice to my wife. And your wife oughtn't to like me. And my wife oughtn't to like you. And if they do, they oughtn't to go on liking us. And I oughtn't to like your wife. And you oughtn't to like mine, and if we do we oughtn't to go on liking them. But we do, all of us. We oughtn't, but we do. Juno. But, my dear boy, if we admit we are in the wrong where's the harm of it? We're not perfect, but as long as we keep the ideal before us. Gregory. How? Juno. By admitting we're wrong. Mrs. Lunn. Springing up, out of patience, and pacing round the lounge intolerantly. Well, really, I must have my dinner. These two men, with their morality, and their promises to their mothers, and their admissions that they were wrong, and their sinning and suffering. And their going on at one another as if it meant anything, or as if it mattered, are getting on my nerves. Stooping over the back of the Chesterfield to address Mrs. Juno. If you will be so very good, my dear, as to take my sentimental husband off my hands occasionally, I shall be more than obliged to you, I'm sure you can stand more male sentimentality than I can. Sweeping away to the fireplace. I, on my part, will do my best to amuse your excellent husband when you find him tiresome. Juno. I call this polyandry. Mrs. Lunn. I wish you wouldn't call innocent things by offensive names, Mr. Juno. What do you call your own conduct? Juno. Rising. I tell you I have admitted. Gregory. What's the good of keeping on at that? Mrs. Juno. Oh, not that again, please. Mrs. Lunn. Tops, I'll scream if you say that again. Juno. Oh, well, if you won't listen to me. He sits down again. Mrs. Juno. What is the position now exactly? Mrs. Lunn shrugs her shoulders and gives up the conundrum. Gregory looks at Juno. Juno turns away his head huffily. I mean, what are we going to do? Mrs. Lunn. What would you advise, Mr. Juno? Juno. I should advise you to divorce your husband. Mrs. Lunn. Do you want me to drag your wife into court and disgrace her? Juno. No, I forgot that. Excuse me, but for the moment I thought I was married to you. Gregory. I think we had better let bygones be bygones. To Mrs. Juno, very tenderly. You will forgive me, won't you? Why should you let a moment's forgetfulness embitter all our future life? Mrs. Juno. But it's Mrs. Lunn who has to forgive you. Gregory. Oh, dash it, I forgot. This is getting ridiculous. Mrs. Lunn. I'm getting hungry. Mrs. Juno. Do you really mind, Mrs. Lunn? Mrs. Lunn. My dear Mrs. Juno, Gregory is one of those terribly uxorious men who ought to have ten wives. If any really nice woman will take him off my hands for a day or two occasionally, I shall be greatly obliged to her. Gregory. Seraphita, you cut me to the soul. He weeps. Mrs. Lunn. Serve you right. You'd think it quite proper if it cut me to the soul. Mrs. Juno. Am I to take Sibthorpe off your hands too, Mrs. Lunn? Juno. Rising. Do you suppose I'll allow this? Mrs. Juno. You've admitted that you've done wrong, Tops. What's the use of your allowing or not allowing after that? Juno. I do not admit that I have done wrong. I admit that what I did was wrong. Gregory. Can you explain the distinction? Juno. It's quite plain to anyone but an imbecile. If you tell me I've done something wrong you insult me. But if you say that something that I did is wrong you simply raise a question of morals. I tell you flatly if you say I did anything wrong you will have to fight me. In fact I think we ought to fight anyhow. I don't particularly want to but I feel that England expects us to. Gregory. 
I won't fight. If you beat me my wife would share my humiliation. If I beat you, she would sympathize with you and loathe me for my brutality. Mrs. Lunn. Not to mention that as we are human beings and not reindeer or barn door fowl, if two men presumed to fight for us we couldn't decently ever speak to either of them again. Gregory. Besides, neither of us could beat the other, as we neither of us know how to fight. We should only blacken each other's eyes and make fools of ourselves. Juno. I don't admit that. Every Englishman can use his fists. Gregory. You're an Englishman. Can you use yours? Juno. I presume so, I never tried. Mrs. Juno. You never told me you couldn't fight, Tops. I thought you were an accomplished boxer. Juno. My precious, I never gave you any ground for such a belief. Mrs. Juno. You always talked as if it were a matter of course. You spoke with the greatest contempt of men who didn't kick other men downstairs. Juno. Well, I can't kick Mr. Lunn downstairs. We're on the ground floor. Mrs. Juno. You could throw him into the harbor. Gregory. Do you want me to be thrown into the harbor? Mrs. Juno. No, I only want to show Tops that he's making a ghastly fool of himself. Gregory. Rising and prowling disgustedly between the Chesterfield and the windows. We're all making fools of ourselves. Juno. Following him. Well, if we're not to fight, I must insist at least on your never speaking to my wife again. Gregory. Does my speaking to your wife do you any harm? Juno. No. But it's the proper course to take. Emphatically. We must behave with some sort of decency. Mrs. Lunn. And are you never going to speak to me again, Mr. Juno? Juno. I'm prepared to promise never to do so. I think your husband has a right to demand that. Then if I speak to you after, it will not be his fault. It will be a breach of my promise. And I shall not attempt to defend my conduct. Gregory. Facing him. I shall talk to your wife as often as she'll let me. Mrs. Juno. I have no objection to your speaking to me, Mr. Lunn. Juno. Then I shall take steps. Gregory. What steps? Juno. Steps. Measures. Proceedings. What steps as may seem advisable? Mrs. Lunn. To Mrs. Juno. Can your husband afford a scandal, Mrs. Juno? Mrs. Juno. No. Mrs. Lunn. Neither can mine. Gregory. Mrs. Juno, I'm very sorry I let you in for all this. I don't know how it is that we contrive to make feelings like ours, which seems to me to be beautiful and sacred feelings, and which lead to such interesting and exciting adventures. End in vulgar squabbles and degrading scenes. Juno. I decline to admit that my conduct has been vulgar or degrading. Gregory. I promised. Juno. Look here, old chap, I don't say a word against your mother. And I'm sorry she's dead, but really, you know, most women are mothers, and they all die some time or other, yet that doesn't make them infallible authorities on morals, does it? Gregory. I was about to say so myself. Let me add that if you do things merely because you think some other fool expects you to do them, and he expects you to do them because he thinks you expect him to expect you to do them. It will end in everybody doing what nobody wants to do, which is in my opinion a silly state of things. Juno. Lun, I love your wife, and that's all about it. Gregory. Juno, I love yours. What then? Juno. Clearly she must never see you again. Mrs. Juno. Why not? Juno. Why not? My love, I'm surprised at you. Mrs. Juno. Am I to speak only to men who dislike me? Juno. Yes, 
I think that is, properly speaking, a married woman's duty. Mrs. Juno. Then I won't do it, that's flat. I like to be liked. I like to be loved. I want everyone round me to love me. I don't want to meet or speak to anyone who doesn't like me. Juno. But, my precious, this is the most horrible immorality. Mrs. Lunn. I don't intend to give up meeting you, Mr. Juno. You amuse me very much. I don't like being loved, it bores me. But I do like to be amused. Juno. I hope we shall meet very often. But I hope also we shall not defend our conduct. Mrs. Juno. Rising. This is unendurable. We've all been flirting. Need we go on footling about it? Juno. Huffily. I don't know what you call footling. Mrs. Juno. Cutting him short. You do. You're footling. Mr. Lunn is footling. Can't we admit that we're human and have done with it? Juno. I have admitted it all along. I. Mrs. Juno. Almost screaming. Then stop footling. The dinner gong sounds. Mrs. Lunn. Rising. Thank heaven. Let's go into dinner. Gregory, take in Mrs. Juno. Gregory. But surely I ought to take in our guest, and not my own wife. Mrs. Lunn. Well, Mrs. Juno is not your wife, is she? Gregory. Oh, of course, I beg your pardon. I'm hopelessly confused. He offers his arm to Mrs. Juno, rather apprehensively. Mrs. Juno. You seem quite afraid of me. She takes his arm. Gregory. I am. I simply adore you. They go out together. And as they pass through the door he turns and says in a ringing voice to the other couple. I have said to Mrs. Juno that I simply adore her. He takes her out defiantly. Mrs. Lunn. Calling after him. Yes, dear. She's a darling. To Juno. Now, Sibthorpe. Juno. Giving her his arm gallantly. You have called me Sibthorpe. Thank you. I think Lunn's conduct fully justifies me in allowing you to do it. Mrs. Lunn. Yes, I think you may let yourself go now. Juno. Seraphita, I worship you beyond expression. Mrs. Lunn. Sibthorpe, you amuse me beyond description. Come. They go into dinner together. Great Catherine. In Catherine's reign. Whom glory still adores. Byron. The author's apology for Great Catherine. Exception has been taken to the title of this seeming tomfoolery on the ground that the Catherine it represents is not Great Catherine but the Catherine whose gallantries provide some of the lightest pages of modern history. Great Catherine, it is said, was the Catherine whose diplomacy, whose campaigns and conquests, whose plans of liberal reform, whose correspondence with Grimm and Voltaire enabled her to cut such a magnificent figure in the 18th century. In reply, I can only confess that Catherine's diplomacy and her conquests do not interest me. It is clear to me that neither she nor the statesmen with whom she played this mischievous kind of political chess had any notion of the real history of their own times. Or of the real forces that were molding Europe. The French Revolution, which made such short work of Catherine's Voltairean principles, surprised and scandalized her as much as it surprised and scandalized any provincial governess in the French chateaus. The main difference between her and our modern liberal governments was that whereas she talked and wrote quite intelligently about liberal principles before she was frightened into making such talking and writing a flogging matter. Our liberal ministers take the name of liberalism in vain without knowing or caring enough about its meaning even to talk and scribble about it, and pass their flogging bills. And institute their prosecutions for sedition and blasphemy and so forth, 
without the faintest suspicion that such proceedings need any apology from the liberal point of view. It was quite easy for Padyomkin to humbug Catherine as to the condition of Russia by conducting her through sham cities run up for the occasion by scenic artists. But in the little world of European court intrigue and dynastic diplomacy which was the only world she knew she was more than a match for him and for all the rest of her contemporaries. In such intrigue and diplomacy, however, there was no romance, no scientific political interest, nothing that a sane mind can now retain even if it can be persuaded to waste time in reading it up. But Catherine as a woman with plenty of character and, as we should say, no morals, still fascinates and amuses us as she fascinated and amused her contemporaries. They were great sentimental comedians, these Peters, Elizabeths, and Catherines who played their czarships as eccentric character parts. And produced scene after scene of furious harlequinade with the monarch as clown, and of tragic relief in the torture chamber with the monarch as pantomime demon committing real atrocities. Not forgetting the indispensable love interest on an enormous and utterly indecorous scale. Catherine kept this vast Gignol theatre open for nearly half a century, not as a Russian. But as a highly domesticated German lady whose household routine was not at all so unlike that of Queen Victoria as might be expected from the difference in their notions of propriety in sexual relations. In short, if Byron leaves you with an impression that he said very little about Catherine, and that little not what was best worth saying. I beg to correct your impression by assuring you that what Byron said was all there really is to say that is worth saying. His Catherine is my Catherine and everybody's Catherine. The young man who gains her favor is a Spanish nobleman in his version. I have made him an English country gentleman, who gets out of his rather dangerous scrape by simplicity, sincerity, and the courage of these qualities. By this I have given some offense to the many Britons who see themselves as heroes, what they mean by heroes being theatrical snobs of superhuman pretensions which, though quite groundless, are admitted with awe by the rest of the human race. They say I think an Englishman a fool. When I do, they have themselves to thank. I must not, however, pretend that historical portraiture was the motive of a play that will leave the reader as ignorant of Russian history as he may be now before he has turned the page. Nor is the sketch of Catherine complete even idiosyncratically, leaving her politics out of the question. For example, she wrote bushels of plays. I confess I have not yet read any of them. The truth is, this play grew out of the relations which inevitably exist in the theatre between authors and actors. If the actors have sometimes to use their skill as the author's puppets rather than in full self-expression, the author has sometimes to use his skill as the actor's tailor. Fitting them with parts written to display the virtuosity of the performer rather than to solve problems of life, character, or history. Feats of this kind may tickle an author's technical vanity. But he is bound on such occasions to admit that the performer for whom he writes is the online begetter of his work. Which must be regarded critically as an addition to the debt dramatic literature owes to the art of acting and its exponents. Those who have seen Miss Gertrude Kingston play the part of Catherine will have no difficulty in believing that it was her talent rather than mine that brought the play into existence. I once recommended Miss Kingston professionally to play queens. Now in the modern drama there were no queens for her to play. And as to the older literature of our stage, did it not provoke the veteran actress in Sir Arthur Pinero's Trelawney of the Wells to declare that, as parts, queens are not worth a tinker's oath? Miss Kingston's comment on my suggestion, though more elegantly worded, was to the same effect, and it ended in my having to make good my advice by writing, Great Catherine. History provided no other queen capable of standing up to our joint talents. In composing such bravura pieces, the author limits himself only by the range of the virtuoso, which by definition far transcends the modesty of nature. If my Russians seem more Muscovite than any Russian, and my English people more insular than any Briton, I will not plead, as I honestly might. That the fiction has yet to be written that can exaggerate the reality of such subjects. That the apparently outrageous Padyomkin is but a timidly bodlerized ghost of the original. 
and that Captain Ed Staston is no more than a miniature that might hang appropriately on the walls of 19 out of 20 English country houses to this day. An artistic presentment must not condescend to justify itself by a comparison with crude nature. And I prefer to admit that in this kind my dramatis personae are, as they should be, of the stage stagey, challenging the actor to act up to them or beyond them, if he can. The more heroic the overcharging, the better for the performance. In dragging the reader thus for a moment behind the scenes, I am departing from a rule which I have hitherto imposed on myself so rigidly that I never permit myself, even in a stage direction. To let slip a word that could bludgeon the imagination of the reader by reminding him of the boards and the footlights and the sky borders and the rest of the theatrical scaffolding. For which nevertheless I have to plan as carefully as if I were the head carpenter as well as the author. But even at the risk of talking shop, an honest playwright should take at least one opportunity of acknowledging that his art is not only limited by the art of the actor, but often stimulated and developed by it. No sane and skilled author writes plays that present impossibilities to the actor or to the stage engineer. If, as occasionally happens, he asks them to do things that they have never done before and cannot conceive as presentable or possible, as Wagner and Thomas Hardy have done, for example. It is always found that the difficulties are not really insuperable, the author having foreseen unsuspected possibilities both in the actor and in the audience whose will to make believe can perform the quaintest miracles. Thus may authors advance the arts of acting and of staging plays. But the actor also may enlarge the scope of the drama by displaying powers not previously discovered by the author. If the best available actors are only Horatios, the authors will have to leave Hamlet out, and be content with Horatios for heroes. Some of the difference between Shakespeare's Orlando's and Bassanio's and Bertram's and his Hamlet's and Macbeth's must have been due not only to his development as a dramatic poet, but to the development of Burbage as an actor. Playwrights do not write for ideal actors when their livelihood is at stake, if they did, they would write parts for heroes with twenty arms like an Indian god. Indeed the actor often influences the author too much. For I can remember a time, I am not implying that it is yet wholly past, when the art of writing a fashionable play had become very largely the art of writing it, round, the personalities of a group. Of fashionable performers of whom Burbage would certainly have said that their parts needed no acting. Everything has its abuse as well as its use. It is also to be considered that great plays live longer than great actors, though little plays do not live nearly so long as the worst of their exponents. The consequence is that the great actor, instead of putting pressure on contemporary authors to supply him with heroic parts, falls back on the Shakespearean repertory. And takes what he needs from a dead hand. In the nineteenth century, the careers of Keane, McCready, Barry Sullivan, and Irving, ought to have produced a group of heroic plays comparable in intensity to those of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. But nothing of the kind happened these actors played the works of dead authors, or, very occasionally, of live poets who were hardly regular professional playwrights. Sheridan Knowles, Bulwer-Lytton, Wills, and Tennyson produced a few glaringly artificial high horses for the great actors of their time. But the playwrights proper, who really kept the theatre going, and were kept going by the theatre, did not cater for the great actors, they could not afford to compete with a bard who was not for an age but for all time, and who had, moreover, the overwhelming attraction for the actor-managers of not charging authors' fees. The result was that the playwrights and the great actors ceased to think of themselves as having any concern with one another, Tom Robertson, Ibsen, Pinero, and Barry might as well have belonged to a different solar system as far as Irving was concerned and the same was true of their respective predecessors. Thus was established an evil tradition, but I at least can plead that it does not always hold good. If Forbes Robertson had not been there to play Caesar, should not have written Caesar and Cleopatra. If Ellen Terry had never been born, Captain Brassbound's conversion would never have been effected. The Devil's Disciple, with which I won my cordon blue in America as a potboiler, would have had a different sort of hero if Richard Mansfield had been a different sort of actor. 
Though the actual commission to write it came from an English actor, William Terrace, who was assassinated before he recovered from the dismay into which the result of his rash proposal threw him. For it must be said that the actor or actress who inspires or commissions a play as often as not regards it as a Frankenstein's monster, and will have none of it. That does not make him or her any the less parental in the fecundity of the playwright. To an author who has any feeling of his business there is a keen and whimsical joy in divining and revealing a side of an actor's genius overlooked before, and unsuspected even by the actor himself. When I snatched Mr. Lewis Calvert from Shakespeare, and made him wear a frock coat and silk hat on the stage for perhaps the first time in his life. I do not think he expected in the least that his performance would enable me to boast of his Tom Broadbent as a genuine stage classic. Mrs. Patrick Campbell was famous before I wrote for her, but not for playing illiterate cockney flower maidens. And in the case which is provoking me to all these impertinences, I am quite sure that Miss Gertrude Kingston, who first made her reputation as an impersonator of the most delightfully feather-headed and inconsequent ingenues, thought me more than usually mad when I persuaded her to play the Helen of Euripides, and then launched her on a queenly career as Catherine of Russia. It is not the whole truth that if we take care of the actors the plays will take care of themselves, nor is it any truer that if we take care of the plays the actors will take care of themselves. There is both give and take in the business. I have seen plays written for actors that made me exclaim, how oft the sight of means to do ill deeds makes deeds ill done. But Burbage may have flourished the prompt copy of Hamlet under Shakespeare's nose at the tenth rehearsal and cried, how oft the sight of means to do great deeds makes playwrights great. I say the tenth because I am convinced that at the first he denounced his part as a rotten one, thought the ghost speech ridiculously long, and wanted to play the king. Anyhow, whether he had the wit to utter it or not, the boast would have been a valid one. The best conclusion is that every actor should say, if I create the hero in myself, God will send an author to write his part. For in the long run the actors will get the authors, and the authors the actors, they deserve. Dramatis Personi. Patiomkin. A Cossack Sergeant. Varinka. Captain Edstaston of the Light Dragoons. Catherine II, Empress of Russia. The Princess Dashkov. Narishkin. The Chamberlain. Claire. Guards and Courtiers. The First Scene. 1776. Patiomkin in his bureau in the Winter Palace, St. Petersburg. Huge palatial apartment, style, Russia in the 18th century imitating the Versailles du Roi Soleil. Extravagant luxury. Also dirt and disorder. Patiomkin, gigantic in stature and build, his face marred by the loss of one eye and a marked squint in the other. Sits at the end of a table littered with papers and the remains of three or four successive breakfasts. He has supplies of coffee and brandy at hand sufficient for a party of ten. His coat, encrusted with diamonds, is on the floor. It has fallen off a chair placed near the other end of the table for the convenience of visitors. His court sword, with its attachments, is on the chair. His three-cornered hat, also bejeweled, is on the table. He himself is half-dressed in an unfastened shirt and an immense dressing gown, once gorgeous, now food-splashed and dirty, as it serves him for towel, handkerchief, duster, and every other use to which a textile fabric can be put by a slovenly man. It does not conceal his huge hairy chest, nor his half-button knee breeches, nor his legs. These are partly clad in silk stockings, which he occasionally hitches up to his knees, and presently shakes down to his shins, by his restless movement. His feet are thrust into enormous slippers, worth, with their crust of jewels, several thousand rubles apiece. Superficially Padiomkin is a violent, brutal barbarian, an upstart despot of the most intolerable and dangerous type, ugly, lazy, and disgusting in his personal habits. Yet ambassadors report him the ablest man in Russia, and the one who can do most with the still abler Empress Catherine II, who is not a Russian but a German. By no means barbarous or intemperate in her personal habits. 
she not only disputes with Frederick the Great the reputation of being the cleverest monarch in Europe, but may even put in a very plausible claim to be the cleverest and most attractive individual alive. Now she not only tolerates Pateyomkin long after she has got over her first romantic attachment to him, but esteems him highly as a counselor and a good friend. His love letters are among the best on record. He has a wild sense of humor, which enables him to laugh at himself as well as at everybody else. In the eyes of the English visitor now about to be admitted to his presence he may be an outrageous ruffian. In fact he actually is an outrageous ruffian, in no matter whose eyes. But the visitor will find out, as everyone else sooner or later fends out, that he is a man to be reckoned with even by those who are not intimidated by his temper, bodily strength, and exalted rank. A pretty young lady, Varinka, his favorite niece, is lounging on an ottoman between his end of the table and the door, very sulky and dissatisfied. Perhaps because he is preoccupied with his papers and his brandy bottle, and she can see nothing of him but his broad back. There is a screen behind the ottoman. An old soldier, a Cossack sergeant, enters. The sergeant. Softly to the lady, holding the door handle. Little darling honey, is His Highness the Prince very busy? Varinka. His Highness the Prince is very busy. He is singing out of tune, he is biting his nails, he is scratching his head. He is hitching up his untidy stockings, he is making himself disgusting and odious to everybody. And he is pretending to read state papers that he does not understand because he is too lazy and selfish to talk and be companionable. Patiomkin. Growls. Then wipes his nose with his dressing gown. Varinka. Pig. Ugh. She curls herself up with a shiver of disgust and retires from the conversation. The sergeant. Stealing across to the coat, and picking it up to replace it on the back of the chair. Little father, the English captain, so highly recommended to you by old Fritz of Prussia, by the English ambassador. And by Monsieur Voltaire, whom crossing himself may God in his infinite mercy damn eternally, is in the antechamber and desires audience. Patiomkin. Deliberately. To hell with the English captain, and to hell with old Fritz of Prussia, and to hell with the English ambassador. And to hell with Monsieur Voltaire, and to hell with you too. The sergeant. Have mercy on me, little father. Your head is bad this morning. You drink too much French brandy and too little good Russian kvass. Patiomkin. With sudden fury. Why are visitors of consequence announced by a sergeant? Springing at him and seizing him by the throat. What do you mean by this, you hound? Do you want five thousand blows of the stick? Where is General Volkonsky? The sergeant. On his knees. Little father. You kicked His Highness downstairs. Patiomkin. Flinging him down and kicking him. You lie, you dog. You lie. The sergeant. Little father, life is hard for the poor. If you say it is a lie, it is a lie. He fell downstairs. I picked him up, and he kicked me. They all kick me when you kick them. God knows that is not just, little father. Patiomkin. Laughs ogreishly, then returns to his place at the table, chuckling. Varinka. Savage. Boar. It is a disgrace. No wonder the French sneer at us as barbarians. The sergeant. Who has crept round the table to the screen, and insinuated himself between Patiomkin's back and Varinka. Do you think the prince will see the captain, little darling? Patiomkin. He will not see any captain. Go to the devil. The sergeant. Be merciful, little father. God knows it is your duty to see him. To Varinka. Intercede for him and for me, beautiful little darling. He has given me a ruble. Patiomkin. Oh, send him in, send him in, and stop pestering me. Am I never to have a moment's peace? The sergeant salutes joyfully and hurries out, 
divining that Padyomkin has intended to see the English captain all along. And has played this comedy of fury and exhausted impatience to conceal his interest in the visitor. Varenka. Have you no shame? You refuse to see the most exalted persons. You kick princes and generals downstairs. And then you see an English captain merely because he has given a ruble to that common soldier. It is scandalous. Patyomkin. Darling beloved, I am drunk, but I know what I am doing. I wish to stand well with the English. Varinka. And you think you will impress an Englishman by receiving him as you are now, half drunk? Patyomkin. Gravely. It is true, the English despise men who cannot drink. I must make myself wholly drunk. He takes a huge draught of brandy. Varinka. Sot. The sergeant returns ushering a handsome strongly built young English officer in the uniform of a light dragoon. He is evidently on fairly good terms with himself, and very sure of his social position. He crosses the room to the end of the table opposite Padyomkin's, and awaits the civilities of that statesman with confidence. The sergeant remains prudently at the door. The sergeant. Paternally. Little father, this is the English captain, so well recommended to her sacred majesty the empress. God knows, he needs your countenance and protec, he vanishes precipitately, seeing that Padyomkin is about to throw a bottle at him. The captain contemplates these preliminaries with astonishment, and with some displeasure, which is not allayed when Padyomkin, hardly condescending to look at his visitor, of whom he nevertheless takes stock with the corner of his one eye, says gruffly. Well? Ed Staston. My name is Ed Staston, Captain Ed Staston of the Light Dragoons. I have the honor to present to your highness this letter from the British ambassador, which will give you all necessary particulars. He hands Patyomkin the letter. Patyomkin. Tearing it open and glancing at it for about a second. What do you want? Ed Staston. The letter will explain to your highness who I am. Patyomkin. I don't want to know who you are. What do you want? Ed Staston. An audience of the Empress. Patyomkin contemptuously throws the letter aside. Ed Staston adds hotly. Also some civility, if you please. Patyomkin. With derision. Ho. Varinka. My uncle is receiving you with unusual civility, Captain. He has just kicked a general downstairs. Ed Staston. A Russian general, madam? Varinka. Of course. Ed Staston. I must allow myself to say, madam, that your uncle had better not attempt to kick an English officer downstairs. Patyomkin. You want me to kick you upstairs, eh? You want an audience of the Empress. Ed Staston. I have said nothing about kicking, sir. If it comes to that, my boots shall speak for me. Her Majesty has signified a desire to have news of the rebellion in America. I have served against the rebels. And I am instructed to place myself at the disposal of Her Majesty, and to describe the events of the war to her as an eyewitness, in a discreet and agreeable manner. Patyomkin. Shah. I know. You think if she once sets eyes on your face and your uniform your fortune is made. You think that if she could stand a man like me, with only one eye, and a cross eye at that, she must fall down at your feet at first sight, eh? Ed Staston. Shocked and indignant. I think nothing of the sort, and I'll trouble you not to repeat it. If I were a Russian subject and you made such a boast about my queen, I'd strike you across the face with my sword. Patyomkin, with a yell of fury, rushes at him. Hands off, you swine! As Patyomkin, towering over him, attempts to seize him by the throat, at Staston, who is a bit of a wrestler, adroitly backheels him. He falls, amazed, on his back. Varinka. Rushing out. Help. Call the guard. The Englishman is murdering my uncle. Help. Help. 
the guard and the sergeant rush in. Ed Staston draws a pair of small pistols from his boots, and points one at the sergeant and the other at Pediomkin, who is sitting on the floor, somewhat sobered. The soldiers stand irresolute. Ed Staston. Stand off. To Pateyomkin. Order them off, if you don't want a bullet through your silly head. The sergeant. Little father, tell us what to do. Our lives are yours. But God knows you are not fit to die. Pateyomkin. Absurdly self-possessed. Get out. The sergeant. Little father. Pateyomkin. Roaring. Get out. Get out, all of you. They withdraw, much relieved at their escape from the pistol. Pateyomkin attempts to rise, and rolls over. Here. Help me up, will you? Don't you see that I'm drunk and can't get up? Ed Staston. Suspiciously. You want to get hold of me. Pateyomkin. Squatting resignedly against the chair on which his clothes hang. Very well, then, I shall stay where I am, because I'm drunk and you're afraid of me. Ed Staston. I'm not afraid of you, damn you. Pateyomkin. Ecstatically. Darling, your lips are the gates of truth. Now listen to me. He marks off the items of his statement with ridiculous stiff gestures of his head and arms, imitating a puppet. You are Captain Watch's name, and your uncle is the Earl of Watdiakalam, and your father is Bishop of Thingamibob. And you are a young man of the highest SPR, promise, I told you I was drunk, educated at Cambridge, and got your step as captain in the field at the glorious Battle of Bunkers Hill. Invalid home from America at the request of Aunt Fanny, lady-in-waiting to the Queen. All right, eh? Ed Staston. How do you know all this? Pateyomkin. Crowing fantastically. In her lure, darling, 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 darling. Lure you showed me. Ed Staston. But you didn't read it. Pateyomkin. Flapping his fingers at him grotesquely. Only one eye, darling. Cross eye. Sees everything. Read lure ints, ints. Istestaneously. Kindly give me vinegar borel. Green borel. Ani to sober me. Too drunk to speak properly. If you would be so kind, darling. Green borel. Ed Staston, still suspicious, shakes his head and keeps his pistols ready. Reach it myself. He reaches behind him up to the table and snatches at the green bottle, from which he takes a copious draught. Its effect is appalling. His wry faces and agonized belchings are so heartrending that they almost upset its Daston. When the victim at last staggers to his feet, he is a pale fragile nobleman, aged and quite sober, extremely dignified in manner and address, though shaken by his recent convulsions. Young man, it is not better to be drunk than sober, but it is happier. Goodness is not happiness. That is an epigram. But I have overdone this. I am too sober to be good company. Let me redress the balance. He takes a generous draught of brandy, and recovers his geniality. Aha! That's better. And now listen, darling. You must not come to court with pistols in your boots. Ed Staston. I have found them useful. Pateyomkin. Nonsense. I'm your friend. You mistook my intention because I was drunk. Now that I am sober, in moderation, I will prove that I am your friend. Have some diamonds. Roaring. Hello there. Dogs, pigs, hello. The sergeant comes in. The sergeant. God be praised, little father, you are still spared to us. Pateyomkin. Tell them to bring some diamonds. Plenty of diamonds. And rubies. Get out. He aims a kick at the sergeant, who flees. Put up your pistols, darling. I'll give you a pair with gold hand grips. I am your friend. 
Ed Staston. Replacing the pistols in his boots rather unwillingly. Your Highness understands that if I am missing, or if anything happens to me, there will be trouble. Patiomkin. Enthusiastically. Call me darling. Ed Staston. It is not the English custom. Patiomkin. You have no hearts, you English. Slapping his right breast. Heart. Heart. Ed Staston. Pardon, your highness, your heart is on the other side. Patiomkin. Surprised and impressed. Is it? You are learned. You are a doctor. You English are wonderful. We are barbarians, drunken pigs. Catherine does not know it, but we are. Catherine's a German. But I have given her a Russian heart. He is about to slap himself again. Ed Staston. Delicately. The other side, your highness. Patiomkin. Maudlin. Darling, a true Russian has a heart on both sides. The sergeant enters carrying a goblet filled with precious stones. Patiomkin. Get out. He snatches the goblet and kicks the sergeant out, not maliciously but from habit, indeed not noticing that he does it. Darling, have some diamonds. Have a fistful. He takes up a handful and lets them slip back through his fingers into the goblet, which he then offers to Ed Staston. Ed Staston. Thank you, I don't take presents. Patiomkin. Amazed. You refuse. Ed Staston. I thank your highness, but it is not the custom for English gentlemen to take presents of that kind. Patiomkin. Are you really an Englishman? Ed Staston. Bows. Patiomkin. You are the first Englishman I ever saw refuse anything he could get. He puts the goblet on the table, then turns again to Ed Staston. Listen, darling. You are a wrestler, a splendid wrestler. You threw me on my back like magic, though I could lift you with one hand. Darling, you are a giant, a paladin. Ed Staston. Complacently. We wrestle rather well in my part of England. Patiomkin. I have a Turk who is a wrestler, a prisoner of war. You shall wrestle with him for me. I'll stake a million rubles on you. Ed Staston. Incensed. Damn you. Do you take me for a prize fighter? How dare you make me such a proposal? Patiomkin. With wounded feeling. Darling, there is no pleasing you. Don't you like me? Ed Staston. Mollified. Well, in a sort of way I do, though I don't know why I should. But my instructions are that I am to see the Empress. Anne. Patiomkin. Darling, you shall see the Empress. A glorious woman, the greatest woman in the world. But let me give you peace advice, pa. Still drunk. They water my vinegar. He shakes himself, clears his throat, and resumes soberly. If Catherine takes a fancy to you, you may ask for rubles, diamonds, palaces, titles, orders, anything. And you may aspire to everything, field marshal, admiral, minister, what you please, except Tsar. Ed Staston. I tell you I don't want to ask for anything. Do you suppose I am an adventurer and a beggar? Patiomkin. Plaintively. Why not, darling? I was an adventurer. I was a beggar. Ed Staston. Oh, you. Patiomkin. Well, what's wrong with me? Ed Staston. You are a Russian. That's different. Patiomkin. Effusively. Darling, I am a man, and you are a man, and Catherine is a woman. Woman reduces us all to the common denominator. Chuckling. Again an epigram. Gravely. You understand it, I hope. Have you had a college education, darling? I have. Ed Staston. Certainly. 
I am a Bachelor of Arts. Patiomkin. It is enough that you are a bachelor, darling, Catherine will supply the arts. Aha! Another epigram. I am in the vein today. Ed Staston. Embarrassed and a little offended. I must ask your highness to change the subject. As a visitor in Russia, I am the guest of the Empress. And I must tell you plainly that I have neither the right nor the disposition to speak lightly of Her Majesty. Patiomkin. You have conscientious scruples? Ed Staston. I have the scruples of a gentleman. Patiomkin. In Russia a gentleman has no scruples. In Russia we face facts. Ed Staston. In England, sir, a gentleman never faces any facts if they are unpleasant facts. Patiomkin. In real life, darling, all facts are unpleasant. Greatly pleased with himself. Another epigram. Where is my accursed chancellor? These gems should be written down and recorded for posterity. He rushes to the table, sits down, and snatches up a pen. Then, recollecting himself. But I have not asked you to sit down. He rises and goes to the other chair. I am a savage, a barbarian. He throws the shirt and coat over the table onto the floor and puts his sword on the table. Be seated, Captain. Ed Staston. Thank you. They bow to one another ceremoniously. Patiomkin's tendency to grotesque exaggeration costs him his balance. He nearly falls over at Staston, who rescues him and takes the proffered chair. Patiomkin. Resuming his seat. By the way, what was the piece of advice I was going to give you? Ed Staston. As you did not give it, I don't know. Allow me to add that I have not asked for your advice. Patiomkin. I give it to you unasked, delightful Englishman. I remember it now. It was this. Don't try to become Tsar of Russia. Ed Staston. In astonishment. I haven't the slightest intention. Patiomkin. Not now, but you will have, take my word for it. It will strike you as a splendid idea to have conscientious scruples, to desire the blessing of the Church on your union with Catherine. Ed Staston. Racing in utter amazement. My union with Catherine. You're mad. Patiomkin. Unmoved. The day you hint at such a thing will be the day of your downfall. Besides, it is not lucky to be Catherine's husband. You know what happened to Peter. Ed Staston. Shortly, sitting down again. I do not wish to discuss it. Patiomkin. You think she murdered him? Ed Staston. I know that people have said so. Patiomkin. Thunderously, springing to his feet. It is a lie, Orloff murdered him. Subsiding a little. He also knocked my eye out but sitting down placidly I succeeded him for all that. And patting at Staston's hand very affectionately I'm sorry to say, darling, that if you become Tsar, I shall murder you. Ed Staston. Ironically returning the caress. Thank you. The occasion will not arise. Rising. I have the honor to wish your highness good morning. Patiomkin. Jumping up and stopping him on his way to the door. Tut tut. I'm going to take you to the Empress now, this very instant. Ed Staston. In these boots? Impossible. I must change. Patiomkin. Nonsense. You shall come just as you are. You shall show her your calves later on. Ed Staston. But it will take me only half an hour to. Patiomkin. In half an hour it will be too late for the petit lever. Come along. Damn it, man, I must oblige the British ambassador, and the French ambassador, and old Fritz, and Monsieur Voltaire and the rest of them. He shouts rudely to the door. Varinka. To its Staston, with tears in his voice. Varinka shall persuade you, nobody can refuse Varinka anything. 
My niece. A treasure, I assure you. Beautiful. Devoted. Fascinating. Shouting again. Varinka, where the devil are you? Varinka. Returning. I'll not be shouted for. You have the voice of a bear, and the manners of a tinker. Patiomkin. T-S-H-S-H-S-H. Little angel mother, you must behave yourself before the English captain. He takes off his dressing gown and throws it over the papers and the breakfasts, picks up his coat. And disappears behind the screen to complete his toilette. Ed Staston. Madam. He bows. Varinka. Curtsying. Monsieur Le Capitaine. Ed Staston. I must apologize for the disturbance I made, madam. Patiomkin. Behind the screen. You must not call her madam. You must call her little mother, and beautiful darling. Ed Staston. My respect for the lady will not permit it. Varinka. Respect. How can you respect the niece of a savage? Ed Staston. Deprecating. Oh, madam. Varinka. Heaven is my witness, little English father, we need someone who is not afraid of him. He is so strong. I hope you will throw him down on the floor many, many, many times. Patiomkin. Behind the screen. Varinka. Varinka. Yes? Patiomkin. Go and look through the keyhole of the imperial bedchamber, and bring me word whether the empress is awake yet. Varinka. Fi donk. I do not look through keyholes. Patiomkin. Emerging, having arranged his shirt and put on his diamond coat. You have been badly brought up, little darling. Would any lady or gentleman walk unannounced into a room without first looking through the keyhole? Taking his sword from the table and putting it on. The great thing in life is to be simple. And the perfectly simple thing is to look through keyholes. Another epigram, the fifth this morning. Where is my fool of a chancellor? Where is Popoff? Ed Staston. Choking with suppressed laughter. Patiomkin. Gratified. Darling, you appreciate my epigram. Ed Staston. Excuse me. Pop off. Ha. Ha. I can't help laughing. What's his real name, by the way, in case I meet him? Varinka. Surprised. His real name? Popoff, of course. Why do you laugh, little father? Ed Staston. How can anyone with a sense of humor help laughing? Popoff. He is convulsed. Varinka. Looking at her uncle, taps her forehead significantly. Patiomkin. Aside to Varinka. No, only English. He will amuse Catherine. To Ed Staston. Come, you shall tell the joke to the Empress, she is by way of being a humorist. He takes him by the arm, and leads him towards the door. Ed Staston. Resisting. No, really. I am not fit. Patiomkin. Persuade him, little angel mother. Varinka. Taking his other arm. Yes, yes, yes. Little English father. God knows it is your duty to be brave and wait on the Empress. Come. Ed Staston. No. I had rather. Patiomkin. Hauling him along. Come. Varinka. Pulling him and coaxing him. Come, little love, you can't refuse me. Ed Staston. But how can I? Patiomkin. Why not? She won't eat you. Varinka. She will. But you must come. Ed Staston. I assure you, it is quite out of the question, my clothes. Varinka. You look perfect. Patiomkin. Come along, darling. Ed Staston. Struggling. Impossible. 
Varinka. Come, come, come. It's Dastan. No. Believe me, I don't wish, I. Varinka. Carry him, uncle. Petyomkin. Lifting him in his arms like a father carrying a little boy. Yes, I'll carry you. It's Dastan. Dash it all, this is ridiculous. Varinka. Seizing his ankles and dancing as he is carried out. You must come. If you kick you will blacken my eyes. Petyomkin. Come, baby, come. By this time they have made their way through the door and are out of hearing. The second scene. The Empress's Petit Lever. The central doors are closed. Those who enter through them find on their left, on a dais of two broad steps, a magnificent curtained bed. Beyond it a door in the paneling leads to the Empress's cabinet. Near the foot of the bed, in the middle of the room, stands a gilt chair, with the imperial arms carved and the imperial monogram embroidered. The court is in attendance, standing in two melancholy rows down the side of the room opposite to the bed, solemn, bored, waiting for the Empress to awaken. The Princess Dashkov, with two ladies, stands a little in front of the line of courtiers, by the imperial chair. Silence, broken only by the yawns and whispers of the courtiers. Narishkin, the chamberlain, stands by the head of the bed. A loud yawn is heard from behind the curtains. Narishkin. Holding up a warning hand. SSH. The courtiers hastily cease whispering, dress up their lines, and stiffen. Dead silence. A bell tinkles within the curtains. Narishkin and the princess solemnly draw them and reveal the empress. Catherine turns over on her back, and stretches herself. Catherine. Yawning. Hago, ah, ya, ah, ow, what o'clock is it? Her accent is German. Narishkin. Formally. Her imperial majesty is awake. The court falls on its knees. All. Good morning to your majesty. Narishkin. Half past ten, little mother. Catherine. Sitting up abruptly. Potsdazend. Contemplating the kneeling courtiers. Oh, get up, get up. All rise. Your etiquette bores me. I am hardly awake in the morning before it begins. Yawning again, and relapsing sleepily against her pillows. Why do they do it, Narishkin? Narishkin. God knows it is not for your sake, little mother. But you see if you were not a great queen they would all be nobodies. Catherine. Sitting up. They make me do it to keep up their own little dignities. So? Narishkin. Exactly. Also because if they didn't you might have them flogged, dear little mother. Catherine. Springing energetically out of bed and seating herself on the edge of it. Flogged. I. A liberal empress. A philosopher. You are a barbarian, Narishkin. She rises and turns to the courtiers. And then, as if I cared. She turns again to Narishkin. You should know by this time that I am frank and original in character, like an Englishman. She walks about restlessly. No, what maddens me about all this ceremony is that I am the only person in Russia who gets no fun out of my being empress. You all glory in me, you bask in my smiles, you get titles and honors and favors from me, you are dazzled by my crown and my robes, you feel splendid when you have been admitted to my presence. And when I say a gracious word to you, you talk about it to everyone you meet for a week afterwards. But what do I get out of it? Nothing. She throws herself into the chair. Narishkin deprecates with a gesture, she hurls an emphatic repetition at him. Nothing. I wear a crown until my neck aches, I stand looking majestic until I am ready to drop, I have to smile at ugly old ambassadors and frown and turn my back on young and handsome ones. Nobody gives me anything. When I was only an archduchess. The English ambassador used to give me money whenever I wanted it, 
or rather whenever he wanted to get anything out of my sacred predecessor Elizabeth the court bows to the ground. But now that I am empress he never gives me a kopeck. When I have headaches and colics I envy the scullery maids. And you are not a bit grateful to me for all my care of you, my work, my thought, my fatigue, my sufferings. The Princess Dashkov. God knows, little mother, we all implore you to give your wonderful brain a rest. That is why you get headaches. Monsieur Voltaire also has headaches. His brain is just like yours. Catherine. Dashkov, what a liar you are. Dashkov curtsies with impressive dignity. And you think you are flattering me. Let me tell you I would not give a rouble to have the brains of all the philosophers in France. What is our business for today? Narishkin. The new museum, little mother. But the model will not be ready until tonight. Catherine. Rising eagerly. Yes, the museum. An enlightened capital should have a museum. She paces the chamber with a deep sense of the importance of the museum. It shall be one of the wonders of the world. I must have specimens, 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 specimens. Narishkin. You are in high spirits this morning, little mother. Catherine. With sudden levity. I am always in high spirits, even when people do not bring me my slippers. She runs to the chair and sits down, thrusting her feet out. The two ladies rush to her feet, each carrying a slipper. Catherine, about to put her feet into them, is checked by a disturbance in the antechamber. Patiomkin. Carrying it Staston through the antechamber. Useless to struggle. Come along, beautiful baby darling. Come to little mother. He sings. March him baby. Baby, baby. Litli be by bumpkins. Varinka. Joining into the same doggerel in canon, a third above. March him, baby, etc., etc. Ed Staston. Trying to make himself heard. No, no. This is carrying a joke too far. I must insist. Let me down. Hang it, will you let me down? Confound it. No, no. Stop playing the fool, will you? We don't understand this sort of thing in England. I shall be disgraced. Let me down. Catherine. Meanwhile. What a horrible noise. Narishkin, see what it is. Narishkin goes to the door. Catherine. Listening. That is Prince Patiomkin. Narishkin. Calling from the door. Little mother, a stranger. Catherine plunges into bed again and covers herself up. Patiomkin, followed by Varinka, carries its Staston in. Dumps him down on the foot of the bed, and staggers past it to the cabinet door. Varinka joins the courtiers at the opposite side of the room. Catherine, blazing with wrath, pushes its Staston off her bed onto the floor, gets out of bed. And turns on Patiomkin with so terrible an expression that all kneel down hastily except its Staston, who is sprawling on the carpet in angry confusion. Catherine. Patiomkin, how dare you? Looking at its Staston. What is this? Patiomkin. On his knees, tearfully. I don't know. I am drunk. What is this, Varinka? Ed Staston. Scrambling to his feet. Madam, this drunken ruffian. Patiomkin. That's true. Drunken ruffian. Took advantage of my being drunk. Said, take me to Lil Angel Mother. Take me to Bofell Empress. Take me to the greest woman on earth. That's was he he said. I took him. I was wrong. I am not sober. Catherine. Men have grown sober in Siberia for less, Prince. Patiomkin. Serve M. Right. Disgusting habit. Ask Varinka. Catherine turns her face from him to the court. 
The courtiers see that she is trying not to laugh, and know by experience that she will not succeed. They rise, relieved and grinning. Varinka. It is true. He drinks like a pig. Patiomkin. Plaintively. No, not like pig. Like prince. Lil the mother made poor Patiomkin prince. What's use being prince if I mayn't drink? Catherine. Biting her lips. Go. I am offended. Patiomkin. Don't scold, Lil the mother. Catherine. Imperiously. Go. Patiomkin. Rising unsteadily. Yes, go. Go bye bye. Very sleepy. Bur go bye bye then go Siberia. Go bye bye in Lil, mother's bed. He pretends to make an attempt to get into the bed. Catherine. Energetically pulling him back. No, no. Patiomkin. What are you thinking of? He falls like a log on the floor, apparently dead drunk. The Princess Dashkov. Scandalous. An insult to your imperial majesty. Catherine. Dashkov, you have no sense of humor. She steps down to the door level and looks indulgently at Patiomkin. He gurgles brutishly. She has an impulse of disgust. Hog. She kicks him as hard as she can. Oh. You have broken my toe. Brute. Beast. Dashkov is quite right. Do you hear? Patiomkin. If you ask my pipinion of Dashkov, my pipinion is that Dashkov is drunk. Scanlaus. Poor Patiomkin go bye-bye. He relapses into drunken slumbers. Some of the courtiers move to carry him away. Catherine. Stopping them. Let him lie. Let him sleep it off. If he goes out it will be to a tavern and low company for the rest of the day. Indulgently. There. She takes a pillow from the bed and puts it under his head, then turns to its Daston. Surveys him with perfect dignity, and asks, in her queenliest manner. Varinka, who is this gentleman? Varinka. A foreign captain, I cannot pronounce his name. I think he is mad. He came to the prince and said he must see your majesty. He can talk of nothing else. We could not prevent him. Ed Staston. Overwhelmed by this apparent betrayal. Oh. Madam, I am perfectly sane, I am actually an Englishman. I should never have dreamt of approaching your majesty without the fullest credentials. I have letters from the English ambassador, from the Prussian ambassador. Naively. But everybody assured me that Prince Patiomkin is all-powerful with your majesty, so I naturally applied to him. Patiomkin. Interrupts the conversation by an agonized wheezing groan as of a donkey beginning to bray. Catherine. Like a fish fag. Schweig, du Hund. Resuming her impressive royal manner. Have you never been taught, sir, how a gentleman should enter the presence of a sovereign? Ed Staston. Yes, madam, but I did not enter your presence, I was carried. Catherine. But you say you asked the prince to carry you. Ed Staston. Certainly not, madam. I protested against it with all my might. I appeal to this lady to confirm me. Varinka. Pretending to be indignant. Yes, you protested. But, all the same, you were very 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 anxious to see her imperial majesty. You blushed when the prince spoke of her. You threatened to strike him across the face with your sword because you thought he did not speak enthusiastically enough of her. To Catherine. Trust me, he has seen your imperial majesty before. Catherine. To Ed Staston. You have seen us before? Ed Staston. At the review, madam. Varinka. Triumphantly. Aha. I knew it. Your majesty wore the hussar uniform. He saw how radiant. 
How splendid! Your Majesty looked. Oh! He has dared to admire Your Majesty. Such insolence is not to be endured. Ed Staston. All Europe is a party to that insolence, madam. The Princess Dashkov. All Europe is content to do so at a respectful distance. It is possible to admire Her Majesty's policy and her eminence in literature and philosophy without performing acrobatic feats in the imperial bed. Ed Staston. I know nothing about Her Majesty's eminence in policy or philosophy, I don't pretend to understand such things. I speak as a practical man. And I never knew that foreigners had any policy, I always thought that policy was Mr. Pitt's business. Catherine. Lifting her eyebrows. So? Varinka. What else did you presume to admire Her Majesty for, pray? Ed Staston. Adult. Well, I, 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 that is, I, he stammers himself dumb. Catherine. After a pitiless silence. We are waiting for your answer. Ed Staston. But I never said I admired your majesty. The lady has twisted my words. Varinka. You don't admire her, then? Ed Staston. Well, I, naturally, of course, I can't deny that the uniform was very becoming, perhaps a little unfeminine, still. Dead silence. Catherine and the court watch him stonily. He is wretchedly embarrassed. Catherine. With cold majesty. Well, sir, is that all you have to say? Ed Staston. Surely there is no harm in noticing that er, that er, he stops again. Catherine. Noticing that er. He gazes at her, speechless, like a fascinated rabbit. She repeats fiercely. That er. Ed Staston. Startled into speech. Well, that your majesty was, was, soothingly. Well, let me put it this way, that it was rather natural for a man to admire your majesty without being a philosopher. Catherine. Suddenly smiling and extending her hand to him to be kissed. Courtier. Ed Staston. Kissing it. Not at all. Your Majesty is very good. I have been very awkward. But I did not intend it. I am rather stupid, I am afraid. Catherine. Stupid. By no means. Courage, Captain, we are pleased. He falls on his knee. She takes his cheeks in her hands, turns up his face, and adds, We are greatly pleased. She slaps his cheek coquettishly, he bows almost to his knee. The petit lever is over. She turns to go into the cabinet, and stumbles against the supine Pediomkin. ACH. Ed Staston springs to her assistance, seizing Pediomkin's heels and shifting him out of the Empress's path. We thank you, Captain. He bows gallantly and is rewarded by a very gracious smile. Then Catherine goes into her cabinet, followed by the Princess Dashkov, who turns at the door to make a deep courtesy to its Staston. Varinka. Happy little father. Remember, I did this for you. She runs out after the Empress. Ed Staston, somewhat dazed, crosses the room to the courtiers, and is received with marked deference. Each courtier making him a profound bow or curtsy before withdrawing through the central doors. He returns each obeisance with a nervous jerk, and turns away from it, only to find another courtier bowing at the other side. The process finally reduces him to distraction, as he bumps into one in the act of bowing to another and then has to bow his apologies. But at last they are all gone except Narishkin. Ed Staston. Auf. Patiomkin. Jumping up vigorously. You have done it, darling. Superbly. Beautifully. Ed Staston. Astonished. Do you mean to say you are not drunk? Patiomkin. Not dead drunk, darling. Only diplomatically drunk. As a drunken hog, 
I have done for you in five minutes what I could not have done in five months as a sober man. Your fortune is made. She likes you. Ed Staston. The devil she does. Patty Omkin. Why? Aren't you delighted? Ed Staston. Delighted. Gracious heavens, man, I am engaged to be married. Patty Omkin. What matter? She is in England, isn't she? Ed Staston. No. She has just arrived in St. Petersburg. The Princess Dashkov. Returning. Captain Ed Staston, the Empress is robed, and commands your presence. Ed Staston. Say I was gone before you arrived with the message. He hurries out. The other three, two taken aback to stop him, stare after him in the utmost astonishment. Narishkin. Turning from the door. She will have him knouted. He is a dead man. The Princess Dashkov. But what am I to do? I cannot take such an answer to the Empress. Pety Omkin. P -p 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 -w 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 a long puff, turning into a growl. He spits. I must kick somebody. Narishkin. Flying precipitately through the central doors. No, no. Please. The Princess Dashkov. Throwing herself recklessly in front of Pady Omkin as he starts in pursuit of the Chamberlain. Kick me. Disable me. It will be an excuse for not going back to her. Kick me hard. Pety Omkin. Yeah. He flings her on the bed and dashes after Narishkin. The third scene. In a terrace garden overlooking the Neva. Claire, a robust young English lady, is leaning on the river wall. She turns expectantly on hearing the garden gate opened and closed. Ed Staston hurries in. With a cry of delight she throws her arms round his neck. Claire. Darling. Ed Staston. Making a wry face. Don't call me darling. Claire. Amazed and chilled. Why? Ed Staston. I have been called darling all the morning. Claire. With a flash of jealousy. By whom? Ed Staston. By everybody. By the most unutterable swine. And if we do not leave this abominable city now, do you hear? Now, I shall be called darling by the Empress. Claire. With magnificent snobbery. She would not dare. Did you tell her you were engaged to me? Ed Staston. Of course not. Claire. Why? Ed Staston. Because I didn't particularly want to have you knouted, and to be hanged or sent to Siberia myself. Claire. What on earth do you mean? Ed Staston. Well, the long and short of it is, don't think me a coxcomb, Claire, it is too serious to mince matters, I have seen the Empress, and... Claire. Well, you wanted to see her. Ed Staston. Yes, but the Empress has seen me. Claire. She has fallen in love with you. Ed Staston. How did you know? Claire. Dearest, as if anyone could help it. Ed Staston. Oh, don't make me feel like a fool. But, though it does sound conceited to say it, I flatter myself I'm better looking than Pady Omkin and the other hogs she is accustomed to. Anyhow, I daren't risk staying. Claire. What a nuisance. Mama will be furious at having to pack, and at missing the court ball this evening. Ed Staston. I can't help that. We haven't a moment to lose. Claire. May I tell her she will be knouted if we stay? Ed Staston. Do, dearest. He kisses her and lets her go, expecting her to run into the house. Claire. Pausing thoughtfully. Is she, is she good looking when you see her close? Ed Staston. Not a patch on you, dearest. Claire. Jealous. 
Then you did see her close? Ed Staston. Fairly close. Claire. Indeed. How close? No, that's silly of me, I will tell Mama. She is going out when Narishkin enters with the sergeant and a squad of soldiers. What do you want here? The sergeant goes to Ed Staston, plumps down on his knees, and takes out a magnificent pair of pistols with gold grips. He proffers them to Ed Staston, holding them by the barrels. Narishkin. Captain Ed Staston, His Highness Prince Padiomkin sends you the pistols he promised you. The sergeant. Take them, little father, and do not forget us poor soldiers who have brought them to you, for God knows we get but little to drink. Ed Staston. Irresolutely. But I can't take these valuable things. By Jiminy, though, they're beautiful. Look at them, Claire. As he is taking the pistols the kneeling sergeant suddenly drops them. Flings himself forward, and embraces at Staston's hips to prevent him from drawing his own pistols from his boots. The sergeant. Lay hold of him there. Pin his arms. I have his pistols. The soldiers seize at Staston. At Staston. Ah, would you, damn you. He drives his knee into the sergeant's epigastrium, and struggles furiously with his captors. The sergeant. Rolling on the ground, gasping and groaning. Oh. Murder. Holy Nicholas. Aweff. Claire. Help. Help. They are killing Charles. Help. Narishkin. Seizing her and clapping his hand over her mouth. Tie him neck and crop. Ten thousand blows of the stick if you let him go. Claire twists herself loose, turns on him. And cuffs him furiously. Yow, ow. Have mercy, little mother. Claire. You wretch. Help. Help. Police. We are being murdered. Help. The sergeant, who has risen, comes to Narishkin's rescue, and grasps Claire's hands, enabling Narishkin to gag her again. By this time Ed Staston and his captors are all rolling on the ground together. They get Ed Staston on his back and fasten his wrists together behind his knees. Next they put a broad strap round his ribs. Finally they pass a pole through this breast strap and through the waist strap and lift him by it, helplessly trussed up, to carry him off. Meanwhile he is by no means suffering in silence. Ed Staston. Gasping. You shall hear more of this. Damn you, will you untie me? I will complain to the ambassador. I will write to the Gazette. England will blow your trumpery little fleet out of the water and sweep your tin-pot army into Siberia for this. Will you let me go? Damn you! Curse you! What the devil do you mean by it? I'll, 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 he is carried out of hearing. Narishkin. Snatching his hands from Claire's face with a scream, and shaking his finger frantically. Ack! The sergeant, amazed, lets go her hands. She has bitten me, the little vixen. Claire. Spitting and wiping her mouth disgustedly. How dare you put your dirty paws on my mouth. Ugh. Shah. The sergeant. Be merciful, little angel mother. Claire. Do not presume to call me your little angel mother. Where are the police? Narishkin. We are the police in ST. Petersburg, Little Spitfire. The Sergeant. God knows we have no orders to harm you, Little Mother. Our duty is done. You are well and strong, but I shall never be the same man again. He is a mighty and terrible fighter, as stout as a bear. He has broken my sweetbread with his strong knees. God knows poor folk should not be set upon such dangerous adversaries. Claire. Serve you right. Where have they taken Captain Edstaston to? Narishkin. Spitefully. To the Empress, little beauty. He has insulted the Empress. 
he will receive a hundred and one blows of the knout. He laughs and goes out, nursing his bitten finger. The sergeant. He will feel only the first twenty and he will be mercifully dead long before the end, little darling. Claire. Sustained by an invincible snobbery. They dare not touch an English officer. I will go to the Empress myself, she cannot know who Captain Itstaston is, who we are. The sergeant. Do so in the name of the holy Nicholas, little beauty. Claire. Don't be impertinent. How can I get admission to the palace? The sergeant. Everybody goes in and out of the palace, little love. Claire. But I must get into the Empress's presence. I must speak to her. The sergeant. You shall, dear little mother. You shall give the poor old sergeant a ruble, and the blessed Nicholas will make your salvation his charge. Claire. Impetuously. I will give you she is about to say fifty rubles, but checks herself cautiously, well, I don't mind giving you two rubles if I can speak to the empress. The sergeant. Joyfully. I praise heaven for you, little mother. Come. He leads the way out. It was the temptation of the devil that led your young man to bruise my vitals and deprive me of breath. We must be merciful to one another's faults. The fourth scene. A triangular recess communicating by a heavily curtained arch with the huge ballroom of the palace. The light is subdued by red shades on the candles. In the wall adjoining that pierced by the arch is a door. The only piece of furniture is a very handsome chair on the arch side. In the ballroom they are dancing a polonaise to the music of a brass band. Nerishkin enters through the door, followed by the soldiers carrying its Staston, still trussed to the pole. Exhausted and dogged, he makes no sound. Nerishkin. Halt. Get that pole clear of the prisoner. They dump its Staston on the floor and detach the pole. Nerishkin stoops over him and addresses him insultingly. Well. Are you ready to be tortured? This is the Empress's private torture chamber. Can I do anything to make you quite comfortable? You have only to mention it. Ed Staston. Have you any back teeth? Nerishkin. Surprised. Why? Ed Staston. His Majesty King George III will send for six of them when the news of this reaches London, so look out, damn your eyes. Nerishkin. Frightened. Oh, I assure you I am only obeying my orders. Personally I abhor torture, and would save you if I could. But the Empress is proud, and what woman would forgive the slight you put upon her? Ed Staston. As I said before, damn your eyes. Nerishkin. Almost in tears. Well, it isn't my fault. To the soldiers, insolently. You know your orders? You remember what you have to do when the Empress gives you the word? The soldiers salute in assent. Nerishkin passes through the curtains, admitting a blare of music and a strip of the brilliant white candlelight from the chandeliers in the ballroom as he does so. The white light vanishes and the music is muffled as the curtains fall together behind him. Presently the band stops abruptly, and Nerishkin comes back through the curtains. He makes a warning gesture to the soldiers, who stand at attention. Then he moves the curtain to allow Catherine to enter. She is in full imperial regalia, and stops sternly just where she has entered. The soldiers fall on their knees. Catherine. Obey your orders. The soldiers seize at Staston, and throw him roughly at the feet of the Empress. Catherine. Looking down coldly on him. Also the German word, you have put me to the trouble of sending for you twice. You had better have come the first time. Ed Staston. Ex sufflicate, and pettishly angry. I haven't come either time. I've been carried. I call it infernal impudence. Catherine. Take care what you say. Ed Staston. No use. I dare say you look very majestic and very handsome but I can't see you. And I am not intimidated. 
I am an Englishman, and you can kidnap me, but you can't bully me. Narishkin. Remember to whom you are speaking. Catherine. Violently, furious at his intrusion. Remember that dogs should be dumb. He shrivels. And do you, Captain, remember that famous as I am for my clemency, there are limits to the patience even of an empress. Ed Staston. How is a man to remember anything when he is trussed up in this ridiculous fashion? I can hardly breathe. He makes a futile struggle to free himself. Here, don't be unkind, your majesty, tell these fellows to unstrap me. You know you really owe me an apology. Catherine. You think you can escape by appealing, like Prince Pediomkin, to my sense of humor? Ed Staston. Sense of humor. Ho. Ha, ha. I like that. Would anybody with a sense of humor make a guy of a man like this, and then expect him to take it seriously? I say, do tell them to loosen these straps. Catherine. Seating herself. Why should I, pray? Ed Staston. Why? Why? Why, because they're hurting me. Catherine. People sometimes learn through suffering. Manners, for instance. Ed Staston. Oh, well, of course, if you're an ill-natured woman, hurting me on purpose, I have nothing more to say. Catherine. A monarch, sir, has sometimes to employ a necessary and salutary severity. Ed Staston. Interrupting her petulantly. Quack. 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 Catherine. Donner Wetter. Ed Staston. Continuing recklessly. This isn't severity, it's tomfoolery. And if you think it's reforming my character or teaching me anything, you're mistaken. It may be a satisfaction to you. But if it is, all I can say is that it's not an amiable satisfaction. Catherine. Turning suddenly and balefully on Narishkin. What are you grinning at? Narishkin. Falling on his knees in terror. Be merciful, little mother. My heart is in my mouth. Catherine. Your heart and your mouth will be in two separate parts of your body if you again forget in whose presence you stand. Go. And take your men with you. Narishkin crawls to the door. The soldiers rise. Stop. Roll that indicating it's Staston nearer. The soldiers obey. Not so close. Did I ask you for a footstool? She pushes it's Staston away with her foot. Ed Staston. With a sudden squeal. Ack. I must really ask your majesty not to put the point of your imperial toe between my ribs. I am ticklesome. Catherine. Indeed? All the more reason for you to treat me with respect, Captain. To the others. Be gone. How many times must I give an order before it is obeyed? Narishkin. Little mother, they have brought some instruments of torture. Will they be needed? Catherine. Indignantly. How dare you name such abominations to a liberal empress? You will always be a savage and a fool, Narishkin. These relics of barbarism are buried, thank God, in the grave of Peter the Great. My methods are more civilized. She extends her toe towards Ed Staston's ribs. Ed Staston. Shrieking hysterically. Yuck. Ah. Furiously. If your majesty does that again I will write to the London Gazette. Catherine. To the soldiers. Leave us. Quick. Do you hear? Five thousand blows of the stick for the soldier who is in the room when I speak next. The soldiers rush out. Narishkin, are you waiting to be knouted? Narishkin backs out hastily. Catherine and Edstaston are now alone. Catherine has in her hand a scepter or baton of gold. Wrapped round it is a new pamphlet, in French, entitled L'Homme Aux Quarante Ecus. 
She calmly unrolls this and begins to read it at her ease as if she were quite alone. Several seconds elapse in dead silence. She becomes more and more absorbed in the pamphlet, and more and more amused by it. Catherine. Greatly pleased by a passage, and turning over the leaf. Oscar Zenit. Ed Staston. Ahem. Silence. Catherine reads on. Catherine. We comish. Ed Staston. Ahem. Ahem. Silence. Catherine. Soliloquizing enthusiastically. What a wonderful author is Monsieur Voltaire. How lucidly he exposes the folly of this crazy plan for raising the entire revenue of the country from a single tax on land. How he withers it with his irony. How he makes you laugh whilst he is convincing you. How sure one feels that the proposal is killed by his wit and economic penetration, killed never to be mentioned again among educated people. Ed Staston. For heaven's sake, madam, do you intend to leave me tied up like this while you discuss the blasphemies of that abominable infidel? Ack. She has again applied her toe. Oh. Boo. Catherine. Calmly. Do I understand you to say that Monsieur Voltaire is a great philanthropist and a great philosopher as well as the wittiest man in Europe? Ed Staston. Certainly not. I say that his books ought to be burnt by the common hangman. Her toe touches his ribs. Yuck. Oh don't. I shall faint. I can't bear it. Catherine. Have you changed your opinion of Monsieur Voltaire? Ed Staston. But you can't expect me as a member of the Church of England she tickles him, ack. Ow. Oh Lord. He is anything you like. He is a philanthropist, a philosopher, a beauty, he ought to have a statue, damn him. She tickles him. No. Bless him. Save him victorious, happy and glorious. Oh, let eternal honors crown his name, Voltaire thrice worthy on the rolls of fame. Exhausted. Now will you let me up? And look here. I can see your ankles when you tickle me, it's not late alike. Catherine. Sticking out her toe and admiring it critically. Is the spectacle so disagreeable? Ed Staston. It's agreeable enough. Only with intense expression for heaven's sake don't touch me in the ribs. Catherine. Putting aside the pamphlet. Captain Ed Staston, why did you refuse to come when I sent for you? Ed Staston. Madam, I cannot talk tied up like this. Catherine. Do you still admire me as much as you did this morning? Ed Staston. How can I possibly tell when I can't see you? Let me get up and look. I can't see anything now except my toes and yours. Catherine. Do you still intend to write to the London Gazette about me? Ed Staston. Not if you will loosen these straps. Quick, loosen me. I'm fainting. Catherine. I don't think you are. Tickling him. Ed Staston. Ack. Cat. Catherine. What? She tickles him again. Ed Staston. With a shriek. No, angel, angel. Catherine. Tenderly. Jellietter. Ed Staston. I don't know a word of German, but that sounded kind. Becoming hysterical. Little mother, beautiful little darling angel mother, don't be cruel, untie me. Oh, I beg and implore you. Don't be unkind. I shall go mad. Catherine. You are expected to go mad with love when an empress deigns to interest herself in you. When an empress allows you to see her foot you should kiss it. Captain Ed Staston, you are a booby. Ed Staston. Indignantly. I am nothing of the kind. I have been mentioned in dispatches as a highly intelligent officer. And let me warn your majesty that I am not so helpless as you think. The English ambassador is in that ballroom. 
A shout from me will bring him to my side, and then where will your majesty be? Catherine. I should like to see the English ambassador or anyone else pass through that curtain against my orders. It might be a stone wall ten feet thick. Shout your loudest. Sob. Curse. Scream. Yell. She tickles him unmercifully. Ed Staston. Frantically. Ahoyo. Ack. Boo. Stop. Oh Lord. Yeah. A tumult in the ballroom responds to his cries. Voices from the ballroom. Stand back. You cannot pass. Hold her back there. The Empress's orders. It is out of the question. No, little darling, not in there. Nobody is allowed in there. You will be sent to Siberia. Don't let her through there, on your life. Drag her back. You will be knouted. It is hopeless, mademoiselle, you must obey orders. Guard there. Send some men to hold her. Claire's voice. Let me go. They are torturing Charles in there. I will go. How can you all dance as if nothing was happening? Let me go, I tell you. Let. Me. Go. She dashes through the curtain. No one dares follow her. Catherine. Rising in wrath. How dare you? Claire. Recklessly. Oh, dare your grandmother. Where is my Charles? What are they doing to him? Ed Staston. Shouting. Claire, loosen these straps, in heaven's name. Quick. Claire. Seeing him and throwing herself on her knees at his side. Oh, how dare they tie you up like that. To Catherine. You wicked wretch. You Russian savage. She pounces on the straps, and begins unbuckling them. Catherine. Conquering herself with a mighty effort. Now self-control. Self-control, Catherine. Philosophy. Europe is looking on. She forces herself to sit down. Ed Staston. Steady, dearest, it is the Empress. Call her your Imperial Majesty. Call her Star of the North, little mother, little darling, that's what she likes, but get the straps off. Claire. Keep quiet, dear, I cannot get them off if you move. Catherine. Calmly. Keep quite still, Captain. She tickles him. Ed Staston. Ow. Ack. Ahoyo. Claire. Stopping dead in the act of unbuckling the straps and turning sick with jealousy as she grasps the situation. Was that what I thought was your being tortured? Catherine. Urbanely. That is the favorite torture of Catherine II, Mademoiselle. I think the captain enjoys it very much. Claire. Then he can have as much more of it as he wants. I am sorry I intruded. She rises to go. Ed Staston. Catching her train in his teeth and holding on like a bulldog. Don't go. Don't leave me in this horrible state. Loosen me. This is what he is saying, but as he says it with the train in his mouth it is not very intelligible. Claire. Let go. You are undignified and ridiculous enough yourself without making me ridiculous. She snatches her train away. Ed Staston. Ow. You've nearly pulled my teeth out, you're worse than the Star of the North. To Catherine. Darling little mother, you have a kind heart, the kindest in Europe. Have pity. Have mercy. I love you. Claire bursts into tears. Release me. Catherine. Well, just to show you how much kinder a Russian savage can be than an English one, though I am sorry to say I am a German, here goes. She stoops to loosen the straps. Claire. Jealously. You needn't trouble, thank you. She pounces on the straps, and the two set it stastin free between them. Now get up, 
please. And conduct yourself with some dignity if you are not utterly demoralized. Ed Staston. Dignity. Ow. I can't. I'm stiff all over. I shall never be able to stand up again. Oh Lord. How it hurts. They seize him by the shoulders and drag him up. Yah. Ack. Wow. Oh. M. Oh, little angel mother, don't ever do this to a man again. Knout him, kill him, roast him, baste him. Head, hang, and quarter him, but don't tie him up like that and tickle him. Catherine. Your young lady still seems to think that you enjoyed it. Claire. I know what I think. I will never speak to him again. Your majesty can keep him, as far as I am concerned. Catherine. I would not deprive you of him for worlds, though really I think he's rather a darling. She pats his cheek. Claire. Snorting. So I see, indeed. Ed Staston. Don't be angry, dearest, in this country everybody's a darling. I'll prove it to you. To Catherine. Will your majesty be good enough to call Prince Patiomkin? Catherine. Surprised into haughtiness. Why? Ed Staston. To oblige me. Catherine laughs good-humouredly and goes to the curtains and opens them. The band strikes up a retowa. Catherine. Calling imperiously. Patiomkin. The music stops suddenly. Here. To me. Go on with your music there, you fools. The retowa is resumed. The sergeant rushes from the ballroom to relieve the empress of the curtain. Patiomkin comes in dancing with Varinka. Catherine. To Patiomkin. The English captain wants you, little darling. Catherine resumes her seat as Patiomkin intimates by a grotesque bow that he is at its Staston's service. Varinka passes behind its Staston and Claire, and posts herself on Claire's right. Ed Staston. Precisely. To Claire. You observe, my love, little darling. Well, if Her Majesty calls him a darling, is it my fault that she calls me one too? Claire. I don't care, I don't think you ought to have done it. I am very angry and offended. Ed Staston. They tied me up, dear. I couldn't help it. I fought for all I was worth. The sergeant. At the curtains. He fought with the strength of lions and bears. God knows I shall carry a broken sweetbread to my grave. Ed Staston. You can't mean to throw me over, Claire. Urgently. Claire. Claire. Varinka. In a transport of sympathetic emotion, pleading with clasped hands to Claire. Oh, sweet little angel lamb, he loves you, it shines in his darling eyes. Pardon him, pardon him. Patiomkin. Rushing from the Empress's side to Claire and falling on his knees to her. Pardon him, pardon him, little cherub. Little wild duck. Little star. Little glory. Little jewel in the crown of heaven. Claire. This is perfectly ridiculous. Varinka. Kneeling to her. Pardon him, pardon him, little delight, little sleeper in a rosy cradle. Claire. I'll do anything if you'll only let me alone. The sergeant. Kneeling to her. Pardon him, pardon him, lest the mighty man bring his whip to you. God knows we all need pardon. Claire. At the top of her voice. I pardon him. I pardon him. Patiomkin. Springing up joyfully and going behind Claire, whom he raises in his arms. Embrace her, Victor of Bunker's Hill. Kiss her till she swoons. The sergeant. Receive her in the name of the Holy Nicholas. Varinka. She begs you for a thousand dear little kisses all over her body. Claire. Vehemently. I do not. Patiomkin throws her into its Staston's arms. 
Oh. The pair, awkward and shamefaced, recoil from one another, and remain utterly inexpressive. Catherine. Pushing its Daston towards Claire. There is no help for it, Captain. This is Russia, not England. Ed Staston. Plucking up some geniality, and kissing Claire ceremoniously on the brow. I have no objection. Varinka. Disgusted. Only one kiss. And on the forehead. Fish. See how I kiss, though it is only my horribly ugly old uncle. She throws her arms round Padyomkin's neck and covers his face with kisses. The sergeant. Move to tears. Sainted Nicholas, bless your lambs. Catherine. Do you wonder now that I love Russia as I love no other place on earth? Narishkin. Appearing at the door. Majesty, the model for the new museum has arrived. Catherine. Rising eagerly and making for the curtains. Let us go. I can think of nothing but my museum. In the archway she stops and turns to its Staston, who has hurried to lift the curtain for her. Captain, I wish you every happiness that your little angel can bring you. For his ear alone. I could have brought you more, but you did not think so. Farewell. Ed Staston. Kissing her hand, which, instead of releasing, he holds caressingly and rather patronizingly in his own. I feel your majesty's kindness so much that I really cannot leave you without a word of plain wholesome English advice. Exclaiming simultaneously. Catherine. Snatching her hand away and bounding forward as if he had touched her with a spur advice. Patyomkin. Madman, take care. Narishkin. Advise the Empress. The Sergeant. Sainted Nicholas. Varinka. Hoo hoo. A stifled splutter of laughter. Ed Staston. Following the Empress and resuming kindly but judicially. After all, though Your Majesty is of course a great queen, yet when all is said, I am a man, and Your Majesty is only a woman. Catherine. Only a wa, she chokes. Ed Staston. Continuing. Believe me, this Russian extravagance will not do. I appreciate as much as any man the warmth of heart that prompts it. But it is overdone, it is hardly in the best taste, it is, really I must say it, it is not proper. Catherine. Ironically, in German. So. Ed Staston. Not that I cannot make allowances. Your Majesty has, I know, been unfortunate in your experience as a married woman. Catherine. Furious. A la wetter. Ed Staston. Sentimentally. Don't say that. Don't think of him in that way. After all, he was your husband, and whatever his faults may have been, it is not for you to think unkindly of him. Catherine. Almost bursting. I shall forget myself. Ed Staston. Come. I am sure he really loved you and you truly loved him. Catherine. Controlling herself with a supreme effort. No, Catherine. What would Voltaire say? Ed Staston. Oh, never mind that vile scoffer. Set an example to Europe, madam, by doing what I am going to do. Marry again. Marry some good man who will be a strength and a support to your old age. Catherine. My old, she again becomes speechless. Ed Staston. Yes, we must all grow old, even the handsomest of us. Catherine. Sinking into her chair with a gasp. Thank you. Ed Staston. You will thank me more when you see your little ones round your knee, and your man there by the fireside in the winter evenings, by the way. I forgot that you have no fireside here in spite of the coldness of the climate. So shall I say by the stove? Catherine. Certainly, if you wish. The stove by all means. Ed Staston. Impulsively. Ah, madam, abolish the stove, 
believe me, there is nothing like the good old open grate. Home. Duty. Happiness. They all mean the same thing, and they all flourish best on the drawing room hearth rug. Turning to Claire. And now, my love, we must not detain the queen, she is anxious to inspect the model of her museum, to which I am sure we wish every success. Claire. Coldly. I am not detaining her. Ed Staston. Well, goodbye ringing Patty Omkin's hand guo owed by, Prince, come and see us if ever you visit England. Spireview, Deep Dean, Little Mugford, Devon, will always find me. To Varinka, kissing her hand. Goodbye, Mademoiselle, goodbye, Little Mother, if I may call you that just once. Varinka puts up her face to be kissed. Eh. No, 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 you don't mean that, you know. Naughty. To the sergeant. Goodbye, my friend. You will drink our healths with this. Tipping him. The sergeant. The blessed Nicholas will multiply your fruits, little father. Ed Staston. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. He goes out backwards, bowing, with Claire curtsying, having been listened to in utter dumbfoundedness by Patyomkin and Nerishkin, in childlike awe by Varinka, and with quite inexpressible feelings by Catherine. When he is out of sight she rises with clenched fists and raises her arms and her closed eyes to heaven. Patyomkin, rousing himself from his stupor of amazement, springs to her like a tiger, and throws himself at her feet. Patyomkin. What shall I do to him for you? Skin him alive? Cut off his eyelids and stand him in the sun? Tear his tongue out? What shall it be? Catherine. Opening her eyes. Nothing. But oh, if I could only have had him for my, for my, for my. Patyomkin. In a growl of jealousy. For your lover? Catherine. With an ineffable smile. No, for my museum. The music cure. A piece of utter nonsense. This is not a serious play, it is what is called a variety turn for two musicians. It is written for two pianists, but can be adapted to any instruments on which the performers happen to be proficient. At its first performance by Miss Madge Mackintosh and Mr. William Armstrong the difficulty arose that, though Mr. Armstrong was an accomplished pianist, Miss Mackintosh's virtuosity was confined to the English concertina. That did just as well. As a last desperate resort a pianola behind the scenes can be employed, but the result will lack spontaneity. There is, however, no pressing reason why the thing should be performed at all. Dramatis Personi Lord Reginald Fitzambry The Doctor Striga Thundridge The Music Cure Lord Reginald Fitzambry, a fashionably dressed, rather pretty young man of twenty-two, is prostrate on a sofa in a large hotel drawing room, crying convulsively. His doctor is trying to soothe him. The doctor is about a dozen years his senior. And his ways are the ways of a still youthful man who considers himself in smart society as well as professionally attendant on it. The drawing room has tall central doors, at present locked. If anyone could enter under these circumstances, he would find on his left a grand piano with the keyboard end towards him, and a smaller door beyond the piano. On his right would be the window, and, further on, the sofa on which the unhappy youth is wallowing, with, close by it, the doctor's chair and a little table accommodating the doctor's hat, a plate, a medicine bottle, a half-emptied glass, and a bell call. The doctor. Come come. Be a man. Now really this is silly. You mustn't give way like this. I tell you nothing's happened to you. Hang it all. It's not the end of the world if you did buy a few shares. Reginald. Interrupting him frantically. I never meant any harm in buying those shares. I am ready to give them up. Oh, I never meant any harm in buying those shares. I never meant any harm in buying those shares. 
clutching the doctor imploringly. Won't you believe me, doctor? I never meant any harm in buying those shares. I never. The doctor. Extricating himself and replacing Reginald on the couch, not very gently. Of course you didn't. I know you didn't. Reginald. I never. The doctor. Desperate. Don't go on saying that over and over again or you will drive us all as distracted as you are yourself. This is nothing but nerves. Remember that you're in a hotel. They'll put you out if you make a row. Reginald. Tearfully. But you don't understand. Oh, why won't anybody understand? I never. The doctor. Shouting him down. You never meant any harm in buying those shares. This is the four hundredth time you've said it. Reginald. Wildly. Then why do you keep asking me the same questions over and over again? It's not fair. I've told you I never meant any harm in. The doctor. Yes, 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 I know, I know. You think you made a fool of yourself before that committee. Well, you didn't. You stood up to it for six days with the coolness of an iceberg and the cheerfulness of an idiot. Every member of it had a go at you. And every one of them, including some of the cleverest cross-examiners in London, fell back baffled before your fatuous self-satisfaction. Your impenetrable inability to see any reason why you shouldn't have bought those shares. Reginald. But why shouldn't I have bought them? I made no secret of it. When the Prime Minister ragged me about it I offered to sell him the shares for what I gave for them. The doctor. Yes, after they had fallen six points. But never mind that. The point for you is that you are an undersecretary in the war office. You knew that the army was going to be put on vegetarian diet, and that the British Macaroni Trust shares would go up with a rush when this became public. And what did you do? Reginald. I did what any fellow would have done. I bought all the shares I could afford. The doctor. You bought a great many more than you could afford. Reginald. But why shouldn't I? Explain it to me. I'm anxious to learn. I meant no harm. I see no harm. Why am I to be badgered because the beastly opposition papers and all the opposition rotters on that committee try to make party capital out of it by saying that it was disgraceful? It wasn't disgraceful, it was simple common sense. I'm not a financier, but you can't persuade me that if you happen to know that certain shares are going to rise you shouldn't buy them. It would be flying in the face of providence not to. And they wouldn't see that. They pretended not to see it. They worried me, and kept asking me the same thing over and over again. And wrote blaggardly articles about me. The doctor. And you got the better of them all because you couldn't see their point of view. But what beats me is why you broke down afterwards. Reginald. Everyone was against me. I thought the committee a pack of fools, and I as good as told them so. But everyone took their part. The governor said I had disgraced the family name. My brother said I ought to resign from my clubs. My mother said that all her hopes of marrying me to a rich woman were shattered. And I'd done nothing, absolutely nothing to what other chaps are doing every day. The doctor. Well, the long and short of it is that officials mustn't gamble. Reginald. But I wasn't gambling. I knew. It isn't gambling if you know that the shares will go up. It's a cert. The doctor. Well, all I can tell you is that if you weren't a son of the Duke of Dunmo, you'd have to resign, Anne. Reginald. Breaking down. Oh, stop talking to me about if. Let me alone. I can't bear it. I never meant any harm in buying those shares. I never meant any harm. The doctor. SHSHSHSHSHSH. There, I shouldn't have started the subject again. Take some of this valerian. He puts the glass to Reginald's lips. That's right. Now you're better. Reginald. 
exhausted but calm. Why does Valerian soothe me when it excites cats? There's a question to reflect on. You know, they ought to have made me a philosopher. The doctor. Philosophers are born, not made. Reginald. Fine old chestnut, that. Everybody's born, not made. The doctor. You're getting almost clever. I don't like it, you're not yourself today. I wish I could take your mind off your troubles. Suppose you try a little music. Reginald. I can't play. My fingers won't obey me. And I can't stand the sound of the piano. I sounded a note this morning, and it made me scream. The doctor. But why not get somebody to play to you? Reginald. Whom could I get, even if I could bear it? You can't play. The doctor. Well, I'm not the only person in the world. Reginald. If you bring anyone else in here, I shall go mad. I'll throw myself out of the window. I can't bear the idea of music. I dread it, hate it, loathe it. The doctor. That's very serious, you know. Reginald. Why is it serious? The doctor. Well, what would become of you without your turn for music? You have absolutely no capacity in any other direction. Reginald. I'm in Parliament. And I'm an undersecretary. The doctor. That's because your father is a duke. If you were in a republic you wouldn't be trusted to clean boots, unless your father was a millionaire. No, Reginald, the day you give up vamping accompaniments and playing the latest ragtimes by ear, you're a lost man socially. Reginald. Deprecating. Oh, I say. The doctor. Rising. However, perhaps it's too soon for you to try the music cure yet. It was your mother's idea, but I'll call and tell her to wait a day or two. I think she meant to send somebody to play. I must be off now. Look in again later. Meanwhile, sleep as much as you can. Or you might read a little. Reginald. What can I read? The doctor. Try the Strand magazine. Reginald. But it's so frightfully intellectual. It would overtax my brain. The doctor. Oh, well, I suppose it would. Well, sleep. Perhaps I'd better give you something to send you off. He produces a medicine case. Reginald. What's this? Veronal? The doctor. Don't be alarmed. Only the old-fashioned remedy, opium. Take this Reginald takes a pill, that will do the trick, I expect. If you find after half an hour that it has only excited you, take another. I'll leave one for you. He puts one on the plate, and pockets his medicine case. Reginald. Better leave me a lot. I like pills. The doctor. Thank you, I'm not treating you with a view to a coroner's inquest. You know, don't you, that opium is a poison? Reginald. Yes, opium. But not pills. The doctor. Well, heaven forbid that I, a doctor, should shake anybody's faith in pills. But I shan't leave you enough to kill you. He puts on his hat. Reginald. You'll tell them, won't you, not to let anyone in. Really and truly I shall throw myself out of the window if any stranger comes in. I should go out of my mind. The doctor. None of us have very far to go to do that, my young friend. Ta-ta, for the moment. He makes for the central doors. Reginald. You can't go out that way. I made my mother lock it and take away the key. I felt sure they'd let somebody in that way if she didn't. You'll have to go the way you came. The doctor. Returning. Right. Now let me see you settle down before I go. I want you to be asleep before I leave the room. Reginald settles himself to sleep with his face to the back of the sofa. The doctor goes softly to the side door and goes out. Reginald. 
sitting up wildly and staring affrightedly at the piano. Doctor. Doctor. Help. The doctor. Returning hastily. What is it? Reginald. After another doubtful look at the piano. Nothing. He composes himself to sleep again. The doctor. Nothing. There must have been something or you wouldn't have yelled like that. Pulling Reginald over so as to see his face. Here. What was it? Reginald. Well, it's gone. The doctor. What's gone? Reginald. The crocodile. The doctor. The crocodile. Reginald. Yes. It laughed at me, and was going to play the piano with its tail. The doctor. Opium in small doses doesn't agree with you, my young friend. Taking the spare pill from the plate. I shall have to give you a second pill. Reginald. But suppose two crocodiles come. The doctor. They won't. If anything comes it will be something pretty this time. That's how opium acts. Anyhow, you'll be fast asleep in ten minutes. Here. Take it. Reginald. After taking the pill. It was awfully silly of me. But you know I really saw the thing. The doctor. You needn't trouble about what you see with your eyes shut. He turns to the door. Reginald. Would you mind looking under the sofa to make sure the crocodile isn't there? The doctor. Why not look yourself? That would be more convincing. Reginald. I daren't. The doctor. You duffer. He looks. All serene. No crocodile. Now go bye-bye. He goes out. Reginald again composes himself to sleep. Somebody unlocks the central doors. A lovely lady enters with a bouquet in her hand, she looks about her, takes a letter from wherever she carries letters. And starts on a voyage of discovery round the room, checking her observations by the contents of the letter. The piano seems specially satisfactory, she nods as she sees it. Reginald seems also to be quite expected. She does not speak to him. When she is quite satisfied that she is in the right room, she goes to the piano and tantalizes the expectant audience for about two minutes by putting down her flowers on the candle stand. Taking off her gloves and putting them with the flowers, taking off half a dozen diamond rings in the same way. Sitting down to the keyboard and finding it too near to the piano, then too far, then too high, then too low, in short. Exhausting all the tricks of the professional pianist before she at last strikes the keys and preludes brilliantly. At the sound, Reginald, with a scream, rolls from the sofa and writhes on the carpet in horrible contortions. She stops playing, amazed. Reginald. Oh. 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 The crocodiles. Stop. Ow. Oh. He looks at the piano and sees the lady. Oh I say. The lady. What on earth do you mean by making that noise when I'm playing? Have you no sense? Have you no manners? Reginald. Sitting on the floor. I'm awfully sorry. The lady. Sorry. Why did you do it? Reginald. I thought you were a crocodile. The lady. What a silly thing to say. Do I look like a crocodile? Reginald. No. The lady. Do I play like a crocodile? Reginald. Cautiously rising and approaching her. Well, you know, it's so hard to know how a crocodile would play. The lady. Stuff. She resumes her playing. Reginald. Please. He stops her by shutting the keyboard lid. Who let you in? The lady. Rising threateningly. What is that to you, pray? Reginald. Retreating timidly. It's my room, you know. The lady. It's nothing of the sort. 
it's the Duchess of Dunmo's room. I know it's the right one, because she gave me the key, and it was the right key. Reginald. But what did she do that for? Who are you, if you don't mind my asking? The lady. I do mind your asking. It's no business of yours. However, you'd better know to whom you are speaking. I am Striga Thundridge. She pronounces it Strega. Reginald. What? The female Paderewski. Striga. Pardon me. I believe Mr. Paderewski has been called the male Thundridge, but no gentleman would dream of repeating such offensive vulgarities. Will you be good enough to return to your sofa, and hold your tongue, or else leave the room? Reginald. But, you know, I am ill. Striga. Then go to bed, and send for a doctor. She sits down again to the keyboard. Reginald. Falling on his knees. You mustn't play. You really mustn't. I can't stand it. I shall simply not be myself if you start playing. Striga. Raising the lid. Then I shall start at once. Reginald. Running to her on his knees and snatching at her hands. No, you shan't. She rises indignantly. He holds on to her hands, but exclaims ecstatically, Oh, I say, what lovely hands you've got. Striga. The idea. She hurls him to the carpet. Reginald. On the floor staring at her. You are strong. Striga. My strength has been developed by playing left-hand octave passages, like this. She begins playing Liszt's transcription of Schubert's Erlkenig. Reginald. Puts his fingers in his ears, but continues to stare at her. Striga. Stopping. I really cannot play if you keep your ears stopped. It is an insult. Leave the room. Reginald. But I tell you it's my room. Striga. Rising. Leave the room, or I will ring your bell and have you put out. She goes to the little table, and poises her fingers over the bell call. Reginald. Rushing to her. No no, somebody will come if you ring, and I shall go distracted if a stranger comes in. With a touch of her left hand she sends him reeling. He appeals to her plaintively. Don't you see that I am ill? Striga. I see that you are mentally afflicted. But that doesn't matter to me. The Duchess of Dunmo has engaged me to come to this room and play for two hours. I never break an engagement, especially a 250-guinea one. She turns towards the piano. Reginald. But didn't she tell you anything about me? Striga. Turning back to him. She said there would be a foolish young man in the room, but that I was not to mind him. She assured me you were not dangerous except to yourself. Collaring him and holding him bent backwards over the piano. But I will have no nonsense about not listening. All the world listens when I play. Listen, or go. Reginald. Helpless. But I shall have to sit on the stairs. I daren't go into any of the rooms. I should meet people there. Striga. You will meet plenty of people on the stairs, young man. They are sitting six on each stair, not counting those who are sitting astride the banisters on the chance of hearing me play. Reginald. How dreadful. Tearfully. You've no right to bully me like this. I'm ill, I can't bear it. I'll throw myself out of the window. Striga. Releasing him. Do. What an advertisement. It will be really kind of you. She goes back to the keyboard and sits down to play. Reginald. Crossing to the window. You'll be sorry you were so unfeeling when you see my mangled body. He opens the window, looks out, shuts it hastily, and retreats with a scream. There's a crowd. I daren't. Striga. Pleased. Waiting to hear me play. She preludes softly. Reginald. Ravished. 
Oh. I can stand that, you know. Striga. Ironically, still preluding. Thank you. Reginald. The fact is, I can play a bit myself. Striga. Still preluding. An amateur, I presume. Reginald. I have often been told I could make a living at it if I tried. But of course it wouldn't do for a man in my position to lower himself by becoming a professional. Striga. Abruptly ceasing to play. Tactful, that, I don't think. And what do you play, may I ask? Reginald. Oh, all the very best music. Striga. For instance? Reginald. I wish you belonged to me. Striga. Rising outraged. You young blackguard. How dare you? Reginald. You don't understand, it's the name of a tune. Let me play it for you. He sits down at the keyboard. I don't think you believe I can play. Striga. Pardon me. I have heard a horse play the harmonium at a music hall. I can believe anything. Reginald. Aha. He plays. Do you like that? Striga. What is it? Is it intended for music? Reginald. Oh, you beautiful doll. Striga. Take that. She knocks him sprawling over the keyboard. Beautiful doll indeed. Reginald. Oh, I say. Look here, that's the name of the tune too. You seem quite ignorant of the best music. Don't you know, Rum Tum Tittle, and Alexander's Ragtime Band, and Take Me Back to the Garden of Love, and Everybody Likes Our Mary. Striga. Young man, I have never even heard of these abominations. I am now going to educate you musically. I am going to play Chopin, and Brahms, and Bach, and Schumann, and... Reginald. Horrified. You don't mean classical music? Striga. I do. He bolts through the central doors. Striga. Disgusted. Pig. She sits down at the piano again. Reginald. Rushing back into the room. I forgot the people on the stairs, crowds of them. Oh, what shall I do? Oh don't, don't, don't play classical music to me. Say you won't. Please. Striga. Looks at him enigmatically and softly plays a Liebslieder waltz. Reginald. Oh, I say, that's rather pretty. Striga. Like it? Reginald. Awfully. Oh, I say, you know, I really do wish you belonged to me. Striga suddenly plays a violent Chopin study. He goes into convulsions. Oh. Stop. Mercy. Help. Oh please, please. Striga. Pausing with her hands raised over the keyboard, ready to pounce on the chords. Will you ever say that again? Reginald. Never. I beg your pardon. Striga. Satisfied. Echem. She drops her hands in her lap. Reginald. Wiping his brow. Oh, that was fearfully classical. Striga. You want your back stiffened a little, my young friend. Besides, I really cannot earn 250 guineas by playing soothing syrup to you. Now prepare for the worst. I'm going to make a man of you. Reginald. How? Striga. With Chopin's Polonaise in a flat. Now. Imagine yourself going into battle. He runs away as before. Goose. Reginald. Returning as before. The crowd is worse than ever. Have you no pity? Striga. Come here. Don't imagine yourself going into battle. Imagine that you have just been in a battle. And that you have saved your country by deeds of splendid bravery and that you are going to dance with beautiful women who are proud of you. 
Can you imagine that? Reginald. Ravier. That's how I always do imagine myself. Striga. Right. Now listen. She plays the first section of the Polonaise. Reginald flinches at first, but gradually braces himself, stiffens, struts. Throws up his head and slaps his chest. That's better. What a hero. After a difficult passage. Takes a bit of doing, that, dearest child. Coming to the chords which announce the middle section. Now for it. Reginald. Unable to contain himself. Oh, this is too glorious. I must have a turn or I shall forget myself. Striga. Can you play this? Nothing but this. She plays the octave passage in the bass. Reginald. Just riddle tittle, riddle tittle, riddle tittle, riddle tittle. Nothing but that? Striga. Very softly at first. Like the ticking of a watch. Then louder and louder, as you feel my soul swelling. Reginald. I understand. Just give me those chords again to buck me up to it. She plays the chords again. He plays the octave passages, and they play the middle section as a duet. At the repeat he cries, again. Again. Striga. It's meant to be played again. Now. They repeat it. At the end of the section she pushes him off the bench onto the floor, and goes on with the Polonaise alone. Reginald. Wonderful woman, I have a confession to make, a confidence to impart. Your playing draws it from me. Listen, Striga she plays a horrible discord I mean Miss Thundridge. Striga. That's better, but I prefer wonderful woman. Reginald. You are a wonderful woman, you know. Adored one, would you mind my taking a little valerian? I'm so excited. He takes some. Uh, uh, ah. Uh. Now I feel that I can speak. Listen to me, goddess. I am not happy. I hate my present existence. I loathe parliament. I am not fit for public affairs. I am condemned to live at home with five coarse and brutal sisters who care for nothing but alpine climbing, and looping the loop on aeroplanes, and going on deputations, and fighting the police. Do you know what they call me? Striga. Playing softly. What do they call you, dear? Reginald. They call me a clinger. Well, I confess it. I am a clinger. I am not fit to be thrown unprotected upon the world. I want to be shielded. I want a strong arm to lean on, a dauntless heart to be gathered to and cherished, a breadwinner on whose income one can live without the sordid horrors of having to make money for myself. I am a poor little thing, I know, Striga, but I could make a home for you. I have great taste in carpets and pictures. I can cook like anything. I can play quite nicely after dinner. Though you mightn't think it, I can be quite stern and strong-minded with servants. I get on splendidly with children, they never talk over my head as grown-up people do. I have a real genius for home life. And I shouldn't at all mind being tyrannized over a little, in fact, I like it. It saves me the trouble of having to think what to do. Oh, Striga, don't you want a dear little domesticated husband who would have no concern but to please you, no thought outside our home, who would be unspotted and unsoiled by the rude cold world? Who would never meddle in politics or annoy you by interfering with your profession? Is there any hope for me? Striga. Coming away from the piano. My child, I am a hard, strong, independent, muscular woman. How can you, with your delicate soft nature, see anything to love in me? I should hurt you, shock you, perhaps, yes, let me confess it, I have a violent temper, and might even, in a transport of rage, beat you. Reginald. Oh do, do. Don't laugh at this ridiculous confession, but ever since I was a child I have had only one secret longing, and that was to be mercilessly beaten by a splendid, strong, beautiful woman. 
Striga. Solemnly. Reginald, I think your mother spoke of you as Reginald? Reginald. Ray. Striga. I too have a confession to make. I too need some music to speak through. Will you be so good? Reginald. Angel. He rushes to the piano and plays sympathetically whilst she speaks. Striga. I, too, have had my dream. It has consoled me through the weary hours when I practiced scales for eight hours a day. It has pursued me through the applause of admiring thousands in Europe and America. It is a dream of a timid little heart fluttering against mine, of a gentle voice to welcome me home. Of a silky mustache to kiss my weary fingers when I return from a titanic struggle with Tchaikovsky's concerto in G major, of somebody utterly dependent on me, utterly devoted to me, utterly my own. Living only to be cherished and worshipped by me. Reginald. But you would be angry sometimes, terrible, splendid, ruthless, violent. You would throw down the thing you loved and trample on it as it clung to your feet. Striga. Yes, oh, why do you force me to confess it, I should beat it to a jelly, and then cast myself in transports of remorse on its quivering frame and smother it with passionate kisses. Reginald. Transported. Let it be me, let it be me. Striga. You dare face this terrible destiny? Reginald. I embrace it. I adore you. I am wholly yours. Oh, let me cling, cling, cling. Striga. Embracing him fiercely. Nothing shall tear you from my arms now. Reginald. Nothing. I am provided for. Oh, how happy this will make my mother. Striga. Sweet, name the day. He plays a wedding march. She plays the bass. The Inca of Peru Salem. An almost historical comedietta. Preface. I must remind the reader that this playlet was written when its principal character. Far from being a fallen foe and virtually a prisoner in our victorious hands, was still the Caesar whose legions we were resisting with our hearts in our mouths. Many were so horribly afraid of him that they could not forgive me for not being afraid of him, I seemed to be trifling heartlessly with a deadly peril. I knew better. And I have represented Caesar as knowing better himself. But it was one of the quaintnesses of popular feeling during the war that anyone who breathed the slightest doubt of the absolute perfection of German organization, the Machiavellian depth of German diplomacy, the omniscience of German science, the equipment of every German with a complete philosophy of history, and the consequent hopelessness of overcoming so magnificently accomplished an enemy except by the sacrifice of every recreative activity to incessant and vehement war work including a heartbreaking mass of fussing and cadging and bluffing that did nothing but waste our energies and tire our resolution, was called a pro-German. Now that this is all over, and the upshot of the fighting has shown that we could quite well have afforded to laugh at the doomed Inca, I am in another difficulty. I may be supposed to be hitting Caesar when he is down. That is why I preface the play with this reminder that when it was written he was not down. To make quite sure, I have gone through the proof sheets very carefully, and deleted everything that could possibly be mistaken for a foul blow. I have of course maintained the ancient privilege of comedy to chasten Caesar's foibles by laughing at them. Whilst introducing enough obvious and outrageous fiction to relieve both myself and my model from the obligations and responsibilities of sober history and biography. But I should certainly put the play in the fire instead of publishing it if it contained a word against our defeated enemy that I would not have written in 1913. Dramatis Personi. The Archdeacon. Ermintrude. The Princess. The Hotel Manager. A Waiter. The Inca of Peru Salem. Prologue. The Tableau Curtains Are Closed. An English archdeacon comes through them in a condition of extreme irritation. He speaks through the curtains to someone behind them. The archdeacon. Once for all, Ermintrude, I cannot afford to maintain you in your present extravagance. 
He goes to a flight of steps leading to the stalls and sits down disconsolately on the top step. A fashionably dressed lady comes through the curtains and contemplates him with patient obstinacy. He continues, grumbling. An English clergyman's daughter should be able to live quite respectably and comfortably on an allowance of £150 a year, wrung with great difficulty from the domestic budget. Ermintrude. You are not a common clergyman, you are an archdeacon. The archdeacon. Angrily. That does not affect my emoluments to the extent of enabling me to support a daughter whose extravagance would disgrace a royal personage. Scrambling to his feet and scolding at her. What do you mean by it, miss? Ermintrude. Oh really, father. Miss. Is that the way to talk to a widow? The archdeacon. Is that the way to talk to a father? Your marriage was a most disastrous imprudence. It gave you habits that are absolutely beyond your means, I mean beyond my means, you have no means. Why did you not marry Matthews, the best curate I ever had? Ermintrude. I wanted to, and you wouldn't let me. You insisted on my marrying Rosenhunker's Pipstein. The Archdeacon. I had to do the best for you, my child. Rosenhunker's Pipstein was a millionaire. Ermintrude. How did you know he was a millionaire? The Archdeacon. He came from America. Of course he was a millionaire. Besides, he proved to my solicitors that he had fifteen million dollars when you married him. Ermintrude. His solicitors proved to me that he had sixteen millions when he died. He was a millionaire to the last. The Archdeacon. Oh mammon, mammon. I am punished now for bowing the knee to him. Is there nothing left of your settlement? Fifty thousand dollars a year it secured to you, as we all thought. Only half the securities could be called speculative. The other half were gilt-edged. What has become of it all? Ermintrude. The speculative ones were not paid up. And the gilt-edged ones just paid the calls on them until the whole show burst up. The Archdeacon. Ermintrude, what expressions? Ermintrude. Oh bother! If you had lost ten thousand a year what expressions would you use, do you think? The long and the short of it is that I can't live in the squalid way you are accustomed to. The Archdeacon. Squalid. Ermintrude. I have formed habits of comfort. The Archdeacon. Comfort. Ermintrude. Well, elegance if you like. Luxury, if you insist. Call it what you please. A house that costs less than a hundred thousand dollars a year to run is intolerable to me. The Archdeacon. Then, my dear, you had better become lady's maid to a princess until you can find another millionaire to marry you. Ermintrude. That's an idea. I will. She vanishes through the curtains. The Archdeacon. What? Come back. Come back this instant. The lights are lowered. Oh, very well, I have nothing more to say. He descends the steps into the auditorium and makes for the door, grumbling all the time. Insane, senseless extravagance. Barking. Worthlessness. Muttering. I will not bear it any longer. Dresses, hats, furs, gloves, motor rides, one bill after another money going like water. No restraint, no self-control, no decency. Shrieking. I say, no decency. Muttering again. Nice state of things we are coming to. A pretty world. But I simply will not bear it. She can do as she likes. I wash my hands of her, I am not going to die in the workhouse for any good-for-nothing, undutiful, spendthrift daughter and the sooner that is understood by everybody the better for all par, he is by this time out of hearing in the corridor. The play. A hotel sitting room. A table in the center. On it a telephone. Two chairs at it, opposite one another. Behind it, the door. 
the fireplace has a mirror in the mantelpiece. A spinster princess, hatted and gloved, is ushered in by the hotel manager, spruce and artifically bland by professional habit. But treating his customer with a condescending affability which sails very close to the east wind of insolence. The manager. I am sorry I am unable to accommodate your highness on the first floor. The princess. Very shy and nervous. Oh, please don't mention it. This is quite nice. Very nice. Thank you very much. The manager. We could prepare a room in the annex. The princess. Oh no. This will do very well. She takes of her gloves and hat, puts them on the table. And sits down. The manager. The rooms are quite as good up here. There is less noise, and there is the lift. If your highness desires anything, there is the telephone. The princess. Oh, thank you, I don't want anything. The telephone is so difficult, I am not accustomed to it. The manager. Can I take any order? Some tea? The princess. Oh, thank you. Yes, should like some tea, if I might, if it would not be too much trouble. He goes out. The telephone rings. The princess starts out of her chair, terrified, and recoils as far as possible from the instrument. The princess. Oh dear. It rings again. She looks scared. It rings again. She approaches it timidly. It rings again. She retreats hastily. It rings repeatedly. She runs to it in desperation and puts the receiver to her ear. Who is there? What do I do? I am not used to the telephone, I don't know how, what. Oh, I can hear you speaking quite distinctly. She sits down, delighted, and settles herself for a conversation. How wonderful. What? A lady? Oh. A person. Oh yes, I know. Yes, please, send her up. Have my servants finished their lunch yet? Oh no, please don't disturb them, I'd rather not. It doesn't matter. Thank you. What? Oh yes, it's quite easy. I had no idea, am I to hang it up just as it was? Thank you. She hangs it up. Ermintrud enters, presenting a plain and staid appearance in a long straight waterproof with a hood over her headgear. She comes to the end of the table opposite to that at which the princess is seated. The princess. Excuse me. I have been talking through the telephone, and I heard quite well, though I have never ventured before. Won't you sit down? Ermintrud. No, thank you, your highness. I am only a lady's maid. I understood you wanted one. The princess. Oh no, you mustn't think I want one. It's so unpatriotic to want anything now, on account of the war, you know. I sent my maid away as a public duty. And now she has married a soldier and is expecting a war baby. But I don't know how to do without her. I've tried my very best, but somehow it doesn't answer, everybody cheats me. And in the end it isn't any saving. So I've made up my mind to sell my piano and have a maid. That will be a real saving, because I really don't care a bit for music, though of course one has to pretend to. Don't you think so? Ermintrud. Certainly I do, your highness. Nothing could be more correct. Saving and self-denial both at once, and an act of kindness to me, as I am out of place. The princess. I'm so glad you see it in that way. Er, you won't mind my asking, will you, how did you lose your place? Ermintrud. The war, your highness, the war. The princess. Oh yes, of course. But how? Ermintrud. Taking out her handkerchief and showing signs of grief. My poor mistress. The princess. Oh please say no more. Don't think about it. So tactless of me to mention it. Ermintrud. 
mastering her emotion and smiling through her tears. Your Highness is too good. The Princess. Do you think you could be happy with me? I attach such importance to that. Ermintrude. Gushing. Oh, I know I shall. The Princess. You must not expect too much. There is my uncle. He is very severe and hasty, and he is my guardian. I once had a maid I liked very much, but he sent her away the very first time. Ermintrude. The first time of what, your highness? The princess. Oh, something she did. I am sure she had never done it before, and I know she would never have done it again, she was so truly contrite and nice about it. Ermintrude. About what, your highness? The princess. Well, she wore my jewels and one of my dresses at a rather improper ball with her young man, and my uncle saw her. Ermintrude. Then he was at the ball too, your highness? The princess. Struck by the inference. I suppose he must have been. I wonder. You know, it's very sharp of you to find that out. I hope you are not too sharp. Ermintrude. A lady's maid has to be, your highness. She produces some letters. Your highness wishes to see my testimonials, no doubt. I have one from an archdeacon. She proffers the letters. The princess. Taking them. Do archdeacons have maids? How curious. Ermintrude. No, your highness. They have daughters. I have first-rate testimonials from the archdeacon and from his daughter. The princess. Reading them. The daughter says you are in every respect a treasure. The archdeacon says he would have kept you if he could possibly have afforded it. Most satisfactory, I'm sure. Ermintrude. May I regard myself as engaged then, your highness? The princess. Alarmed. Oh, I'm sure I don't know. If you like, of course, but do you think I ought to? Ermintrude. Naturally I think your highness ought to, most decidedly. The princess. Oh well, if you think that, I dare say you're quite right. You'll excuse my mentioning it, I hope, but what wages, er? Ermintrude. The same as the maid who went to the ball. Your highness need not make any change. The princess. Mize. Of course she began with less. But she had such a number of relatives to keep. It was quite heartbreaking, I had to raise her wages again and again. Ermintrude. I shall be quite content with what she began on, and I have no relatives dependent on me. And I am willing to wear my own dresses at balls. The princess. I am sure nothing could be fairer than that. My uncle can't object to that, can he? Ermintrude. If he does, your highness, ask him to speak to me about it. I shall regard it as part of my duties to speak to your uncle about matters of business. The princess. Would you? You must be frightfully courageous. Ermintrude. May I regard myself as engaged, your highness? I should like to set about my duties immediately. The princess. Oh yes, I think so. Oh certainly. I. A waiter comes in with the tea. He places the tray on the table. The princess. Oh, thank you. Ermintrude. Raising the cover from the tea cake and looking at it. How long has that been standing at the top of the stairs? The princess. Terrified. Oh please. It doesn't matter. The waiter. It has not been waiting. Straight from the kitchen, madam, believe me. Ermintrude. Send the manager here. The waiter. The manager. What do you want with the manager? Ermintrude. He will tell you when I have done with him. How dare you treat her highness in this disgraceful manner? What sort of pothouse is this? Where did you learn to speak to persons of quality? Take away your cold tea and cold cake instantly. 
give them to the chambermaid you were flirting with whilst her highness was waiting. Order some fresh tea at once, and do not presume to bring it yourself, have it brought by a civil waiter who is accustomed to wait on ladies, and not, like you, on commercial travellers. The waiter. Alas, madam, I am not accustomed to wait on anybody. Two years ago I was an eminent medical man, my waiting room was crowded with the flower of the aristocracy and the higher bourgeoisie from nine to six every day. But the war came. And my patients were ordered to give up their luxuries. They gave up their doctors, but kept their weekend hotels, closing every career to me except the career of a waiter. He puts his fingers on the teapot to test its temperature, and automatically takes out his watch with the other hand as if to count the teapot's pulse. You are right, the tea is cold, it was made by the wife of a once fashionable architect. The cake is only half toasted, what can you expect from a ruined West End tailor whose attempt to establish a second-hand business failed last Tuesday week? Have you the heart to complain to the manager? Have we not suffered enough? Are our miseries nev, the manager enters. Oh Lord! Here he is. The waiter withdraws abjectly, taking the tea tray with him. The manager. Pardon, your highness, but I have received an urgent inquiry for rooms from an English family of importance. And I venture to ask you to let me know how long you intend to honor us with your presence. The princess. Rising anxiously. Oh! Am I in the way? Ermintrude. Sternly. Sit down, madam. The princess sits down forlornly. Ermintrude turns imperiously to the manager. Her highness will require this room for twenty minutes. The manager. Twenty minutes. Ermintrude. Yes, it will take fully that time to find a proper apartment in a respectable hotel. The manager. I do not understand. Ermintrude. You understand perfectly. How dare you offer Her Highness a room on the second floor? The manager. But I have explained. The first floor is occupied. At least. Ermintrude. Well? At least? The manager. It is occupied. Ermintrude. Don't you dare tell Her Highness a falsehood. It is not occupied. You are saving it up for the arrival of the 515 Express. From which you hope to pick up some fat armaments contractor who will drink all the bad champagne in your cellar at 25 francs a bottle. And pay twice over for everything because he is in the same hotel with Her Highness, and can boast of having turned her out of the best rooms. The Manager but Her Highness was so gracious. I did not know that Her Highness was at all particular. Ermintrude. And you take advantage of Her Highness's graciousness. You impose on her with your stories. You give her a room not fit for a dog. You send cold tea to her by a decayed professional person disguised as a waiter. But don't think you can trifle with me. I am a lady's maid and I know the ladies' maids and valets of all the aristocracies of Europe and all the millionaires of America. When I expose your hotel as the second-rate little hole it is, not a soul above the rank of a curate with a large family will be seen entering it. I shake its dust off my feet. Order the luggage to be taken down at once. The manager. Appealing to the princess. Can your highness believe this of me? Have I had the misfortune to offend your highness? The princess. Oh no. I am quite satisfied. Please. Ermintrude. Is your highness dissatisfied with me? The princess. Intimidated. Oh no, please don't think that. I only meant. Ermintrude. To the manager. You hear. Perhaps you think Her Highness is going to do the work of teaching you your place herself, instead of leaving it to her maid. The manager. Oh please, mademoiselle. Believe me, our only wish is to make you perfectly comfortable. But in consequence of the war, all royal personages now practice a rigid economy, 
and desire us to treat them like their poorest subjects. The princess. Oh yes. You are quite right. Ermintrude. Interrupting. There. Her Highness forgives you, but don't do it again. Now go downstairs, my good man, and get that suite on the first floor ready for us. And send some proper tea. And turn on the heating apparatus until the temperature in the rooms is comfortably warm. And have hot water put in all the bedrooms. The manager. There are basins with hot and cold taps. Ermintrude. Scornfully. Yes, there would be. Suppose we must put up with that, sinks in our rooms, and pipes that rattle and bang and guggle all over the house whenever anyone washes his hands. I know. The manager. Gallant. You are hard to please, mademoiselle. Ermintrude. No harder than other people. But when I'm not pleased I'm not too late alike to say so. That's all the difference. There is nothing more, thank you. The manager shrugs his shoulders resignedly, makes a deep bow to the princess, goes to the door, wafts a kiss surreptitiously to her mintrude, and goes out. The princess. It's wonderful. How have you the courage? Ermintrude. In your highness's service I know no fear. Your highness can leave all unpleasant people to me. The princess. How I wish I could. The most dreadful thing of all I have to go through myself. Ermintrude. Dare I ask what it is, your highness? The princess. I'm going to be married. I'm to be met here and married to a man I never saw. A boy. A boy who never saw me. One of the sons of the Inca of Peru Salem. Ermintrude. Indeed? Which son? The princess. I don't know. They haven't settled which. It's a dreadful thing to be a princess, they just marry you to anyone they like. The Inca is to come and look at me, and pick out whichever of his sons he thinks will suit. And then I shall be an alien enemy everywhere except in Peru Salem, because the Inca has made war on everybody. And I shall have to pretend that everybody has made war on him. It's too bad. Ermintrude. Still, a husband is a husband. I wish I had one. The princess. Oh, how can you say that? I'm afraid you're not a nice woman. Ermintrude. Your highness is provided for. I'm not. The princess. Even if you could bear to let a man touch you, you shouldn't say so. Ermintrude. I shall not say so again, your highness, except perhaps to the man. The princess. It's too dreadful to think of. I wonder you can be so coarse. I really don't think you'll suit. I feel sure now that you know more about men than you should. Ermintrude. I am a widow, your highness. The princess. Overwhelmed. Oh, I beg your pardon. Of course I ought to have known you would not have spoken like that if you were not married. That makes it all right, doesn't it? I'm so sorry. The manager returns, white, scared, hardly able to speak. The manager. Your Highness, an officer asks to see you on behalf of the Inca of Peru Salem. The Princess. Rising distractedly. Oh, I can't, really. Oh, what shall I do? The manager. On important business, he says, Your Highness. Captain Duval. Ermintrude. Duval. Nonsense. The usual thing. It is the Inca himself, incognito. The princess. Oh, send him away. Oh, I'm so afraid of the Inca. I'm not properly dressed to receive him, and he is so particular, he would order me to stay in my room for a week. Tell him to call tomorrow, say I'm ill in bed. I can't, I won't, I daren't, you must get rid of him somehow. Ermintrude. Leave him to me, your highness. The princess. You'd never dare. Ermintrude. 
I am an Englishwoman, your highness, and perfectly capable of tackling ten Incas if necessary. I will arrange the matter. To the manager. Show her highness to her bedroom. And then show Captain Duval in here. The princess. Oh, thank you so much. She goes to the door. Ermintrude, noticing that she has left her hat and gloves on the table, runs after her with them. Oh, thank you. And oh, please, if I must have one of his sons, I should like a fair one that doesn't shave, with soft hair and a beard. I couldn't bear being kissed by a bristly person. She runs out, the manager bowing as she passes. He follows her. Ermintrude whips off her waterproof, hides it. And gets herself swiftly into perfect trim at the mirror, before the manager, with a large jewel case in his hand, returns, ushering in the Inca. The manager. Captain Duval. The Inca, in military uniform, advances with a marked and imposing stage walk, stops, orders the trembling manager by a gesture to place the jewel case on the table. Dismisses him with a frown, touches his helmet graciously to Ermintrude, and takes off his cloak. The Inca. I beg you, madam, to be quite at your ease, and to speak to me without ceremony. Ermintrude. Moving haughtily and carelessly to the table. I hadn't the slightest intention of treating you with ceremony. She sits down, a liberty which gives him a perceptible shock. I am quite at a loss to imagine why I should treat a perfect stranger named Duval, a captain. Almost a subaltern. With the smallest ceremony. The Inca. That is true. I had for the moment forgotten my position. Ermintrude. It doesn't matter. You may sit down. The Inca. Frowning. What? Ermintrude. I said, you, may, sit, down. The Inca. Oh. His mustache droops. He sits down. Ermintrude. What is your business? The Inca. I come on behalf of the Inca of Peru Salem. Ermintrude. The Allerhoxt? The Inca. Precisely. Ermintrude. I wonder does he feel ridiculous when people call him the Allerhoxt? The Inca. Surprised. Why should he? He is the Allerhoxt. Ermintrude. Is he nice looking? The Inca. I, er. Er, I. I, er. I am not a good judge. Ermintrude. They say he takes himself very seriously. The Inca. Why should he not, madam? Providence has entrusted to his family the care of a mighty empire. He is in a position of half divine, half paternal, responsibility toward sixty millions of people, whose duty it is to die for him at the word of command. To take himself otherwise than seriously would be blasphemous. It is a punishable offense, severely punishable, in Peru Salem. It is called Inca disparagement. Ermintrude. How cheerful. Can he laugh? The Inca. Certainly, madam. He laughs, harshly and mirthlessly. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ermintrude. Frigidly. I asked could the Inca laugh. I did not ask could you laugh. The Inca. That is true, madam. Chuckling. Devilish amusing, that. He laughs, genially and sincerely, and becomes a much more agreeable person. Pardon me, I am now laughing because I cannot help it. I am amused. The other was merely an imitation, a failure, I admit. Ermintrude. You intimated that you had some business? The Inca. Producing a very large jewel case, and relapsing into solemnity. I am instructed by the Allerhawks to take a careful note of your features and figure, and, if I consider them satisfactory, to present you with this trifling token of His Imperial Majesty's regard. I do consider them satisfactory. Allow me. He opens the jewel case and presents it. 
Ermintrud. Staring at the contents. What awful taste he must have. I can't wear that. The Inca. Reddening. Take care, madam. This brooch was designed by the Inca himself. Allow me to explain the design. In the center, the shield of Arminius. The ten surrounding medallions represent the ten castles of His Majesty. The rim is a piece of the telephone cable laid by His Majesty across the ship's keel canal. The pin is a model in miniature of the sword of Henry the Birdcatcher. Ermintrud. Miniature. It must be bigger than the original. My good man, you don't expect me to wear this round my neck, it's as big as a turtle. He shuts the case with an angry snap. How much did it cost? The Inca. For materials and manufacture alone, half a million Peru Salem dollars, madam. The Inca's design constitutes it a work of art. As such, it is now worth probably ten million dollars. Ermintrud. Give it to me. She snatches it. I'll pawn it and buy something nice with the money. The Inca. Impossible, madam. A design by the Inca must not be exhibited for sale in the shop window of a pawnbroker. He flings himself into his chair, fuming. Ermintrud. So much the better. The Inca will have to redeem it to save himself from that disgrace, and the poor pawnbroker will get his money back. Nobody would buy it, you know. The Inca. May I ask why? Ermintrud. Well, look at it. Just look at it. I ask you. The Inca. His mustache drooping ominously. I am sorry to have to report to the Inca that you have no soul for fine art. He rises sulkily. The position of daughter-in-law to the Inca is not compatible with the tastes of a pig. He attempts to take back the brooch. Ermintrud. Rising and retreating behind her chair with the brooch. Here. You let that brooch alone. You presented it to me on behalf of the Inca. It is mine. You said my appearance was satisfactory. The Inca. Your appearance is not satisfactory. The Inca would not allow his son to marry you if the boy were on a desert island and you were the only other human being on it. He strides up the room. Ermintrud. Calmly sitting down and replacing the case on the table. How could he? There would be no clergyman to marry us. It would have to be quite morganatic. The Inca. Returning. Such an expression is out of place in the mouth of a princess aspiring to the highest destiny on earth. You have the morals of a dragoon. She receives this with a shriek of laughter. He struggles with his sense of humor. At the same time he sits down there is a certain coarse fun in the idea which compels me to smile. He turns up his mustache and smiles. Ermintrud. When I marry the Inca's son, Captain, I shall make the Inca order you to cut off that mustache. It is too irresistible. Doesn't it fascinate everyone in Peru Salem? The Inca. Leaning forward to her energetically. By all the thunders of Thor, madam, it fascinates the whole world. Ermintrud. What I like about you, Captain Duval, is your modesty. The Inca. Straightening up suddenly. Woman, do not be a fool. Ermintrud. Indignant. Well. The Inca. You must look facts in the face. This mustache is an exact copy of the Inca's mustache. Well, does the world occupy itself with the Inca's mustache or does it not? Does it ever occupy itself with anything else? If that is the truth, does its recognition constitute the Inca a coxcomb? Other potentates have mustaches, even beards and mustaches. Does the world occupy itself with those beards and mustaches? Do the hawkers in the streets of every capital on the civilized globe sell ingenious cardboard representations of their faces on which, at the pulling of a simple string, the mustaches turn up and down, so? He makes his mustache turn, up and down several times. No. 
I say no. The Inca's mustache is so watched and studied that it has made his face the political barometer of the whole continent. When that mustache goes up, culture rises with it. Not what you call culture, but culture, a word so much more significant that I hardly understand it myself except when I am in specially good form. When it goes down, millions of men perish. Ermintrud. You know, if I had a mustache like that, it would turn my head. I should go mad. Are you quite sure the Inca isn't mad? The Inca. How can he be mad, madam? What is sanity? The condition of the Inca's mind. What is madness? The condition of the people who disagree with the Inca. Ermintrud. Then I am a lunatic because I don't like that ridiculous brooch. The Inca. No, madam, you are only an idiot. Ermintrud. Thank you. The Inca. Mark you, it is not to be expected that you should see eye to eye with the Inca. That would be presumption. It is for you to accept without question or demur the assurance of your Inca that the brooch is a masterpiece. Ermintrud. My Inca. Oh, come. I like that. He is not my Inca yet. The Inca. He is everybody's Inca, madam. His realm will yet extend to the confines of the habitable earth. It is his divine right, and let those who dispute it look to themselves. Properly speaking, all those who are now trying to shake his world predominance are not at war with him, but in rebellion against him. Ermintrud. Well, he started it, you know. The Inca. Madam, be just. When the hunters surround the lion, the lion will spring. The Inca had kept the peace of years. Those who attacked him were steeped in blood, black blood, white blood, brown blood, yellow blood, blue blood. The Inca had never shed a drop. Ermintrud. He had only talked. The Inca. Only talked. Only talked. What is more glorious than talk? Can anyone in the world talk like him? Madam, when he signed the declaration of war, he said to his foolish generals and admirals, Gentlemen, you will all be sorry for this. And they are. They know now that they had better have relied on the sword of the spirit, in other words, on their Inca's talk, than on their murderous cannons. The world will one day do justice to the Inca as the man who kept the peace with nothing but his tongue and his mustache. While he talked, talked just as I am talking now to you, simply, quietly, sensibly, but greatly, there was peace, there was prosperity, Peru Salem went from success to success. He has been silenced for a year by the roar of Trinitrotoluene and the bluster of fools, and the world is in ruins. What a tragedy! He is convulsed with grief. Ermintrud. Captain Duval, I don't want to be unsympathetic, but suppose we get back to business. The Inca. Business. What business? Ermintrud. Well, my business. You want me to marry one of the Inca's sons, I forget which. The Inca. As far as I can recollect the name. It is His Imperial Highness Prince Itel William Frederick George Franz Joseph Alexander Nicholas Victor Emmanuel Albert Theodore Wilson. Ermintrud. Interrupting. Oh, please, please, mayn't I have one with a shorter name? What is he called at home? The Inca. He is usually called Sonny, madam. With great charm of manner. But you will please understand that the Inca has no desire to pin you to any particular son. There is Chips and Spots and Lulu and Pongo and the Corsair and the Piffler and Jack Johnson II, all unmarried. At least not seriously married, nothing, in short, that cannot be arranged. They are all at your service. Ermintrud. Are they all as clever and charming as their father? The Inca. Lifts his eyebrows pityingly shrugs his shoulders. Then, with indulgent paternal contempt. Excellent lads, madam. Very honest affectionate creatures. I have nothing against them. Pongo imitates farmyard sounds, cock crowing and that sort of thing, 
extremely well. Lulu plays Strauss's Sinfonia Domestica on the mouth organ really screamingly. Chips keeps owls and rabbits. Spots motor bicycles. The Corsair commands canal barges and steers them himself. The Piffler writes plays, and paints most abominably. Jack Johnson trims ladies' hats, and boxes with professionals hired for that purpose. He is invariably victorious. Yes, they all have their different little talents. And also, of course, their family resemblances. For example, they all smoke, they all quarrel with one another. And they none of them appreciate their father, who, by the way, is no mean painter, though the piffler pretends to ridicule his efforts. Ermintrud. Quite a large choice, eh? The Inca. But very little to choose, believe me. I should not recommend Pongo, because he snores so frightfully that it has been necessary to build him a soundproof bedroom, otherwise the royal family would get no sleep. But any of the others would suit equally well, if you are really bent on marrying one of them. Ermintrud. If. What is this? I never wanted to marry one of them. I thought you wanted me to. The Inca. I did, madam, but confidentially, flattering her you are not quite the sort of person I expected you to be, and I doubt whether any of these young degenerates would make you happy. I trust one am not showing any want of natural feeling when I say that from the point of view of a lively, accomplished, and beautiful woman or mintrude bows they might pall after a time. I suggest that you might prefer the Inca himself. Ermintrude. Oh, Captain, how could a humble person like myself be of any interest to a prince who is surrounded with the ablest and most far-reaching intellects in the world? The Inca. Explosively. What on earth are you talking about, madam? Can you name a single man in the entourage of the Inca who is not a born fool? Ermintrude. Oh, how can you say that? There is Admiral von Cockpits. The Inca. Rising intolerantly and striding about the room. Von Cockpits. Madam, if von Cockpits ever goes to heaven, before three weeks are over the angel Gabriel will be at war with the man in the moon. Ermintrude. But General von Schinkenberg. The Inca. Schinkenberg. I grant you, Schinkenberg has a genius for defending market gardens. Among market gardens he is invincible. But what is the good of that? The world does not consist of market gardens. Turn him loose in pasture and he is lost. The Inca has defeated all these generals again and again at maneuvers. And yet he has to give place to them in the field because he would be blamed for every disaster, accused of sacrificing the country to his vanity. Vanity. Why do they call him vain? Just because he is one of the few men who are not afraid to live. Why do they call themselves brave? Because they have not sense enough to be afraid to die. Within the last year the world has produced millions of heroes. Has it produced more than one Inca? He resumes his seat. Ermintrud. Fortunately not, Captain. I'd rather marry Chips. The Inca. Making a wry face. Chips. Oh no, I wouldn't marry Chips. Ermintrud. Why? The Inca. Whispering the secret. Chips talks too much about himself. Ermintrud. Well, what about Snooks? The Inca. Snooks? Who is he? Have I a son named Snooks? There are so many, wearily so many, that I often forget. Casually. But I wouldn't marry him, anyhow, if I were you. Ermintrud. But hasn't any of them inherited the family genius? Surely, if Providence has entrusted them with the care of Peru Salem, if they are all descended from Bedrock the Great. The Inca. Interrupting her impatiently. Madam, if you ask me, I consider Bedrock a grossly overrated monarch. Ermintrud. Shocked. Oh, Captain. Take care. Inca disparagement. The Inca. I repeat, grossly overrated. 
strictly between ourselves, I do not believe all this about providence and trusting the care of 60 million human beings to the abilities of Chips and the Piffler and Jack Johnson. I believe in individual genius. That is the Inca's secret. It must be. Why, hang it all, madam, if it were a mere family matter, the Inca's uncle would have been as great a man as the Inca. And, well, everybody knows what the Inca's uncle was. Ermintrud. My experience is that the relatives of men of genius are always the greatest duffers imaginable. The Inca. Precisely. That is what proves that the Inca is a man of genius. His relatives are duffers. Ermintrud. But bless my soul, Captain, if all the Inca's generals are incapables, and all his relatives duffers, Peru Salem will be beaten in the war. And then it will become a republic, like France after 1871, and the Inca will be sent to St. Helena. The Inca. Triumphantly. That is just what the Inca is playing for, madam. It is why he consented to the war. Ermintrud. What? The Inca. Aha. The fools talk of crushing the Inca, but they little know their man. Tell me this. Why didst he? Helena extinguish Napoleon? Ermintrud. I give it up. The Inca. Because, madam, with certain rather remarkable qualities, which I should be the last to deny, Napoleon lacked versatility. After all, any fool can be a soldier, we know that only too well in Peru Salem, where every fool is a soldier. But the Inca has a thousand other resources. He is an architect. Well, St. Helena presents an unlimited field to the architect. He is a painter, need I remind you that St. Helena is still without a national gallery? He is a composer, Napoleon left no symphonies in St. Helena. Send the Inca to St. Helena, madam, and the world will crowd thither to see his works as they crowd now to Athens to see the Acropolis, to Madrid to see the pictures of Velázquez. To Bayreuth to see the music dramas of that egotistical old rebel Richard Wagner, who ought to have been shot before he was forty, as indeed he very nearly was. Take this from me, hereditary monarchs are played out, the age for men of genius has come, the career is open to the talents, before ten years have elapsed every civilized country from the Carpathians to the Rocky Mountains will be a republic. Ermintrud. Then goodbye to the Inca. The Inca. On the contrary, madam, the Inca will then have his first real chance. He will be unanimously invited by those republics to return from his exile and act as super-president of all the republics. Ermintrud. But won't that be a come-down for him? Think of it. After being Inca, to be a mere president. The Inca. Well, why not? An Inca can do nothing. He is tied hand and foot. A constitutional monarch is openly called an India rubber stamp. An emperor is a puppet. The Inca is not allowed to make a speech, he is compelled to take up a screed of flatulent twaddle written by some noodle of a minister and read it aloud. But look at the American president. He is the Allerhoxt, if you like. No, madam, believe me, there is nothing like democracy, American democracy. Give the people voting papers, good long voting papers, American fashion, and while the people are reading the voting papers the government does what it likes. Ermintrud. What? You too worship before the Statue of Liberty, like the Americans? The Inca. Not at all, madam. The Americans do not worship the Statue of Liberty. They have erected it in the proper place for a Statue of Liberty, on its tomb. He turns down his mustaches. Ermintrud. Laughing. Oh. You'd better not let them hear you say that, Captain. The Inca. Quite safe, madam, they would take it as a joke. He rises. And now, prepare yourself for a surprise. She rises. A shock. Brace yourself. Steal yourself. And do not be afraid. 
Ermintrude. Whatever on earth can you be going to tell me, Captain? The Inca. Madam, I am no captain. I. Ermintrude. You are the Inca in disguise. The Inca. Good heavens. How do you know that? Who has betrayed me? Ermintrude. How could I help divining it, sir? Who is there in the world like you? Your magnetism. The Inca. True, I had forgotten my magnetism. But you know now that beneath the trappings of imperial majesty there is a man, simple, frank, modest, unaffected, colloquial, a sincere friend, a natural human being, a genial comrade. One eminently calculated to make a woman happy. You, on the other hand, are the most charming woman I have ever met. Your conversation is wonderful. I have sat here almost in silence, listening to your shrewd and penetrating account of my character, my motives, if I may say so, my talents. Never has such justice been done me, never have I experienced such perfect sympathy. Will you, I hardly know how to put this, will you be mine? Ermintrude. Oh, sir, you are married. The Inca. I am prepared to embrace the Mohammedan faith, which allows a man four wives, if you will consent. It will please the Turks. But I had rather you did not mention it to the Inca S. If you don't mind. Ermintrude. This is really charming of you. But the time has come for me to make a revelation. It is your imperial majesty's turn now to brace yourself. To steal yourself. I am not the princess. I am. The Inca. The daughter of my old friend Archdeacon Daffodil Duncan, whose sermons are read to me every evening after dinner. I never forget a face. Ermintrude. You knew all along. The Inca. Bitterly, throwing himself into his chair. And you suppose that I, who have been condemned to the society of princesses all my wretched life, believed for a moment that any princess that ever walked could have your intelligence. Ermintrude. How clever of you, sir. But you cannot afford to marry me. The Inca. Springing up. Why not? Ermintrude. You are too poor. You have to eat war bread. Kings nowadays belong to the poorer classes. The King of England does not even allow himself wine at dinner. The Inca. Delighted. Ha. Ha ha. 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 He is convulsed with laughter, and, finally has to relieve his feelings by waltzing half round the room. Ermintrude. You may laugh, sir, but I really could not live in that style. I am the widow of a millionaire, ruined by your little war. The Inca. A millionaire. What are millionaires now, with the world crumbling? Ermintrude. Excuse me, mine was a hyphenated millionaire. The Inca. A highfalutin millionaire, you mean. Chuckling. Ha. Ha ha. Really very nearly a pun, that. He sits down in her chair. Ermintrude. Revolted sinking into his chair. I think it quite the worst pun I ever heard. The Inca. The best puns have all been made years ago, nothing remained but to achieve the worst. However, madam he rises majestically, and she is about to rise also. No, I prefer a seated audience. She falls back into her seat at the imperious wave of his hand. So. He clicks his heels. Madam, I recognize my presumption in having sought the honor of your hand. As you say, I cannot afford it. Victorious as I am, I am hopelessly bankrupt. And the worst of it is, I am intelligent enough to know it. And I shall be beaten in consequence, because my most implacable enemy, though only a few months further away from bankruptcy than myself, has not a ray of intelligence. And will go on fighting until civilization is destroyed unless I, out of sheer pity for the world, condescend to capitulate. Ermintrude. The sooner the better, sir. 
Many fine young men are dying while you wait. The Inca. Flinching painfully. Why? Why do they do it? Ermintrud. Because you make them. The Inca. Stuff. How can I? I am only one man, and they are millions. Do you suppose they would really kill each other if they didn't want to, merely for the sake of my beautiful eyes? Do not be deceived by newspaper claptrap, madam. I was swept away by a passion not my own, which imposed itself on me. By myself I am nothing. I dare not walk down the principal street of my own capital in a coat two years old, though the sweeper of that street can wear one ten years old. You talk of death as an unpopular thing. You are wrong, for years I gave them art, literature, science, prosperity, that they might live more abundantly, and they hated me, ridiculed me, caricatured me. Now that I give them death in its frightfulest forms, they are devoted to me. If you doubt me, ask those who for years have begged our taxpayers in vain for a few paltry thousands to spend on life, on the bodies and minds of the nation's children. On the beauty and healthfulness of its cities, on the honor and comfort of its worn-out workers. They refused, and because they refused, death is let loose on them. They grudged a few hundreds a year for their salvation, they now pay millions a day for their own destruction and damnation. And this they call my doing. Let them say it, if they dare, before the judgment seat at which they and I shall answer at last for what we have left undone no less than for what we have done. Pulling himself together suddenly. Madam, I have the honor to be your most obedient. He clicks his heels and bows. Ermintrud. Sir. She curtsies. The Inca. Turning at the door. Oh, by the way, there is a princess, isn't there, somewhere on the premises? Ermintrud. There is. Shall I fetch her? The Inca. Dubious. Pretty awful, I suppose, eh? Ermintrud. About the usual thing. The Inca. Sighing. Ah well. What can one expect? I don't think I need trouble her personally. Will you explain to her about the boys? Ermintrud. I am afraid the explanation will fall rather flat without your magnetism. The Inca returning to her and speaking very humanly. You are making fun of me. Why does everybody make fun of me? Is it fair? Ermintrud. Seriously. Yes, it is fair. What other defense have we poor common people against your shining armor, your mailed fist, your pomp and parade, your terrible power over us? Are these things fair? The Inca. Ah, well, Perhaps, perhaps. He looks at his watch. By the way, there is time for a drive round the town and a cup of tea at the zoo. Quite a bearable band there, it does not play any patriotic airs. I am sorry you will not listen to any more permanent arrangement, but if you would care to come. Ermintrud. Eagerly. Rather. I shall be delighted. The Inca. Cautiously. In the strictest honor, you understand. Ermintrud. Don't be afraid. I promise to refuse any incorrect proposals. The Inca. Enchanted. Oh. Charming woman, how well you understand men. He offers her his arm, they go out together. Augustus does his bit. A true-to-life farce. Preface. I wish to express my gratitude for certain good offices which Augustus secured for me in January, 1917. I had been invited to visit the theater of war in Flanders by the commander-in-chief, an invitation which was, under the circumstances, a summons to duty. Thus I had occasion to spend some days in procuring the necessary passport and other official facilities for my journey. It happened just then that the Stage Society gave a performance of this little play. It opened the heart of every official to me. I have always been treated with distinguished consideration in my contracts with bureaucracy during the war, 
but on this occasion I found myself persona grata in the highest degree. There was only one word when the formalities were disposed of, and that was, we are up against Augustus all day. The showing up of Augustus scandalized one or two innocent and patriotic critics who regarded the prowess of the British army as inextricably bound up with Highcastle prestige. But our government departments knew better, their problem was how to win the war with Augustus on their backs, well-meaning, brave, patriotic, but obstructively fussy, self-important, imbecile. And disastrous. Save for the satisfaction of being able to laugh at Augustus in the theatre, nothing, as far as I know, came of my dramatic reduction of him to absurdity. Generals, admirals, prime ministers and controllers, not to mention emperors, kaisers and tsars, were scrapped remorselessly at home and abroad, for their sins or services, as the case might be. But Augustus stood like the eddy stone in a storm, and stands so to this day. He gave us his word that he was indispensable and we took it. Dramatis Personi Lord Augustus Highcastle Horatio Floyd Beamish The Lady Augustus does his bit. The Mayor's Parlor in the Town Hall of Little Pifflington Lord Augustus Highcastle, a distinguished member of the governing class, in the uniform of a colonel, and very well preserved at forty-five is comfortably seated at a writing table with his heels on it, reading the morning post. The door faces him, a little to his left, at the other side of the room. The window is behind him. In the fireplace, a gas stove. On the table a bell button and a telephone. Portraits of past mayors, in robes and gold chains, adorn the walls. An elderly clerk with a short white beard and whiskers, and a very red nose, shuffles in. Augustus. Hastily putting aside his paper and replacing his feet on the floor. Hello. Who are you? The clerk. The staff. A slight impediment in his speech adds to the impression of incompetence produced by his age and appearance. Augustus. You the staff. What do you mean, man? The clerk. What I say. There ain't anybody else. Augustus. Tush. Where are the others? The clerk. At the front. Augustus. Quite right. Most proper. Why aren't you at the front? The clerk. Over age. Fifty-seven. Augustus. But you can still do your bit. Many an older man is in the GRs, or volunteering for home defense. The clerk. I have volunteered. Augustus. Then why are you not in uniform? The clerk. They said they wouldn't have me if I was given away with a pound of tea. Told me to go home and not be an old silly. A sense of unbearable wrong, till now only smoldering in him, bursts into flame. Young Bill Knight that I took with me, got two and seven pence. I got nothing. Is it justice? This country is going to the dogs, if you ask me. Augustus. Rising indignantly. I do not ask you, sir, and I will not allow you to say such things in my presence. Our statesmen are the greatest known to history. Our generals are invincible. Our army is the admiration of the world. Furiously. How dare you tell me that the country is going to the dogs? The clerk. Why did they give young Bill Knight two and seven pence, and not give me even my tram fare? Do you call that being great statesman? As good as robbing me, I call it. Augustus. That's enough. Leave the room. He sits down and takes up his pen, settling himself to work. The clerk shuffles to the door. Augustus adds, with cold politeness, send me the secretary. The clerk. I'm the secretary. I can't leave the room and send myself to you at the same time, can I? Augustus. Don't be insolent. Where is the gentleman I have been corresponding with, Mr. Horatio Floyd Beamish? The clerk. Returning and bowing. 
Here. Me. Augustus. You. Ridiculous. What right have you to call yourself by a pretentious name of that sort? The clerk. You may drop the Horatio Floyd. Beamish is good enough for me. Augustus. Is there nobody else to take my instructions? The clerk. It's me or nobody. And for two pins I'd chuck it. Don't you drive me too far. Old, UNS like me is up in the world now. Augustus. If we were not at war, I should discharge you on the spot for disrespectful behavior. But England is in danger, and I cannot think of my personal dignity at such a moment. Shouting at him. Don't you think of yours, either, worm that you are, or I'll have you arrested under the Defense of the Realm Act, double quick. The clerk. What do I care about the realm? They done me out of two and seven. Augustus. Oh, damn your two and seven. Did you receive my letters? The clerk. Yes. Augustus. I addressed a meeting here last night, went straight to the platform from the train. I wrote to you that I should expect you to be present and report yourself. Why did you not do so? The clerk. The police wouldn't let me on the platform. Augustus. Did you tell them who you were? The clerk. They knew who I was. That's why they wouldn't let me up. Augustus. This is too silly for anything. This town wants waking up. I made the best recruiting speech I ever made in my life, and not a man joined. The clerk. What did you expect? You told them our gallant fellows is falling at the rate of a thousand a day in the big push. Dying for little Pifflington, you says. Come and take their places, you says. That ain't the way to recruit. Augustus. But I expressly told them their widows would have pensions. The clerk. I heard you. Would have been all right if it had been the widows you wanted to get round. Augustus. Rising angrily. This town is inhabited by dastards. I say it with a full sense of responsibility, dastards. They call themselves Englishmen, and they are afraid to fight. The clerk. Afraid to fight. You should see them on a Saturday night. Augustus. Yes, they fight one another. But they won't fight the Germans. The clerk. They got grudges again one another, how can they have grudges again the Huns that they never saw? They've no imagination, that's what it is. Bring the Huns here, and they'll quarrel with them fast enough. Augustus. Returning to his seat with a grunt of disgust. M.F. They'll have them here if they're not careful. Seated. Have you carried out my orders about the war saving? The clerk. Yes. Augustus. The allowance of petrol has been reduced by three quarters? The clerk. It has. Augustus. And you have told the motor car people to come here and arrange to start munition work now that their motor business is stopped? The clerk. It ain't stopped. They're busier than ever. Augustus. Busy at what? The clerk. Making small cars. Augustus. New cars. The clerk. The old cars only do twelve miles to the gallon. Everybody has to have a car that will do thirty-five now. Augustus. Can't they take the train? The clerk. There ain't no trains now. They've tore up the rails and sent them to the front. Augustus. Shaw. The clerk. Well, we have to get about somehow. Augustus. This is perfectly monstrous. Not in the least what I intended. The clerk. Hell. Augustus. Sir. The clerk. Explaining. Hell, they says, is paved with good intentions. Augustus. Springing to his feet. Do you mean to insinuate that hell is paved with my good intentions, 
with the good intentions of His Majesty's government? The clerk. I don't mean to insinuate anything until the defense of the Realm Act is repealed. It ain't safe. Augustus. They told me that this town had set an example to all England in the matter of economy. I came down here to promise the mayor a knighthood for his exertions. The clerk. The mayor. Where do I come in? Augustus. You don't come in. You go out. This is a fool of a place. I'm greatly disappointed. Deeply disappointed. Flinging himself back into his chair. Disgusted. The clerk. What more can we do? We've shut up everything. The picture gallery is shut. The museum is shut. The theaters and picture shows is shut, I haven't seen a movie picture for six months. Augustus. Man, man, do you want to see picture shows when the Hun is at the gate? The clerk. Mournfully. I don't now, though it drove me melancholy mad at first. I was on the point of taking a pen north of rat poison. Augustus. Why didn't you? The clerk. Because a friend advised me to take to drink instead. That saved my life, though it makes me very poor company in the mornings, as hiccuping perhaps you've noticed. Augustus. Well, upon my soul. You are not ashamed to stand there and confess yourself a disgusting drunkard. The clerk. Well, what of it? We're at war now, and everything's changed. Besides, I should lose my job here if I stood drinking at the bar. I'm a respectable man and must buy my drink and take it home with me. And they won't serve me with less than a quart. If you'd told me before the war that I could get through a quart of whiskey in a day, I shouldn't have believed you. That's the good of war, it brings out powers in a man that he never suspected himself capable of. You said so yourself in your speech last night. Augustus. I did not know that I was talking to an imbecile. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. There must be an end of this drunken slacking. I'm going to establish a new order of things here. I shall come down every morning before breakfast until things are properly in train. Have a cup of coffee and two rolls for me here every morning at half past ten. The clerk. You can't have no rolls. The only baker that baked rolls was a hun, and he's been interned. Augustus. Quite right, too. And was there no Englishman to take his place? The clerk. There was. But he was caught spying, and they took him up to London and shot him. Augustus. Shot an Englishman. The clerk. Well, it stands to reason if the Germans wanted to spy they wouldn't employ a German that everybody would suspect, don't it? Augustus. Rising again. Do you mean to say, you scoundrel, that an Englishman is capable of selling his country to the enemy for gold? The clerk. Not as a general thing I wouldn't say it. But there's men here would sell their own mothers for two coppers if they got the chance. Augustus. Beamish, it's an ill bird that fouls its own nest. The clerk. It wasn't me that let little Pifflington get foul. I don't belong to the governing classes. I only tell you why you can't have no roles. Augustus. Intensely irritated. Can you tell me where I can find an intelligent being to take my orders? The clerk. One of the street sweepers used to teach in the school until it was shut up for the sake of economy. Will he do? Augustus. What? You mean to tell me that when the lives of the gallant fellows in our trenches, and the fate of the British Empire, depend on our keeping up the supply of shells? You are wasting money on sweeping the streets? The clerk. We have to. We dropped it for a while but the infant death rate went up something frightful. Augustus. What matters the death rate of little Pifflington in a moment like this? Think of our gallant soldiers, not of your squalling infants. The clerk. If you want soldiers you must have children. 
You can't buy am in boxes, like toy soldiers. Augustus. Beamish, the long and the short of it is, you are no patriot. Go downstairs to your office, and have that gas stove taken away and replaced by an ordinary grate. The Board of Trade has urged on me the necessity for economizing gas. The Clerk. Our orders from the Minister of Munitions is to use gas instead of coal, because it saves material. Which is it to be? Augustus. Bawling furiously at him. Both. Don't criticize your orders, obey them. Yours not to reason why, yours but to do and die. That's war. Cooling down. Have you anything else to say? The clerk. Yes, I want a rise. Augustus. Reeling against the table in his horror. Arise. Horatio Floyd Beamish, do you know that we are at war? The clerk. Feebly ironical. I have noticed something about it in the papers. Heard you mention it once or twice, now I come to think of it. Augustus. Our gallant fellows are dying in the trenches, and you want a rise. The clerk. What are they dying for? To keep me alive, ain't it? Well, what's the good of that if I'm dead of hunger by the time they come back? Augustus. Everybody else is making sacrifices without a thought of self. And you? The clerk. Not half, they ain't. Where's the baker's sacrifice? Where's the coal merchants? Where's the butchers? Charging me double, that's how they sacrifice themselves. Well, I want to sacrifice myself that way too. Just double next Saturday, double and not a penny less, or no secretary for you. He stiffens himself shakily, and makes resolutely for the door. Augustus. Looking after him contemptuously. Go, miserable pro-German. The clerk. Rushing back and facing him. Who are you calling a pro-German? Augustus. Another word, and I charge you under the act with discouraging me. Go. The clerk blenches and goes out, cowed. The telephone rings. Augustus. Taking up the telephone receiver. Hello. Yes. Who are you, oh, Blue Lou, is it? Yes, there's nobody in the room, fire away. What? A spy. A woman. Yes, brought it down with me. Do you suppose I'm such a fool as to let it out of my hands? Why, it gives a list of all our anti-aircraft emplacements from Ramsgate to Skegness. The Germans would give a million for it, what? But how could she possibly know about it? I haven't mentioned it to a soul, except, of course, dear Lucy. Oh, Toto and Lady Popham and that lot, they don't count, they're all right. I mean that I haven't mentioned it to any Germans. Pooh! Don't you be nervous, old chap. I know you think me a fool, but I'm not such a fool as all that. If she tries to get it out of me I'll have her in the tower before you ring up again. The clerk returns. Such as H. Somebody's just come in, ring off. Goodbye. He hangs up the receiver. The clerk. Are you engaged? His manner is strangely softened. Augustus. What business is that of yours? However, if you will take the trouble to read the society papers for this week, you will see that I am engaged to the Honorable Lucy Popham. Youngest daughter of. The clerk. That ain't what I mean. Can you see a female? Augustus. Of course I can see a female as easily as a male. Do you suppose I'm blind? The clerk. You don't seem to follow me, somehow. There's a female downstairs, what you might call a lady. She wants to know can you see her if I let her up? Augustus. Oh, you mean am I disengaged? Tell the lady I have just received news of the greatest importance which will occupy my entire attention for the rest of the day, and that she must write for an appointment. The clerk. 
I'll ask her to explain her business to me. I ain't above talking to a handsome young female when I get the chance. Going. Augustus. Stop. Does she seem to be a person of consequence? The clerk. A regular marchioness, if you ask me. Augustus. H.M. Beautiful, did you say? The clerk. A human chrysanthemum, sir, believe me. Augustus. It will be extremely inconvenient for me to see her, but the country is in danger, and we must not consider our own comfort. Think how our gallant fellows are suffering in the trenches. Show her up. The clerk makes for the door, whistling the latest popular ballad. Stop whistling instantly, sir. This is not a casino. The clerk. Ain't it? You just wait till you see her. He goes out. Augustus produces a mirror, a comb, and a pot of mustache pomade from the drawer of the writing table, and sits down before the mirror to put some touches to his toilet. The clerk returns, devotedly ushering a very attractive lady, brilliantly dressed. She has a dainty wallet hanging from her wrist. Augustus hastily covers up his toilet apparatus with the morning post, and rises in an attitude of pompous condescension. The clerk. To Augustus. Here she is. To the lady. May I offer you a chair, lady? He places a chair at the writing table opposite Augustus, and steals out on tiptoe. Augustus. Be seated, madam. The lady. Sitting down. Are you Lord Augustus Highcastle? Augustus. Sitting also. Madam, I am. The lady. With awe. The great Lord Augustus? Augustus. I should not dream of describing myself so, madam. But no doubt I have impressed my countrymen, and bowing gallantly may I say my countrywomen, as having some exceptional claims to their consideration. The lady. Emotionally. What a beautiful voice you have. Augustus. What you hear, madam, is the voice of my country, which now takes a sweet and noble tone even in the harsh mouth of high officialism. The lady. Please go on. You express yourself so wonderfully. Augustus. It would be strange indeed if, after sitting on thirty-seven royal commissions, mostly as chairman, I had not mastered the art of public expression. Even the radical papers have paid me the high compliment of declaring that I am never more impressive than when I have nothing to say. The lady. I never read the radical papers. All I can tell you is that what we women admire in you is not the politician, but the man of action, the heroic warrior, the beau sabreur. Augustus. Gloomily. Madam, I beg. Please. My military exploits are not a pleasant subject, unhappily. The lady. Oh, I know, I know. How shamefully you have been treated. What ingratitude. But the country is with you. The women are with you. Oh, do you think all our hearts did not throb and all our nerves thrill when we heard how, when you were ordered to occupy that terrible quarry in Hullock? And you swept into it at the head of your men like a sea god riding on a tidal wave, you suddenly sprang over the top shouting, to Berlin. Forward, dashed at the German army single handed, and were cut off and made prisoner by the Huns. Augustus. Yes, madam, and what was my reward? They said I had disobeyed orders, and sent me home. Have they forgotten Nelson in the Baltic? Has any British battle ever been won except by a bold initiative? I say nothing of professional jealousy, it exists in the army as elsewhere. But it is a bitter thought to me that the recognition denied me by my country, or rather by the radical cabal in the cabinet which pursues my family with rancorous class hatred, that this recognition, I say, came to me at the hands of an enemy, of a rank Prussian. The lady. You don't say so. Augustus. How else should I be here instead of starving to death in Rullaban? Yes, madam, the colonel of the Pomeranian regiment which captured me, 
after learning what I had done, and conversing for an hour with me on European politics and military strategy. Declared that nothing would induce him to deprive my country of my services, and set me free. I offered, of course, to procure the release in exchange of a German officer of equal quality, but he would not hear of it. He was kind enough to say he could not believe that a German officer answering to that description existed. With emotion. I had my first taste of the ingratitude of my own country as I made my way back to our lines. A shot from our front trench struck me in the head. I still carry the flattened projectile as a trophy. He throws it on the table, the noise it makes testifies to its weight. Had it penetrated to the brain I might never have sat on another royal commission. Fortunately we have strong heads, we high castles. Nothing has ever penetrated to our brains. The lady. How thrilling. How simple. And how tragic. But you will forgive England? Remember, England. Forgive her. Augustus. With gloomy magnanimity. It will make no difference whatever to my services to my country. Though she slay me, yet will I, if not exactly trust in her, at least take my part in her government. I am ever at my country's call. Whether it be the embassy in a leading European capital, a governor generalship in the tropics, or my humble mission here to make little Pifflington do its bit, I am always ready for the sacrifice. Whilst England remains England, wherever there is a public job to be done you will find a high castle sticking to it. And now, madam, enough of my tragic personal history. You have called on business. What can I do for you? The lady. You have relatives at the foreign office, have you not? Augustus. Haughtily. Madam, the foreign office is staffed by my relatives exclusively. The lady. Has the foreign office warned you that you are being pursued by a female spy who is determined to obtain possession of a certain list of gun emplacements? Augustus. Interrupting her. Somewhat loftily. All that is perfectly well known to this department, madam. The lady. Surprised and rather indignant. Is it? Who told you? Was it one of your German brothers-in-law? Augustus. Injured, remonstrating. I have only three German brothers-in-law, madam. Really, from your tone, one would suppose that I had several. Pardon my sensitiveness on that subject. But reports are continually being circulated that I have been shot as a traitor in the courtyard of the Ritz Hotel simply because I have German brothers-in-law. With feeling. If you had a German brother-in-law, madam, you would know that nothing else in the world produces so strong an anti-German feeling. Life affords no keener pleasure than finding a brother-in-law's name in the German casualty list. The lady. Nobody knows that better than I. Wait until you hear what I have come to tell you, you will understand me as no one else could. Listen. This spy, this woman. Augustus. All attention. Yes? The lady. She is a German. A Hun. Augustus. Yes, yes. She would be. Continue. The lady. She is my sister-in-law. Augustus. Deferentially. I see you are well connected, madam. Proceed. The lady. Need I add that she is my bitterest enemy? Augustus. May I, he proffers his hand. They shake, fervently. From this moment onward Augustus becomes more and more confidential, gallant, and charming. The lady. Quite so. Well, she is an intimate friend of your brother at the war office, Hungerford Highcastle, Blue Lou as you call him, I don't know why. Augustus. Explaining. He was originally called the Singing Oyster, because he sang drawing-room ballads with such an extraordinary absence of expression. He was then called the Blue Point for a season or two. Finally he became Blue Lou. The Lady. Oh, indeed, I didn't know. Well, Blue Lou is simply infatuated with my sister-in-law, 
and he has rashly let out to her that this list is in your possession. He forgot himself because he was in a towering rage at its being entrusted to you, his language was terrible. He ordered all the guns to be shifted at once. Augustus. What on earth did he do that for? The lady. I can't imagine. But this I know. She made a bet with him that she would come down here and obtain possession of that list and get clean away into the street with it. He took the bet on condition that she brought it straight back to him at the war office. Augustus. Good heavens. And you mean to tell me that Blue Lou was such a dolt as to believe that she could succeed? Does he take me for a fool? The lady. Oh, impossible. He is jealous of your intellect. The bet is an insult to you, don't you feel that? After what you have done for our country. Augustus. Oh, never mind that. It is the idiocy of the thing I look at. He'll lose his bet. And serve him right. The lady. You feel sure you will be able to resist the siren? I warn you, she is very fascinating. Augustus. You need have no fear, madam. I hope she will come and try it on. Fascination is a game that two can play at. For centuries the younger sons of the high castles have had nothing to do but fascinate attractive females when they were not sitting on royal commissions or on duty at Knightsbridge Barracks. By gad, madam, if the siren comes here she will meet her match. The lady. I feel that. But if she fails to seduce you. Augustus. Blushing. Madam. The lady. Continuing. From your allegiance. Augustus. Oh, that. The lady. She will resort to fraud, to force, to anything. She will burgle your office, she will have you attacked and garret at night in the street. Augustus. Pooh. I'm not afraid. The lady. Oh, your courage will only tempt you into danger. She may get the list after all. It is true that the guns are moved. But she would win her bet. Augustus. Cautiously. You did not say that the guns were moved. You said that Blue Lou had ordered them to be moved. The lady. Well, that is the same thing, isn't it? Augustus. Not quite, at the war office. No doubt those guns will be moved, possibly even before the end of the war. The lady. Then you think they are there still. But if the German war office gets the list, and she will copy it before she gives it back to Blue Lou, you may depend on it, all is lost. Augustus. Lazily. Well, I should not go as far as that. Lowering his voice. Will you swear to me not to repeat what I am going to say to you, for if the British public knew that I had said it, I should be at once hounded down as a pro German. The lady. I will be silent as the grave. I swear it. Augustus. Again taking it easily. Well, our people have for some reason made up their minds that the German war office is everything that our war office is not, that it carries promptitude, efficiency. An organization to a pitch of completeness and perfection that must be, in my opinion, destructive to the happiness of the staff. My own view which you are pledged, remember, not to betray, is that the German war office is no better than any other war office. I found that opinion on my observation of the characters of my brothers-in-law, one of whom, by the way, is on the German general staff. I am not at all sure that this list of gun emplacements would receive the smallest attention. You see, there are always so many more important things to be attended to. Family matters, and so on, you understand. The lady. Still, if a question were asked in the House of Commons. Augustus. The great advantage of being at war, madam, is that nobody takes the slightest notice of the House of Commons. No doubt it is sometimes necessary for a minister to soothe the more seditious members of that assembly by giving a pledge or two, but the war office takes no notice of such things. The lady. Staring at him. 
then you think this list of gun emplacements doesn't matter. Augustus. By no means, madam. It matters very much indeed. If this spy were to obtain possession of the list, Blue Lou would tell the story at every dinner table in London, and the lady. And you might lose your post. Of course. Augustus. Amazed and indignant. I lose my post. What are you dreaming about, madam? How could I possibly be spared? There are hardly high castles enough at present to fill half the posts created by this war. No, Blue Lou would not go that far. He is at least a gentleman. But I should be chaffed. And, frankly, I don't like being chaffed. The lady. Of course not. Who does? It would never do. Oh never, never. Augustus. I'm glad you see it in that light. And now, as a measure of security, I shall put that list in my pocket. He begins searching vainly from drawer to drawer in the writing table. Where on earth? What the dickens did I? That's very odd, I, where the deuce? I thought I had put it in the, oh, here it is. No, this is Lucy's last letter. The lady. Elegiac ally. Lucy's last letter. What a title for a picture play. Augustus. Delighted. Yes, it is, isn't it? Lucy appeals to the imagination like no other woman. By the way handing over the letter I wonder could you read it for me? Lucy is a darling girl. But I really can't read her writing. In London I get the office typist to decipher it and make me a typed copy, but here there is nobody. The lady. Puzzling over it. It is really almost illegible. I think the beginning is meant for, dearest Gus. Augustus. Eagerly. Yes, that is what she usually calls me. Please go on. The lady. Trying to decipher it. What a, what a, oh yes, what a forgetful old, something, you are. I can't make out the word. Augustus. Greatly interested. Is it blighter? That is a favorite expression of hers. The lady. I think so. At all events it begins with A. B. reading. What a forgetful old, she is interrupted by a knock at the door. Augustus. Impatiently. Come in. The clerk enters, clean-shaven and in khaki, with an official paper and an envelope in his hand. What is this ridiculous mummery, sir? The clerk. Coming to the table and exhibiting his uniform to both. They've passed me. The recruiting officer come for me. I've had my two and seven. Augustus. Rising wrathfully. I shall not permit it. What do they mean by taking my office staff? Good God. They will be taking our hunt servants next. Confronting the clerk. What did the man mean? What did he say? The clerk. He said that now you was on the job we'd want another million men, and he was going to take the old age pensioners or anyone he could get. Augustus. And did you dare to knock at my door and interrupt my business with this lady to repeat this man's ineptitudes? The clerk. No. I come because the waiter from the hotel brought this paper. You left it on the coffee room breakfast table this morning. The lady. Intercepting it. It is the list. Good heavens. The clerk. Proffering the envelope. He says he thinks this is the envelope belonging to it. The lady. Snatching the envelope also. Yes. Addressed to you, Lord Augustus. Augustus comes back to the table to look at it. Oh, how imprudent. Everybody would guess its importance with your name on it. Fortunately I have some letters of my own here. Opening her wallet. Why not hide it in one of my envelopes? Then no one will dream that the enclosure is of any political value. Taking out a letter, she crosses the room towards the window, 
whispering to Augustus as she passes him. Get rid of that man. Augustus. Haughtily approaching the clerk, who humorously makes a paralytic attempt to stand at attention. Have you any further business here, pray? The clerk. Am I to give the waiter anything, or will you do it yourself? Augustus. Which waiter is it? The English one? The clerk. No, the one that calls himself a Swiss. Shouldn't wonder if he'd made a copy of that paper. Augustus. Keep your impertinent surmises to yourself, sir. Remember that you are in the army now. And let me have no more of your civilian insubordination. Attention. Left turn. Quick march. The clerk. Stolidly. I dunno what you mean. Augustus. Go to the guardroom and report yourself for disobeying orders. Now do you know what I mean? The clerk. Now look here. I ain't going to argue with you. Augustus. Nor I with you. Out with you. He seizes the clerk, and rushes him through the door. The moment the lady is left alone, she snatches a sheet of official paper from the stationary rack, folds it so that it resembles the list. Compares the two to see that they look exactly alike, whips the list into her wallet, and substitutes the facsimile for it. Then she listens for the return of Augustus. A crash is heard, as of the clerk falling downstairs. Augustus returns and is about to close the door when the voice of the clerk is heard from below. The clerk. I'll have the law of you for this, I will. Augustus. Shouting down to him. There's no more law for you, you scoundrel. You're a soldier now. He shuts the door and comes to the lady. Thank heaven, the war has given us the upper hand of these fellows at last. Excuse my violence. But discipline is absolutely necessary in dealing with the lower middle classes. The lady. Serve the insolent creature right. Look. I have found you a beautiful envelope for the list, an unmistakable lady's envelope. She puts the sham list into her envelope and hands it to him. Augustus. Excellent. Really very clever of you. Slyly. Come, would you like to have a peep at the list? Beginning to take the blank paper from the envelope. The lady. On the brink of detection. No no. Oh, please, no. Augustus. Why? It won't bite you. Drawing it out further. The lady. Snatching at his hand. Stop. Remember, if there should be an inquiry, you must be able to swear that you never showed that list to a mortal soul. Augustus. Oh, that is a mere form. If you are really curious. The lady. I am not. I couldn't bear to look at it. One of my dearest friends was blown to pieces by an aircraft gun. And since then I have never been able to think of one without horror. Augustus. You mean it was a real gun, and actually went off. How sad. How sad. He pushes the sham list back into the envelope, and pockets it. The lady. Ah. Great sigh of relief. And now, Lord Augustus, I have taken up too much of your valuable time. Goodbye. Augustus. What? Must you go? The lady. You are so busy. Augustus. Yes, but not before lunch, you know. I never can do much before lunch. And I'm no good at all in the afternoon. From five to six is my real working time. Must you really go? The lady. I must, really. I have done my business very satisfactorily. Thank you ever so much. She proffers her hand. Augustus. Shaking it affectionately as he leads her to the door, but first pressing the bell button with his left hand. Goodbye. Goodbye. So sorry to lose you. Kind of you to come. But there was no real danger. 
You see, my dear little lady, all this talk about war saving, and secrecy, and keeping the blinds down at night, and so forth, is all very well. But unless it's carried out with intelligence, believe me, you may waste a pound to save a penny, you may let out all sorts of secrets to the enemy. You may guide the zeppelins right on to your own chimneys. That's where the ability of the governing class comes in. Shall the fellow call a taxi for you? The lady. No, thanks, I prefer walking. Goodbye. Again, many, many thanks. She goes out. Augustus returns to the writing table smiling, and takes another look at himself in the mirror. The clerk returns, with his head bandaged, carrying a poker. The clerk. What did you ring for? Augustus hastily drops the mirror. Don't you come nigh me or I'll split your head with this poker, thick as it is. Augustus. It does not seem to me an exceptionally thick poker. I rang for you to show the lady out. The clerk. She's gone. She run out like a rabbit. I ask myself why was she in such a hurry. The lady's voice. From the street. Lord Augustus. Lord Augustus. The clerk. She's calling you. Augustus. Running to the window and throwing it up. What is it? Won't you come up? The lady. Is the clerk there? Augustus. Yes. Do you want him? The lady. Yes. Augustus. The lady wants you at the window. The clerk. Rushing to the window and putting down the poker. Yes, ma'am. Here I am, ma'am. What is it, ma'am? The lady. I want you to witness that I got clean away into the street. I am coming up now. The two men stare at one another. The clerk. Wants me to witness that she got clean away into the street. Augustus. What on earth does she mean? The lady returns. The lady. May I use your telephone? Augustus. Certainly. Certainly. Taking the receiver down. What number shall I get you? The lady. The war office, please. Augustus. The war office. The lady. If you will be so good. Augustus. But, oh, very well. Into the receiver. Hello. This is the town hall recruiting office. Give me Colonel Bogey, sharp. A pause. The clerk. Breaking the painful silence. I don't think I'm awake. This is a dream of a movie picture, this is. Augustus. His ear at the receiver. Shut up, will you? Into the telephone. What? To the lady. Whom do you want to get on to? The lady. Blue Lou. Augustus. Into the telephone. Put me through to Lord Hungerford Highcastle. I'm his brother, idiot. That you, Blue Lou? Lady here at Little Pifflington wants to speak to you. Hold the line. To the lady. Now, madam. He hands her the receiver. The lady. Sitting down in Augustus's chair to speak into the telephone. Is that Blue Lou? Do you recognize my voice? I've won our bet. Augustus. Your bet. The lady. Into the telephone. Yes, I have the list in my wallet. Augustus. Nothing of the kind, madam. I have it here in my pocket. He takes the envelope from his pocket, draws out the paper, and unfolds it. The lady. Continuing. Yes, I got clean into the street with it. I have a witness. I could have got to London with it. Augustus won't deny it. Augustus. Contemplating the blank paper. There's nothing written on this. Where is the list of guns? The lady. Continuing. 
Oh, it was quite easy. I said I was my sister-in-law and that I was a hun. He lapped it up like a kitten. Augustus. You don't mean to say that. The lady. Continuing. I got hold of the list for a moment and changed it for a piece of paper out of his stationary rack, it was quite easy. She laughs, and it is clear that Blue Lou is laughing too. Augustus. What? The clerk. Laughing slowly and laboriously, with intense enjoyment. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ha. Augustus rushes at him, he snatches up the poker and stands on guard. No you don't. The lady. Still at the telephone, waving her disengaged hand behind her impatiently at them to stop making a noise. SHSHSHSHSH. Augustus, with a shrug, goes up the middle of the room. The lady resumes her conversation with the telephone. What? Oh yes, I'm coming up by the 12.35, why not have tea with me at Rumpelmeister's? Rumpelmeister's. You know, they call it Robinson's now. Right. Ta-ta. She hangs up the receiver, and is passing round the table on her way towards the door when she is confronted by Augustus. Augustus. Madam, I consider your conduct most unpatriotic. You make bets and abuse the confidence of the hard-worked officials who are doing their bit for their country whilst our gallant fellows are perishing in the trenches. The lady. Oh. The gallant fellows are not all in the trenches, Augustus. Some of them have come home for a few days' hard-earned leave, and I am sure you won't grudge them a little fun at your expense. The clerk. Here. Here. Augustus. Amiably. Ah, well. For my country's sake. O'Flaherty V.C. A recruiting pamphlet. Preface. It may surprise some people to learn that in 1915 this little play was a recruiting poster in disguise. The British officer seldom likes Irish soldiers. But he always tries to have a certain proportion of them in his battalion because. Partly from a want of common sense which leads them to value their lives less than Englishmen do, lives are really less worth living in a poor country. And partly because even the most cowardly Irishman feels obliged to outdo an Englishman in bravery if possible, and at least to set a perilous pace for him. Irish soldiers give impetus to those military operations which require for their spirited execution more devilment than prudence. Unfortunately, Irish recruiting was badly bungled in 1915. The Irish were for the most part Roman Catholics and loyal Irishmen, which means that from the English point of view they were heretics and rebels. But they were willing enough to go soldiering on the side of France and see the world outside Ireland, which is a dull place to live in. It was quite easy to enlist them by approaching them from their own point of view. But the War Office insisted on approaching them from the point of view of Dublin Castle. They were discouraged and repulsed by refusals to give commissions to Roman Catholic officers, or to allow distinct Irish units to be formed. To attract them, the walls were covered with placards headed Remember Belgium. The folly of asking an Irishman to remember anything when you want him to fight for England was apparent to everyone outside the castle, forget and forgive would have been more to the point. Remembering Belgium and its broken treaty led Irishmen to remember Limerick and its broken treaty. And the recruiting ended in a rebellion, in suppressing which the British artillery quite unnecessarily reduced the centre of Dublin to ruins. And the British commanders killed their leading prisoners of war in cold blood morning after morning with an effect of long-drawn-out ferocity. Really it was only the usual childish petulance in which John Bold does things in a week that disgrace him for a century, though he soon recovers his good humor. And cannot understand why the survivors of his wrath do not feel as jolly with him as he does with them. On the smoldering ruins of Dublin the appeals to remember Louvain were presently supplemented by a fresh appeal. Irishmen, do you wish to have the horrors of war brought to your own hearts and homes? Dublin laughed sourly. As for me, I addressed myself quite simply to the business of obtaining recruits. 
I knew by personal experience and observation what anyone might have inferred from the records of Irish emigration. That all an Irishman's hopes and ambitions turn on his opportunities of getting out of Ireland. Stimulate his loyalty, and he will stay in Ireland and die for her. For, incomprehensible as it seems to an Englishman, Irish patriotism does not take the form of devotion to England and England's king. Appeal to his discontent, his deadly boredom, his thwarted curiosity and desire for change and adventure, and, to escape from Ireland, he will go abroad to risk his life for France. For the Papal States, for secession in America, and even, if no better may be, for England. Knowing that the ignorance and insularity of the Irishman is a danger to himself and to his neighbors. I had no scruple in making that appeal when there was something for him to fight which the whole world had to fight unless it meant to come under the jackboot of the German version of Dublin Castle. There was another consideration, unmentionable by the recruiting sergeants and war orators, which must nevertheless have helped them powerfully in procuring soldiers by voluntary enlistment. The happy home of the idealist may become common under millennial conditions. It is not common at present. No one will ever know how many men joined the army in 1914 and 1915 to escape from tyrants and taskmasters, termagants and shrews. None of whom are any the less irksome when they happen by ill luck to be also our fathers, our mothers, our wives and our children. Even at their amiablest, a holiday from them may be a tempting change for all parties. That is why I did not endow a Flaherty V.C. With an ideal Irish Colleen for his sweetheart, and gave him for his mother a volumnia of the potato patch rather than a affectionate parent from whom he could not so easily have torn himself away. I need hardly say that a play thus carefully adapted to its purpose was voted utterly inadmissible. And in due course the British government, frightened out of its wits for the moment by the rout of the Fifth Army, ordained Irish conscription, and then did not dare to go through with it. I still think my own line was the more businesslike. But during the war everyone except the soldiers at the front imagined that nothing but an extreme assertion of our most passionate prejudices, without the smallest regard to their effect on others, could win the war. Finally the British blockade won the war but the wonder is that the British blockhead did not lose it. I suppose the enemy was no wiser. War is not a sharpener of wits. And I am afraid I gave great offence by keeping my head in this matter of Irish recruiting. What can I do but apologise, and publish the play now that it can no longer do any good? Dramatis Personi. Private Dennis O'Flaherty V.C. Sir Pierce Madigan. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Teresa Driscoll, a parlor maid. A laborer's voice, off stage. O'Flaherty V.C. At the door of an Irish country house in a park. Fine summer weather, the summer of 1915. The porch, painted white, projects into the drive, but the door is at the side and the front has a window. The porch faces east, and the door is in the north side of it. On the south side is a tree in which a thrush is singing. Under the window is a garden seat with an iron chair at each end of it. The last four bars of God Save the King are heard in the distance, followed by three cheers. Then the band strikes up, it's a long way to Tipperary, and recedes until it is out of hearing. Private O'Flaherty V.C. Comes wearily southward along the drive, and falls exhausted into the garden seat. The thrush utters a note of alarm and flies away. The tramp of a horse is heard. A gentleman's voice. Tim. Hi. Tim. He is heard dismounting. A laborer's voice. Yes, your honor. The gentleman's voice. Take this horse to the stables, will you? A laborer's voice. Right, your honor. Yup there. Guan now. Guan. The horse is led away. General Sir Pierce Madigan, an elderly baronet in khaki, beaming with enthusiasm, arrives. O'Flaherty rises and stands at attention. Sir Pierce. No, no, O'Flaherty, none of that now. You're off duty. 
Remember that though I am a general of forty years' service, that little cross of yours gives you a higher rank in the role of glory than I can pretend to. Oh, Flaherty. Relaxing. I'm thankful to you, Sir Pierce, but I wouldn't have anyone think that the baronet of my native place would let a common soldier like me sit down in his presence without leave. Sir Pierce. Well, you're not a common soldier, O'Flaherty, you're a very uncommon one, and I'm proud to have you for my guest here today. O'Flaherty. Sure I know, sir. You have to put up with a lot from the like of me for the sake of the recruiting. All the quality shakes hands with me and says they're proud to know me, just the way the king said when he pinned the cross on me. And it's as true as I'm standing here, sir, the queen said to me, I hear you were born on the estate of General Madigan, she says. And the general himself tells me you were always a fine young fellow. Bedad, ma'am, I says to her, if the general knew all the rabbits I snared on him, and all the salmon I snatched on him, and all the cows I milked on him. He'd think me the finest ornament for the county jail he ever sent there for poaching. Sir Pierce. Laughing. You're welcome to them all, my lad. Come. He makes him sit down again on the garden seat. Sit down and enjoy your holiday. He sits down on one of the iron chairs, the one at the doorless side of the porch. Oh Flaherty. Holiday, is it? I'd give five shillings to be back in the trenches for the sake of a little rest and quiet. I never knew what hard work was till I took to recruiting. What with the standing on my legs all day, and the shaking hands, and the making speeches, and, what's worse, the listening to them and the calling for cheers for king and country. And the saluting the flag till I'm stiff with it, and the listening to them playing God Save the King, and Tipperary and the trying to make my eyes look moist like a man in a picture book. I'm that bet that I hardly get a wink of sleep. I give you my word, Sir Pierce, that I never heard the tune of Tipperary in my life till I came back from Flanders. And already it's drove me to that pitch of tiredness of it that when a poor little innocent slip of a boy in the street the other night drew himself up and saluted and began whistling it at me. I clout his head for him, God forgive me. Sir Pierce. Soothingly. Yes, yes, I know. I know. One does get fed up with it, I've been dog-tired myself on parade many a time. But still, you know, there's a gratifying side to it, too. After all, he is our king, and it's our own country, isn't it? Oh Flaherty. Well, sir, to you that have an estate in it, it would feel like your country but the divil a perch of it ever I owned. And as to the king, God help him, my mother would have taken the skin off my back if I'd ever let on to have any other king than Parnell. Sir Pierce. Rising, painfully shocked. Your mother. What are you dreaming about, O'Flaherty? A most loyal woman. Always most loyal. Whenever there is an illness in the royal family, she asks me every time we meet about the health of the patient as anxiously as if it were yourself, her only son. Oh Flaherty. Well, she's my mother, and I won't utter a word egg in her. But I'm not saying a word of lie when I tell you that that old woman is the biggest cannot from here to the cross of Monaster Boyce. Sure she's the wildest Fenian and rebel, and always has been, that ever taught a poor innocent lad like myself to pray night and morning to St. Patrick to clear the English out of Ireland the same as he cleared the snakes. You'll be surprised at my telling you that now, maybe, Sir Pierce? Sir Pierce. Unable to keep still, walking away from O'Flaherty. Surprised. I'm more than surprised, O'Flaherty. I'm overwhelmed. Turning and facing him. Are you, are you joking? O'Flaherty. If you'd been brought up by my mother, Sir, you'd know better than to joke about her. What I'm telling you is the truth. And I wouldn't tell it to you if I could see my way to get out of the fix I'll be in when my mother comes here this day to see her boy in his glory. And she after thinking all the time it was against the English I was fighting. Sir Pierce. Do you mean to say you told her such a monstrous falsehood as that you were fighting in the German army? O'Flaherty. 
I never told her one word that wasn't the truth and nothing but the truth. I told her I was going to fight for the French and for the Russians. And sure who ever heard of the French or the Russians doing anything to the English but fighting them? That was how it was, sir. And sure the poor woman kissed me and went about the house singing in her old cracky voice that the French was on the sea, and they'd be here without delay, and the orange will decay. Says the Sean Van Vocht. Sir Pierce. Sitting down again, exhausted by his feelings. Well, I never could have believed this. Never. What do you suppose will happen when she finds out? Oh Flaherty. She mustn't find out. It's not that she'd half kill me, as big as I am and as brave as I am. It's that I'm fond of her, and can't bring myself to break the heart in her. You may think it queer that a man should be fond of his mother, sir, and she having bet him from the time he could feel to the time she was too slow to catch him, but I'm fond of her. And I'm not ashamed of it. Besides, didn't she win the cross for me? Sir Pierce. Your mother. How? Oh Flaherty. By bringing me up to be more afraid of running away than of fighting. I was timid by nature, and when the other boys herded me, I'd want to run away and cry. But she wailed me for disgracing the blood of the O'Flaherty's until I'd have fought the devil himself sooner than face her after funking a fight. That was how I got to know that fighting was easier than it looked, and that the others was as much afeard of me as I was of them. And that if I only held out long enough they'd lose heart and give rip. That's the way I came to be so courageous. I tell you, Sir Pierce, if the German army had been brought up by my mother, the Kaiser would be dining in the banqueting hall at Buckingham Palace this day. And King George polishing his jackboots for him in the scullery. Sir Pierce. But I don't like this, O'Flaherty. You can't go on deceiving your mother, you know. It's not right. O'Flaherty. Can't go on deceiving her, can't I? It's little you know what a son's love can do, sir. Did you ever notice what a ready liar I am? Sir Pierce. Well, in recruiting a man gets carried away. I stretch it a bit occasionally myself. After all, it's for king and country. But if you won't mind my saying it, O'Flaherty. I think that story about your fighting the Kaiser and the twelve giants of the Prussian guard single-handed would be the better for a little toning down. I don't ask you to drop it, you know, for it's popular, undoubtedly, but still, the truth is the truth. Don't you think it would fetch in almost as many recruits if you reduced the number of guardsmen to six? Oh Flaherty. You're not used to telling lies like I am, sir. I got great practice at home with my mother. What with saving my skin when I was young and thoughtless, and sparing her feelings when I was old enough to understand them, I've hardly told my mother the truth twice a year since I was born. And would you have me turn round on her and tell it now, when she's looking to have some peace and quiet in her old age? Sir Pierce. Troubled in his conscience. Well, it's not my affair, of course, O'Flaherty. But hadn't you better talk to Father Quinlan about it? Oh Flaherty. Talk to Father Quinlan, is it? Do you know what Father Quinlan says to me this very morning? Sir Pierce. Oh, you've seen him already, have you? What did he say? Oh Flaherty. He says, you know, don't you, he says, that it's your duty, as a Christian and a good son of the Holy Church, to love your enemies, he says. I know it's my duty as a soldier to kill them, I says. That's right, Dinny, he says, quite right. But, says he, you can kill them and do them a good turn afterward to show your love for them, he says. And it's your duty to have a mass said for the souls of the hundreds of Germans you say you killed, says he, for many and many of them were Bavarians and good Catholics, he says. Is it me that must pay for masses for the souls of the Boches? I says. Let the King of England pay for them, I says for it was his quarrel and not mine. Sir Pierce. Warmly. It is the quarrel of every honest man and true patriot, O'Flaherty. Your mother must see that as clearly as I do. After all, she is a reasonable, well-disposed woman, 
quite capable of understanding the right and the wrong of the war. Why can't you explain to her what the war is about? Oh, Flaherty. Ara, sir, how the devil do I know what the war is about? Sir Pierce. Rising again and standing over him. What? Oh, Flaherty, do you know what you are saying? You sit there wearing the Victoria Cross for having killed God and knows how many Germans, and you tell me you don't know why you did it. Oh, Flaherty. Asking your pardon, Sir Pierce, I tell you no such thing. I know quite well why I killed them. I killed them because I was afeard that, if I didn't, they'd kill me. Sir Pierce. Giving it up, and sitting down again. Yes, yes, of course, but have you no knowledge of the causes of the war? Of the interests at stake? Of the importance, I may almost say, in fact I will say, the sacred right for which we are fighting? Don't you read the papers? Oh Flaherty. I do when I can get them. There's not many newsboys crying the evening paper in the trenches. They do say, Sir Pierce, that we shall never beat the Boches until we make Horatio Bottomley Lord Lieutenant of England. Do you think that's true, sir? Sir Pierce. Rubbish, man. There's no Lord Lieutenant in England, the King is Lord Lieutenant. It's a simple question of patriotism. Does patriotism mean nothing to you? Oh Flaherty. It means different to me than what it would to you, sir. It means England and England's king to you. To me and the like of me, it means talking about the English just the way the English papers talk about the Boches. And what good has it ever done here in Ireland? It's kept me ignorant because it filled up my mother's mind, and she thought it ought to fill up mine too. It's kept Ireland poor. Because instead of trying to better ourselves we thought we was the fine fellows of patriots when we were speaking evil of Englishmen that was as poor as ourselves and maybe as good as ourselves. The Boches I kilt was more knowledgeable men than me, and what better am I now that I've kilt them? What better is anybody? Sir Pierce. Huffed, turning a cold shoulder to him. I am sorry the terrible experience of this war, the greatest war ever fought, has taught you no better, O'Flaherty. O'Flaherty. Preserving his dignity. I don't know about its being a great war, sir. It's a big war, but that's not the same thing. Father Quinlan's new church is a big church, you might take the little old chapel out of the middle of it and not miss it. But my mother says there was more true religion in the old chapel. And the war has taught me that maybe she was right. Sir Pierce. Grunts sulkily. Oh Flaherty. Respectfully but doggedly. And there's another thing it's taught me too, sir, that concerns you and me, if I may make bold to tell it to you. Sir Pierce. Still sulky. I hope it's nothing you oughtn't to say to me, O oh Flaherty. O oh Flaherty. It's this, sir, that I'm able to sit here now and talk to you without humbugging you. And that's what not one of your tenants or your tenants' childer ever did to you before in all your long life. It's a true respect I'm showing you at last, sir. Maybe you'd rather have me humbug you and tell you lies as I used, just as the boys here, God help them, would rather have me tell them how I fought the Kaiser. That all the world knows I never saw in my life, than tell them the truth. But I can't take advantage of you the way I used, not even if I seem to be wanting in respect to you and cocked up by winning the cross. Sir Pierce. Touched. Not at all, O'Flaherty. Not at all. O'Flaherty. Sure what's the cross to me, barring the little pension it carries? Do you think I don't know that there's hundreds of men as brave as me that never had the luck to get anything for their bravery but a curse from the sergeant? And the blame for the faults of them that ought to have been their betters? I've learnt more than you'd think, sir. For how would a gentleman like you know what a poor ignorant conceited creature I was when I went from here into the wide world as a soldier? What use is all the lying, and pretending, and humbugging, and letting on, when the day comes to you that your comrade is killed in the trench beside you. And you don't as much as look round at him until you trip over his poor body, 
and then all you say is to ask why the hell the stretcher bearers don't take it out of the way. Why should I read the papers to be humbugged and lied to by them that had the cunning to stay at home and send me to fight for them? Don't talk to me or to any soldier of the war being right. No war is right, and all the holy water that Father Quinlan ever blessed couldn't make one right. There, sir. Now you know what O'Flaherty V.C. thinks. And you're wiser so than the others that only knows what he done. Sir Pierce. Making the best of it, and turning good-humouredly to him again. Well, what you did was brave and manly, anyhow. O'Flaherty. God knows whether it was or not, better than you nor me, General. I hope he won't be too hard on me for it, anyhow. Sir Pierce. Sympathetically. Oh yes, we all have to think seriously sometimes, especially when we're a little run down. I'm afraid we've been overworking you a bit over these recruiting meetings. However, we can knock off for the rest of the day, and tomorrow's Sunday. I've had about as much as I can stand myself. He looks at his watch. It's tea time. I wonder what's keeping your mother. O'Flaherty. It's nicely cocked up the old woman will be, having tea at the same table as you, sir, instead of in the kitchen. She'll be after dressing in the height of grandeur. And stop she will at every house on the way to show herself off and tell them where she's going, and fill the whole parish with spite and envy. But sure, she shouldn't keep you waiting, sir. Sir Pierce. Oh, that's all right, she must be indulged on an occasion like this. I'm sorry my wife is in London, she'd have been glad to welcome your mother. O'Flaherty. Sure, I know she would, sir. She was always a kind friend to the poor. Little her ladyship knew, God help her, the depth of divilment that was in us, we were like a play to her. You see, sir, she was English, that was how it was. We was to her what the Patans and Senegalese was to me when I first seen them, I couldn't think, somehow, that they were liars, and thieves, and backbiters, and drunkards. Just like ourselves or any other Christians. Oh, her ladyship never knew all that was going on behind her back, how would she? When I was a wee shy child, she gave me the first penny I ever had in my hand. And I wanted to pray for her conversion that night the same as my mother made me pray for yours, Anne. Sir Pierce. Scandalized. Do you mean to say that your mother made you pray for my conversion? O'Flaherty. Sure and she wouldn't want to see a gentleman like you going to hell after she nursing your own son and bringing up my sister Annie on the bottle. That was how it was, sir. She'd rob you, and she'd lie to you. And she'd call down all the blessings of God on your head when she was selling you your own three geese that you thought had been ate by the fox the day after you'd finished fattening them, sir. And all the time you were like a bit of her own flesh and blood to her. Often has she said she'd live to see you a good Catholic yet, leading victorious armies against the English and wearing the collar of gold that Malachi won from the proud invader. Oh, she's the romantic woman is my mother, and no mistake. Sir Pierce. In great perturbation. I really can't believe this, O'Flaherty. I could have sworn your mother was as honest a woman as ever breathed. O'Flaherty. And so she is, sir. She's as honest as the day. Sir Pierce. Do you call it honest to steal my geese? O'Flaherty. She didn't steal them, sir. It was me that stole them. Sir Pierce. Oh. And why the devil did you steal them? O'Flaherty. Sure we needed them, sir. Often and often we had to sell our own geese to pay you the rent to satisfy your needs, and why shouldn't we sell your geese to satisfy ours? Sir Pierce. Well, damn me. O'Flaherty. Sweetly. Sure you had to get what you could out of us, and we had to get what we could out of you. God forgive us both. Sir Pierce. Really, O'Flaherty, the war seems to have upset you a little. O'Flaherty. It set me thinking, sir, and I'm not used to it. It's like the patriotism of the English. 
They never thought of being patriotic until the war broke out. And now the patriotism has took them so sudden and come so strange to them that they run about like frightened chickens, uttering all manner of nonsense. But please God they'll forget all about it when the war's over. They're getting tired of it already. Sir Pierce. No, no, it has uplifted us all in a wonderful way. The world will never be the same again, O'Flaherty. Not after a war like this. O'Flaherty. So they all say, sir. I see no great differ myself. It's all the fright and the excitement. And when that quiets down they'll go back to their natural divilment and be the same as ever. It's like the vermin, it'll wash off after a while. Sir Pierce. Rising and planting himself firmly behind the garden seat. Well, the long and the short of it is, O'Flaherty, I must decline to be a party to any attempt to deceive your mother. I thoroughly disapprove of this feeling against the English, especially at a moment like the present. Even if your mother's political sympathies are really what you represent them to be, I should think that her gratitude to Gladstone ought to cure her of such disloyal prejudices. O'Flaherty. Over his shoulder. She says Gladstone was an Irishman, sir. What call would he have to meddle with Ireland as he did if he wasn't? Sir Pierce. What nonsense. Does she suppose Mr. Asquith is an Irishman? O'Flaherty. She won't give him any credit for home rule, sir. She says Redmond made him do it. She says you told her so. Sir Pierce. Convicted out of his own mouth. Well, I never meant her to take it up in that ridiculous way. He moves to the end of the garden seat on O'Flaherty's left. I'll give her a good talking to when she comes. I'm not going to stand any of her nonsense. O'Flaherty. It's not a bit of use, sir. She says all the English generals is Irish. She says all the English poets and great men was Irish. She says the English never knew how to read their own books until we taught them. She says we're the lost tribes of the house of Israel and the chosen people of God. She says that the goddess Venus, that was born out of the foam of the sea, came up out of the water in Killiney Bay off Bray Head. She says that Moses built the seven churches, and that Lazarus was buried in Glasnevin. Sir Pierce. Bosh. How does she know he was? Did you ever ask her? O'Flaherty. I did, sir, often. Sir Pierce. And what did she say? O'Flaherty. She asked me how did I know he wasn't, and fetched me a clout on the side of my head. Sir Pierce. But have you never mentioned any famous Englishman to her, and asked her what she had to say about him? O'Flaherty. The only one I could think of was Shakespeare, sir. And she says he was born in Cork. Sir Pierce. Exhausted. Well, I give it up. He throws himself into the nearest chair. The woman is, oh, well. No matter. O'Flaherty. Sympathetically. Yes, sir, she's pig headed and obstinate, there's no doubt about it. She's like the English, they think there's no one like themselves. It's the same with the Germans, though they're educated and ought to know better. You'll never have a quiet world till you knock the patriotism out of the human race. Sir Pierce. Still, we. O'Flaherty. Wished, sir, for God's sake, here she is. The general jumps up. Mrs. O'Flaherty arrives and comes between the two men. She is very clean, and carefully dressed in the old-fashioned peasant costume, black silk sunbonnet with a tiara of trimmings, and black cloak. O'Flaherty. Rising shyly. Good evening, mother. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Severely. You hold your wished, and learn behavior while I pay my duty to his honor. To Sir Pierce, heartily. And how is your honor's good self? And how is her ladyship and all the young ladies? Oh, it's right glad we are to see your honor back again and looking the picture of health. Sir Pierce. Forcing a note of extreme geniality. 
Thank you, Mrs. O'Flaherty. Well, you see we've brought you back your son safe and sound. I hope you're proud of him. Mrs. O'Flaherty. And indeed and I am, your honor. It's the brave boy he is. And why wouldn't he be, brought up on your honor's estate and with you before his eyes for a pattern of the finest soldier in Ireland? Come and kiss your old mother, Dinny Darlint. O'Flaherty does so sheepishly. That's my own darling boy. And look at your fine new uniform stained already with the eggs you've been eating and the porter you've been drinking. She takes out her handkerchief, spits on it, and scrubs his lapel with it. Oh, it's the untidy slovenly one you always were. There. It won't be seen on the khaki, it's not like the old red coat that would show up everything that dribbled down on it. To Sir Pierce. And they tell me down at the lodge that her ladyship is staying in London, and that Miss Agnes is to be married to a fine young nobleman. Oh. It's your honor that is the lucky and happy father. It will be bad news for many of the young gentlemen of the quality round here, sir. There's lots thought she was going to marry young Master Lawless. Sir Pierce. What? That, that, that bastun. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Hilariously. Let your honor alone for finding the right word. A big bastun he is indeed, your honor. Oh, to think of the times and times I have said that Miss Agnes would be my lady as her mother was before her. Didn't I, Dinny? Sir Pierce. And now, Mrs. O'Flaherty, I dare say you have a great deal to say to Dennis that doesn't concern me. I'll just go in and order tea. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Oh, why would your honor disturb yourself? Sure I can take the boy into the yard. Sir Pierce. Not at all. It won't disturb me in the least. And he's too big a boy to be taken into the yard now. He has made a front seat for himself. Eh. He goes into the house. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Sure he has that, your honor. God bless your honor. The general being now out of hearing, she turns threateningly to her son with one of those sudden Irish changes of manner which amaze and scandalize less flexible nations, and exclaims. And what do you mean, you lying young scald, by telling me you were going to fight Agin the English? Did you take me for a fool that couldn't find out, and the papers all full of you shaking hands with the English king at Buckingham Palace? O'Flaherty. Oh, I didn't shake hands with him, he shook hands with me. Could I turn on the man in his own house, before his own wife, with his money in my pocket and in yours, and throw his civility back in his face? Mrs. O'Flaherty. You would take the hand of a tyrant red with the blood of Ireland. O'Flaherty. Ara hold your nonsense, mother, he's not half the tyrant you are, God help him. His hand was cleaner than mine that had the blood of his own relations on it, maybe. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Threateningly. Is that a way to speak to your mother, you young spalpeen? O'Flaherty. Stoutly. It is so, if you won't talk sense to me. It's a nice thing for a poor boy to be made much of by kings and queens, and shook hands with by the height of his country's nobility in the capital cities of the world. And then to come home and be scolded and insulted by his own mother. I'll fight for who I like, and I'll shake hands with what kings I like, and if your own son is not good enough for you, you can go and look for another. Do you mind me now? Mrs. O'Flaherty. And was it the Belgians learned you such brazen impudence? O'Flaherty. The Belgians is good men. And the French ought to be more civil to them, let alone their being half murdered by the Boches. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Good men is it. Good men. To come over here when they were wounded because it was a Catholic country, and then to go to the Protestant church because it didn't cost them anything. And some of them to never go near a church at all. That's what you call good men. O'Flaherty. Oh, you're the mighty fine politician, aren't you? Much you know about Belgians or foreign parts or the world you're living in, God help you. Mrs. O'Flaherty. 
why wouldn't I know better than you? Amant I your mother? O oh, Flaherty! And if you are itself, how can you know what you never seen as well as me that was dug into the continent of Europe for six months? And was buried in the earth of it three times with the shells bursting on the top of me? I tell you I know what I'm about. I have my own reasons for taking part in this great conflict. I'd be ashamed to stay at home and not fight when everybody else is fighting. Mrs. O'Flaherty. If you wanted to fight, why couldn't you fight in the German army? O'Flaherty. Because they only get a penny a day. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Well, and if they do itself, isn't there the French army? O'Flaherty. They only get a ha'penny a day. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Much dashed. Oh murder. They must be a mean lot, Dinny. O'Flaherty. Sarcastic. Maybe you'd have me in the Turkish army, and worship the heathen Muhammad that put a corn in his ear and pretended it was a message from the heavens when the pigeon come to pick it out and eat it. I went where I could get the biggest allowance for you, and little thanks I get for it. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Allowance, is it? Do you know what the thieving blackguards did on me? They came to me and they says, Was your son a big eater? They says. Oh, he was that, says I, ten shillings a week wouldn't keep him. Sure I thought the more I said the more they'd give me. Then, says they, that's ten shillings a week off your allowance, they says, because you save that by the king feeding him. Indeed. Says I, I suppose if I'd six sons, you'd stop three pound a week from me, and make out that I ought to pay you money instead of you paying me. There's a fallacy in your argument, they says. O'Flaherty. A what? Mrs. O'Flaherty. A fallacy, that's the word he said. I says to him, it's a Pharisee I'm thinking you mean, sir. But you can keep your dirty money that your king grudges a poor old widow and please God the English will be got yet for the deadly sin of oppressing the poor. And with that I shut the door in his face. O oh, Flaherty! Furious! Do you tell me they knocked ten shillings off you for my keep? Mrs. O oh, Flaherty! Soothing him! No, darlint, they only knocked off half a crown. I put up with it because I've got the old age pension, and they know very well I'm only sixty-two so I've the better of them by half a crown a week anyhow. Oh Flaherty! It's a queer way of doing business. If they'd tell you straight out what they was going to give you, you wouldn't mind. But if there was twenty ways of telling the truth and only one way of telling a lie, the government would find it out. It's in the nature of governments to tell lies. Teresa Driscoll, a parlor maid, comes from the house. Teresa! You're to come up to the drawing room to have your tea, Mrs. O'Flaherty. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Mind you have a sup of good black tea for me in the kitchen afterwards, Akushla. That washy drawing room tea will give me the wind if I leave it on my stomach. She goes into the house, leaving the two young people alone together. O'Flaherty. Is that yourself, Tessie? And how are you? Teresa. Nicely, thank you. And how's yourself? Oh, Flaherty. Finally, thank God. He produces a gold chain. Look what I've brought you, Tessie. Teresa. Shrinking. Sure I don't like to touch it, Denny. Did you take it off a dead man? Oh, Flaherty. No, I took it off a live one and thankful he was to me to be alive and kept a prisoner in ease and comfort, and me left fighting in peril of my life. Teresa. Taking it. Do you think it's real gold, Denny? Oh Flaherty. It's real German gold, anyhow. Teresa. But German silver isn't real, Denny. Oh Flaherty. His face darkening. Well, it's the best the Bosch could do for me, anyhow. Teresa. Do you think I might take it to the jeweler next market day and ask him? Oh Flaherty. Sulkily. You may take it to the devil if you like. Teresa. 
you needn't lose your temper about it. I only thought I'd like to know. The nice fool I'd look if I went about showing off a chain that turned out to be only brass. Oh Flaherty. I think you might say thank you. Teresa. Do you? I think you might have said something more to me than, is that yourself? You couldn't say less to the postman. Oh Flaherty. His brow clearing. Oh, is that what's the matter? Here. Come and take the taste of the brass out of my mouth. He seizes her and kisses her. Teresa, without losing her Irish dignity, takes the kiss as appreciatively as a connoisseur might take a glass of wine, and sits down with him on the garden seat. Teresa. As he squeezes her waist. Thank God the priest can't see us here. Oh Flaherty. It's little they care for priests in France, Alana. Teresa. And what had the queen on her, Denny, when she spoke to you in the palace? Oh Flaherty. She had a bonnet on without any strings to it. And she had a plaquin of embroidery down her bosom. And she had her waist where it used to be, and not where the other ladies had it. And she had little brooches in her ears, though she hadn't half the jewelry of Mrs. Sullivan that keeps the pop shop in Drumpogue. And she dresses her hair down over her forehead, in a fringe like. And she has an Irish look about her eyebrows. And she didn't know what to say to me, poor woman. And I didn't know what to say to her, God help me. Teresa. You'll have a pension now with the cross, won't you, Denny? Oh Flaherty. Sixpence three farthings a day. Teresa. That isn't much. Oh Flaherty. I take out the rest in glory. Teresa. And if you're wounded, you'll have a wound pension, won't you? Oh Flaherty. I will, please God. Teresa. You're going out again, aren't you, Denny? Oh Flaherty. I can't help myself. I'd be shot for a deserter if I didn't go, and maybe I'll be shot by the Boshes if I do go, so between the two of them I'm nicely fixed up. Mrs. Oh Flaherty. Calling from within the house. Tessie. Tessie Darlint. Teresa. Disengaging herself from his arm and rising. I'm wanted for the tea table. You'll have a pension anyhow, Denny, won't you, whether you're wounded or not? Mrs. O'Flaherty. Come, child, come. Teresa. Impatiently. Oh, sure I'm coming. She tries to smile at Denny, not very convincingly, and hurries into the house. O'Flaherty. Alone. And if I do get a pension itself, the divil a penny of it you'll ever have the spending of. Mrs. O'Flaherty. As she comes from the porch. Oh, it's a shame for you to keep the girl from her duties, Dinny. You might get her into trouble. O'Flaherty. Much I care whether she gets into trouble or not. I pity the man that gets her into trouble. He'll get himself into worse. Mrs. O'Flaherty. What's that you tell me? Have you been falling out with her? and she a girl with a fortune of ten pounds? Oh Flaherty! Let her keep her fortune. I wouldn't touch her with the tongs if she had thousands and millions. Mrs. Oh Flaherty! Oh fie for shame, Dinny! Why would you say the like of that of a decent honest girl, and one of the Driscolls too? Oh Flaherty! Why wouldn't I say it? She's thinking of nothing but to get me out there again to be wounded so that she may spend my pension, bad scran to her. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Why, what's come over you, child, at all at all? O'Flaherty. Knowledge and wisdom has come over me with pain and fear and trouble. I've been made a fool of and imposed upon all my life. I thought that covetous shriel and there was a walking angel, and now if ever I marry at all I'll marry a Frenchwoman. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Fiercely. You'll not, so. And don't you dar repeat such a thing to me. O'Flaherty. Won't I, Faith? I've been as good as married to a couple of them already. Mrs. O'Flaherty. The Lord be praised, 
what wickedness have you been up to, you young blackguard? Oh flaherty! One of them French women would cook you a meal twice in the day and all days and every day that Sir Pierce himself might go begging through Ireland for, and never see the like of. I'll have a French wife, I tell you. And when I settle down to be a farmer I'll have a French farm, with a field as big as the continent of Europe that ten of your dirty little fields here wouldn't so much as fill the ditch of. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Furious. Then it's a French mother you may go look for, for I'm done with you. O'Flaherty. And it's no great loss you'd be if it wasn't for my natural feelings for you. For it's only a silly ignorant old countrywoman you are with all your fine talk about Ireland you that never stepped beyond the few acres of it you were born on. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Tottering to the garden seat and showing signs of breaking down. Dinny Darlint, why are you like this to me? What's happened to you? O'Flaherty. Gloomily. What's happened to everybody? That's what I want to know. What's happened to you that I thought all the world of and was afeard of? What's happened to Sir Pierce? that I thought was a great general, and that I now see to be no more fit to command an army than an old hen? What's happened to Tessie, that I was mad to marry a year ago, and that I wouldn't take now with all Ireland for her fortune? I tell you the world's creation is crumbling in ruins about me. And then you come and ask what's happened to me? Mrs. O'Flaherty. Giving way to wild grief. Acon. Acon. My son's turned egg in me. Oh, what'll I do at all at all? Oh. 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 Sir Pierce. Running out of the house. What's this infernal noise? What on earth is the matter? Oh, Flaherty. Ara hold your wished, mother. Don't you see his honor? Mrs. Oh, Flaherty. Oh, sir. I'm ruined and destroyed. Oh, won't you speak to Dinny, sir, I'm heart scalded with him. He wants to marry a French woman on me, and to go away and be a foreigner and desert his mother and betray his country. It's mad he is with the roaring of the cannons and he killing the Germans and the Germans killing him, bad cess to them. My boy is taken from me and turned egg in me. And who is to take care of me in my old age after all I've done for him, a cone? Acon. Oh, Flaherty. Hold your noise, I tell you. Who's going to leave you? I'm going to take you with me. There now, does that satisfy you? Mrs. O'Flaherty. Is it take me into a strange land among heathens and pagans and savages, and me not knowing a word of their language nor them of mine? Oh, Flaherty. A good job they don't, maybe they'll think you're talking sense. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Ask me to die out of Ireland, is it? And the angels not to find me when they come for me. O'Flaherty. And would you ask me to live in Ireland where I've been imposed on and kept in ignorance, and to die where the devil himself wouldn't take me as a gift, let alone the blessed angels? You can come or stay. You can take your old way or take my young way. But stick in this place I will not among a lot of good-for-nothing devils that'll not do a hand's turn but watch the grass growing and build up the stone wall where the cow walked through it. And Sir Horace Plunkett breaking his heart all the time telling them how they might put the land into decent tillage like the French and Belgians. Sir Pierce. Yes, he's quite right, you know, Mrs. O'Flaherty, quite right there. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Well, sir. Please God the war will last a long time yet. And maybe I'll die before it's over and the separation allowance stops. Oh Flaherty. That's all you care about. It's nothing but milch cows we men are for the women, with their separation allowances, ever since the war began, bad luck to them that made it. Teresa. Coming from the porch between the general and Mrs. O'Flaherty. Hannah sent me out for to tell you, sir that the tea will be black and the cake not fit to eat with the cold if yous all don't come at once. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Breaking out again. Oh, Tessie Darlint, what have you been saying to Dinny at all at all? Oh. Oh. 
Sir Pierce. Out of patience. You can't discuss that here. We shall have Tessie beginning now. O'Flaherty. That's right, sir, drive them in. Teresa. I haven't said a word to him. He. Sir Pierce. Hold your tongue, and go in and attend to your business at the tea table. Teresa. But am not I telling your honor that I never said a word to him? He gave me a beautiful gold chain. Here it is to show your honor that it's no lie I'm telling you. Sir Pierce. What's this, O'Flaherty? You've been looting some unfortunate officer. O'Flaherty. No, sir, I stole it from him of his own accord. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Wouldn't your honor tell him that his mother has the first call on it? What would a slip of a girl like that be doing with a gold chain round her neck? Teresa. Venomously. Anyhow, I have a neck to put it round and not a hank of wrinkles. At this unfortunate remark, Mrs. O'Flaherty bounds from her seat, and an appalling tempest of wordy wrath breaks out. The remonstrances and commands of the general, and the protests and menaces of O'Flaherty, only increase the hubbub. They are soon all speaking at once at the top of their voices. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Solo. You impudent young heifer, how dare you say such a thing to me? Teresa retorts furiously, the men interfere, and the solo becomes a quartet, fortissimo. Mrs. O'Flaherty. I've a good mind to clout your ears for you to teach you manners. Be ashamed of yourself, do, and learn to know who you're speaking to. That I mayn't sin. But I don't know what the good God was thinking about when he made the like of you. Let me not see you casting sheep's eyes at my son again. There never was an O'Flaherty yet that would demean himself by keeping company with a dirty Driscoll. And if I see you next or nigh my house I'll put you in the ditch with a flea in your ear, mind that now. Teresa. Is it me you offer such a name to, you foul-mouthed, dirty-minded, lying, slithering old sow, you? I wouldn't soil my tongue by calling you in your right name and telling Sir Pierce what's the common talk of the town about you. You and your O'Flaherty's. Setting yourself up agin the Driscolls that would never lower themselves to be seen in conversation with you at the fair. You can keep your ugly stingy lump of a son. For what is he but a common soldier? And God help the girl that gets him, say I. So the back of my hand to you, Mrs. O'Flaherty, and that the cat may tear your ugly old face. Sir Pierce. Silence. Tessie. Did you hear me ordering you to go into the house? Mrs. O'Flaherty. Louder. Mrs. O'Flaherty. Will you just listen to me one moment? Please. Furiously. Do you hear me speaking to you, woman? Are you human beings or are you wild beasts? Stop that noise immediately, do you hear? Yelling. Are you going to do what I order you, or are you not? Scandalous. Disgraceful. This comes of being too familiar with you. O'Flaherty, shove them into the house. Out with the whole damned pack of you. O'Flaherty. To the women. Here now, none of that, none of that. Go easy, I tell you. Hold your wished, mother, will you, or you'll be sorry for it after. To Teresa. Is that the way for a decent young girl to speak? Despairingly. Oh, for the Lord's sake, shut up, will yous? Have you no respect for yourselves or your betters? Peremptorily. Let me have no more of it, I tell you. Ach! The divils in the whole crew of you. In with you into the house this very minute and tear one another's eyes out in the kitchen if you like. In with you. The two men seize the two women, and push them, still violently abusing one another, into the house. Sir Pierce slams the door upon them savagely. Immediately a heavenly silence falls on the summer afternoon. The two sit down out of breath, and for a long time nothing is said. Sir Pierce sits on an iron chair. O'Flaherty sits on the garden seat. 
The thrush begins to sing melodiously. O'Flaherty cocks his ears, and looks up at it. A smile spreads over his troubled features. Sir Pierce, with a long sigh, takes out his pipe and begins to fill it. O'Flaherty. Idyllically. What a discontented sort of an animal a man is, sir. Only a month ago, I was in the quiet of the country out at the front, with not a sound except the birds and the bellow of a cow in the distance as it might be. And the shrapnel making little clouds in the heavens, and the shells whistling, and maybe a yell or two when one of us was hit. And would you believe it, sir, I complained of the noise and wanted to have a peaceful hour at home. Well, them too has taught me a lesson. This morning, sir, when I was telling the boys here how I was longing to be back taking my part for king and country with the others, I was lying, as you well knew, sir. Now I can go and say it with a clear conscience. Some likes war's alarms, and some likes home life. I've tried both, sir, and I'm for war's alarms now. I always was a quiet lad by natural disposition. Sir Pierce. Strictly between ourselves, O'Flaherty, and as one soldier to another O'Flaherty salutes, but without stiffening. Do you think we should have got an army without conscription if domestic life had been as happy as people say it is? O'Flaherty. Well, between you and me and the wall, Sir Pierce, I think the less we say about that until the war's over, the better. He winks at the general. The general strikes a match. The thrush sings. A jay laughs. The conversation drops. Anna Janska. The Bolshevik Empress. Preface. Anna Janska is frankly a bravura piece. The modern variety theater demands for its turns little plays called sketches to last twenty minutes or so. And to enable some favorite performer to make a brief but dazzling appearance on some barely passable dramatic pretext. Miss Lilla McCarthy and I, as author and actress, have helped to make one another famous on many serious occasions, from Man and Superman to Androcles, and Mr. Charles Ricketts has not disdained to snatch moments from his painting and sculpture to design some wonderful dresses for us. We three unbent as Mrs. Siddons, Sir Joshua Reynolds, and Dr. Johnson might have unbent to devise a turn for the Coliseum Variety Theatre. Not that we would set down the art of the Variety Theatre as something to be condescended to, or our own art as elephantine. We should rather crave indulgence as three novices fresh from the awful legitimacy of the highbrow theatre. Well, Miss McCarthy and Mr. Ricketts justified themselves easily in the glamour of the footlights, to the strains of Tchaikovsky's 1812. I fear I did not. I have received only one compliment on my share. And that was from a friend who said, it is the only one of your works that is not too long. So I have made it a page or two longer, according to my own precept, embrace your reproaches, they are often glories in disguise. Dramatis Personi General Stramfest. Lieutenant Schneidkind. The Grand Duchess. Two soldiers. Anna Janska. The General's office in a military station on the East Front in. Beosha. An office table with a telephone, writing materials, official papers, etc., is set across the room. At the end of the table, a comfortable chair for the General. Behind the chair, a window. Facing it at the other end of the table, a plain wooden bench. At the side of the table, with its back to the door, a common chair, with a typewriter before it. Beside the door, which is opposite the end of the bench, a rack for caps and coats. There is nobody in the room. General Stramfest enters, followed by Lieutenant Schneidkind. They hang up their cloaks and caps. Schneidkind takes a little longer than Stramfest, who comes to the table. Stramfest. Schneidkind. Schneidkind. Yes, sir. Stramfest. Have you sent my report yet to the government? He sits down. Schneidkind. Coming to the table. Not yet, sir. Which government do you wish it sent to? 
He sits down. Stramfest. That depends. What's the latest? Which of them do you think is most likely to be in power tomorrow morning? Schneidkind. Well, the provisional government was going strong yesterday. But today they say that the prime minister has shot himself, and that the extreme left fellow has shot all the others. Stramfest. Yes, that's all very well, but these fellows always shoot themselves with blank cartridge. Schneidkind. Still, even the blank cartridge means backing down. I should send the report to the Maximilianists. Stramfest. They're no stronger than the Opetishavians. And in my own opinion the moderate Red Revolutionaries are as likely to come out on top as either of them. Schneidkind. I can easily put a few carbon sheets in the typewriter and send a copy each to the lot. Stramfest. Waste of paper. You might as well send reports to an infant school. He throws his head on the table with a groan. Schneidkind. Tired out, sir. Stramfest. Oh Schneidkind, Schneidkind, how can you bear to live? Schneidkind. At my age, sir, I ask myself how can I bear to die? Stramfest. You are young, young and heartless. You are excited by the revolution, you are attached to abstract things like liberty. But my family has served the Panjandrums of Boeotia faithfully for seven centuries. The Panjandrums have kept our place for us at their courts, honored us, promoted us, shed their glory on us, made us what we are. When I hear you young men declaring that you are fighting for civilization, for democracy, for the overthrow of militarism. I ask myself how can a man shed his blood for empty words used by vulgar tradesmen and common laborers, mere wind and stink. He rises, exalted by his theme. A king is a splendid reality, a man raised above us like a god. You can see him, you can kiss his hand, you can be cheered by his smile and terrified by his frown. I would have died for my panjandrum as my father died for his father. Your toiling millions were only too honored to receive the toes of our boots in the proper spot for them when they displeased their betters. And now what is left in life for me? He relapses into his chair discouraged. My panjandrum is deposed and transported to herd with convicts. The army, his pride and glory, is paraded to hear seditious speeches from penniless rebels, with the colonel actually forced to take the chair and introduce the speaker. I myself am made commander-in-chief by my own solicitor, a Jew, Schneidkind. A Hebrew Jew. It seems only yesterday that these things would have been the ravings of a madman, today they are the commonplaces of the gutter press. I live now for three objects only, to defeat the enemy, to restore the panjandrum, and to hang my solicitor. Schneidkind. Be careful, sir, these are dangerous views to utter nowadays. What if I were to betray you? Stramfest. What? Schneidkind. I won't, of course, my own father goes on just like that, but suppose I did? Stramfest. Chuckling. I should accuse you of treason to the revolution, my lad. And they would immediately shoot you, unless you cried and asked to see your mother before you died, when they would probably change their minds and make you a brigadier. Enough. He rises and expands his chest. I feel the better for letting myself go. To business. He takes up a telegram, opens it, and is thunderstruck by its contents. Great heaven. He collapses into his chair. This is the worst blow of all. Schneidkind. What has happened? Are we beaten? Stramfest. Man. Do you think that a mere defeat could strike me down as this news does, I, who have been defeated thirteen times since the war began? Oh, my master, my master, my panjandrum. He is convulsed with sobs. Schneidkind. They have killed him? Stramfest. A dagger has been struck through his heart. Schneidkind. Good God. Stramfest. And through mine, through mine. Schneidkind. 
Relieved. Oh, a metaphorical dagger. I thought you meant a real one. What has happened? Stramfest. His daughter the Grand Duchess Anna Janska, she whom the Pangendrina loved beyond all her other children, has, has, he cannot finish. Schneidkind. Committed suicide? Stramfest. No. Better if she had. Oh, far far better. Schneidkind. In hushed tones. Left the church? Stramfest. Shocked. Certainly not. Do not blaspheme, young man. Schneidkind. Asked for the vote? Stramfest. I would have given it to her with both hands to save her from this. Schneidkind. Save her from what? Dash it, sir, out with it. Stramfest. She has joined the revolution. Schneidkind. But so have you, sir. We've all joined the revolution. She doesn't mean it any more than we do. Stramfest. Heaven grant you may be right. But that is not the worst. She has eloped with a young officer. Eloped, Schneidkind, eloped. Schneidkind. Not particularly impressed. Yes, sir. Stramfest. Anna Janska, the beautiful, the innocent, my master's daughter. He buries his face in his hands. The telephone rings. Schneidkind. Taking the receiver. Yes, GHQ. Yes. Don't ball, I'm not a general. Who is it speaking? Why didn't you say so? Don't you know your duty? Next time you will lose your stripe. Oh, they've made you a colonel, have they? Well, they've made me a field marshal, now what have you to say? Look here, what did you ring up for? I can't spend the day here listening to your cheek. What? The Grand Duchess. Stramfus starts. Where did you catch her? Stramfist. Snatching the telephone and listening for the answer. Speak louder, will you, I am a general. I know that, you dolt. Have you captured the officer that was with her? Damnation. You shall answer for this, you let him go, he bribed you. You must have seen him, the fellow is in the full dress court uniform of the Pandorobajinsky Hussars. I give you twelve hours to catch him or, what's that you say about the devil? Are you swearing at me, you? Thousand thunders. To Schneidkind. The swine says that the Grand Duchess is a devil incarnate. Into the telephone. Filthy traitor, is that the way you dare speak of the daughter of our anointed Panjandrum? I'll. Schneidkind. Pulling the telephone from his lips. Take care, sir. Stramfest. I won't take care. I'll have him shot. Let go that telephone. Schneidkind. But for her own sake, sir. Stramfest. Eh. Schneidkind. For her own sake they had better send her here. She will be safe in your hands. Stramfest. Yielding the receiver. You are right. Be civil to him. I should choke. He sits down. Schneidkind. Into the telephone. Hello. Never mind all that, it's only a fellow here who has been fooling with the telephone. I had to leave the room for a moment. Wash out. And send the girl along. We'll jolly soon teach her to behave herself here. Oh, you've sent her already. Then why the devil didn't you say so, you? He hangs up the telephone angrily. Just fancy, they started her off this morning, and all this is because the fellow likes to get on the telephone and hear himself talk now that he is a colonel. The telephone rings again. He snatches the receiver furiously. What's the matter now? To the general. It's our own people downstairs. Into the receiver. Here. Do you suppose I've nothing else to do than to hang on to the telephone all day? What's that? 
not men enough to hold her. What do you mean? To the general. She is there, sir. Stramfest. Tell them to send her up. I shall have to receive her without even rising, without kissing her hand, to keep up appearances before the escort. It will break my heart. Schneidkind. Into the receiver. Send her up. Cha. He hangs up the receiver. He says she is halfway up already, they couldn't hold her. The Grand Duchess bursts into the room, dragging with her two exhausted soldiers hanging on desperately to her arms. She is enveloped from head to foot by a fur-lined cloak, and wears a fur cap. Schneidkind. Pointing to the bench. At the word go, place your prisoner on the bench in a sitting posture. And take your seats right and left of her. Go. The two soldiers make a supreme effort to force her to sit down. She flings them back so that they are forced to sit on the bench to save themselves from falling backwards over it, and is herself dragged into sitting between them. The second soldier, holding on tight to the Grand Duchess with one hand, produces papers with the other, and waves them toward Schneidkind, who takes them from him and passes them on to the general. He opens them and reads them with a grave expression. Schneidkind. Be good enough to wait, prisoner, until the general has read the papers on your case. The Grand Duchess. To the soldiers. Let go. To Stramfest. Tell them to let go, or I'll upset the bench backwards and bash our three heads on the floor. First soldier. No, little mother. Have mercy on the poor. Stramfest. Growling over the edge of the paper he is reading. Hold your tongue. The Grand Duchess. Blazing. Me, or the soldier. Stramfest. Horrified. The soldier, madam. The Grand Duchess. Tell him to let go. Stramfest. Release the lady. The soldiers take their hands off her. One of them wipes his fevered brow. The other sucks his wrist. Schneidkind. Fiercely. Tension. The two soldiers sit up stiffly. The Grand Duchess. Oh, let the poor man suck his wrist. It may be poisoned. I bit it. Stramfest. Shocked. You bit a common soldier. The Grand Duchess. Well, I offered to cauterize it with the poker in the office stove. But he was afraid. What more could I do? Schneidkind. Why did you bite him, prisoner? The Grand Duchess. He would not let go. Stramfest. Did he let go when you bit him? The Grand Duchess. No. Patting the soldier on the back. You should give the man a cross for his devotion. I could not go on eating him, so I brought him along with me. Stramfest. Prisoner. The Grand Duchess. Don't call me prisoner, General Stramfest. My grandmother dandled you on her knee. Stramfest. Bursting into tears. Oh God, yes. Believe me, my heart is what it was then. The Grand Duchess. Your brain also is what it was then. I will not be addressed by you as prisoner. Stramfest. I may not, for your own sake, call you by your rightful and most sacred titles. What am I to call you? The Grand Duchess. The revolution has made us comrades. Call me comrade. Stramfest. I had rather die. The Grand Duchess. Then call me Anna Janska, and I will call you Peter Piper as Grandmama did. Stramfest. Painfully agitated. Schneidkind, you must speak to her, I cannot, he breaks down. Schneidkind. Officially. The Republic of Boeotia has been compelled to confine the Panjandrum and his family, for their own safety, within certain bounds. You have broken those bounds. Stramfest. Taking the word from him. You are, I must say it, a prisoner. 
what am I to do with you? The Grand Duchess. You should have thought of that before you arrested me. Stramfest. Come, come, prisoner. Do you know what will happen to you if you compel me to take a sterner tone with you? The Grand Duchess. No. But I know what will happen to you. Stramfest. Pray what, prisoner? The Grand Duchess. Clergyman sore throat. Schneidkind splutters, drops a paper, and conceals his laughter under the table. Stramfest. Thunderously. Lieutenant Schneidkind. Schneidkind. In a stifled voice. Yes, sir. The table vibrates visibly. Stramfest. Come out of it, you fool, you're upsetting the ink. Schneidkind emerges, red in the face with suppressed mirth. Stramfest. Why don't you laugh? Don't you appreciate Her Imperial Highness's joke? Schneidkind. Suddenly becoming solemn. I don't want to, sir. Stramfest. Laugh at once, sir. I order you to laugh. Schneidkind. With a touch of temper. I really can't, sir. He sits down decisively. Stramfest. Growling at him. Yah. He turns impressively to the Grand Duchess. Your Imperial Highness desires me to address you as comrade? The Grand Duchess. Rising and waving a red handkerchief. Long live the revolution, comrade. Stramfest. Rising and saluting. Proletarians of all lands, unite. Lieutenant Schneidkind, you will rise and sing the Marseillaise. Schneidkind. Rising. But I cannot, sir. I have no voice, no ear. Stramfest. Then sit down, and bury your shame in your typewriter. Schneidkind sits down. Comrade Anna Janska, you have eloped with a young officer. The Grand Duchess. Astounded. General Stramfest, you lie. Stramfest. Denial, comrade, is useless. It is through that officer that your movements have been traced. The Grand Duchess is suddenly enlightened, and seems amused. Stramfest continues in a forensic manner. He joined you at the Golden Anchor in Hackensburg. You gave us the slip there. But the officer was traced to Potter Dam, where you rejoined him and went alone to Premzilipal. What have you done with that unhappy young man? Where is he? The Grand Duchess. Pretending to whisper an important secret. Where he has always been. Stramfest. Eagerly. Where is that? The Grand Duchess. Impetuously. In your imagination. I came alone. I am alone. Hundreds of officers travel every day from Hackensburg to Potterdam. What do I know about them? Stramfest. They travel in khaki. They do not travel in full dress court uniform as this man did. Schneidkind. Only officers who are eloping with grand duchesses wear court uniform, otherwise the grand duchesses could not be seen with them. Stramfest. Hold your tongue. Schneidkind, in high dudgeon, folds his arms and retires from the conversation. The general returns to his paper and to his examination of the Grand Duchess. This officer traveled with your passport. What have you to say to that? The Grand Duchess. Bosh! How could a man travel with a woman's passport? Stramfest. It is quite simple, as you very well know. A dozen travelers arrive at the boundary. The official collects their passports. He counts twelve persons, then counts the passports. If there are twelve, he is satisfied. The Grand Duchess. Then how do you know that one of the passports was mine? Stramfest. A waiter at the Potterdam Hotel looked at the officer's passport when he was in his bath. It was your passport. The Grand Duchess. Stuff. Why did he not have me arrested? 
Stramfest. When the waiter returned to the hotel with the police the officer had vanished, and you were there with your own passport. They knouted him. The Grand Duchess. Oh. Stramfest, send these men away. I must speak to you alone. Stramfest. Rising in horror. No, this is the last straw, I cannot consent. It is impossible, utterly, eternally impossible, that a daughter of the imperial house should speak to anyone alone, were it even her own husband. The Grand Duchess. You forget that there is an exception. She may speak to a child alone. She rises. Stramfest, you have been dandled on my grandmother's knee. By that gracious action the dowager Pangendrina made you a child forever. So did nature, by the way. I order you to speak to me alone. Do you hear? I order you. For seven hundred years no member of your family has ever disobeyed an order from a member of mine. Will you disobey me? Stramfest. There is an alternative to obedience. The dead cannot disobey. He takes out his pistol and places the muzzle against his temple. Schneidkind. Snatching the pistol from him. For God's sake, General. Stramfest. Attacking him furiously to recover the weapon. Dog of a subaltern, restore that pistol and my honor. Schneidkind. Reaching out with the pistol to the Grand Duchess. Take it, quick he is as strong as a bull. The Grand Duchess. Snatching it. Aha. Leave the room, all of you except the general. At the double. Lightning. Electricity. She fires shot after shot, spattering the bullets about the ankles of the soldiers. They fly precipitately. She turns to Schneidkind, who has by this time been flung on the floor by the general. You too. He scrambles up. March. He flies to the door. Schneidkind. Turning at the door. For your own sake, comrade. The Grand Duchess. Indignantly. Comrade. You. Go. She fires two more shots. He vanishes. Stramfest making an impulsive movement towards her. My imperial mistress. The Grand Duchess. Stop. I have one bullet left, if you attempt to take this from me. Putting the pistol to her temple. Stramfest. Recoiling, and covering his eyes with his hands. No no, put it down, put it down. I promise everything, I swear anything, but put it down, I implore you. The Grand Duchess. Throwing it on the table. There. Stramfest. Uncovering his eyes. Thank God. The Grand Duchess. Gently. Stramfest, I am your comrade. Am I nothing more to you? Stramfest. Falling on his knee. You are, God help me, all that is left to me of the only power I recognize on earth. He kisses her hand. The Grand Duchess. Indulgently. Idolater. When will you learn that our strength has never been in ourselves, but in your illusions about us? She shakes off her kindliness, and sits down in his chair. Now tell me, what are your orders? And do you mean to obey them? Stramfest. Starting like a goaded ox, and blundering fretfully about the room. How can I obey six different dictators, and not one gentleman among the lot of them? One of them orders me to make peace with the foreign enemy. Another orders me to offer all the neutral countries forty-eight hours to choose between adopting his views on the single tax and being instantly invaded and annihilated. A third orders me to go to a damned socialist conference and explain that Boeotia will allow no annexations and no indemnities and merely wishes to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth throughout the universe. He finishes behind Schneidkind's chair. The Grand Duchess. Damn their trifling. Stramfest. 
I thank your imperial highness from the bottom of my heart for that expression. Europe thanks you. The Grand Duchess. Mize, but, rising. Stramfest, you know that your cause, the cause of the dynasty, is lost. Stramfest. You must not say so. It is treason, even from you. He sinks, discouraged, into the chair, and covers his face with his hand. The Grand Duchess. Do not deceive yourself, General, never again will a panjandrum reign in Boeotia. She walks slowly across the room, brooding bitterly, and thinking aloud. We are so decayed, so out of date, so feeble, so wicked in our own despite, that we have come at last to will our own destruction. Stramfest. You are uttering blasphemy. The Grand Duchess. All great truths begin as blasphemies. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot set up my father's throne again. If they could, you would have done it, would you not? Stramfest. God knows I would. The Grand Duchess. You really mean that? You would keep the people in their hopeless squalid misery? You would fill those infamous prisons again with the noblest spirits in the land? You would thrust the rising sun of liberty back into the sea of blood from which it has risen? And all because there was in the middle of the dirt and ugliness and horror a little patch of court splendor in which you could stand with a few orders on your uniform. And yawn day after day and night after night in unspeakable boredom until your grave yawned wider still, and you fell into it because you had nothing better to do. How can you be so stupid, so heartless? Stramfest. You must be mad to think of royalty in such a way. I never yawned at court. The dogs yawned. But that was because they were dogs, they had no imagination, no ideals, no sense of honor and dignity to sustain them. The Grand Duchess. My poor Stramfest, you were not often enough at court to tire of it. You were mostly soldiering. And when you came home to have a new order pinned on your breast, your happiness came through looking at my father and mother and at me, and adoring us. Was that not so? Stramfest. Do you reproach me with it? I am not ashamed of it. The Grand Duchess. Oh, it was all very well for you, Stramfest. But think of me, of me. Standing there for you to gape at, and knowing that I was no goddess, but only a girl like any other girl. It was cruelty to animals, you could have stuck up a wax doll or a golden calf to worship. It would not have been bored. Stramfest. Stop, or I shall renounce my allegiance to you. I have had women flogged for such seditious chatter as this. The Grand Duchess. Do not provoke me to send a bullet through your head for reminding me of it. Stramfest. You always had low tastes. You are no true daughter of the Panjandrums, you are a changeling, thrust into the Panjandrina's bed by some profligate nurse. I have heard stories of your childhood, of how. The Grand Duchess. Ha, ha. Yes, they took me to the circus when I was a child. It was my first moment of happiness, my first glimpse of heaven. I ran away and joined the troop. They caught me and dragged me back to my gilded cage, but I had tasted freedom, and they never could make me forget it. Stramfest. Freedom. To be the slave of an acrobat. To be exhibited to the public. 2. The Grand Duchess. Oh, I was trained to that. I had learnt that part of the business at court. Stramfest. You had not been taught to strip yourself half naked and turn head over heels. The Grand Duchess. Man, I wanted to get rid of my swaddling clothes and turn head over heels. I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to. I can do it still. Shall I do it now? Stramfest. If you do, I swear I will throw myself from the window so that I may meet your parents in heaven without having my medals torn from my breast by them. The Grand Duchess. Oh, you are incorrigible. You are mad, infatuated. 
You will not believe that we royal divinities are mere common flesh and blood even when we step down from our pedestals and tell you ourselves what a fool you are. I will argue no more with you, I will use my power. At a word from me your men will turn against you, already half of them do not salute you. And you dare not punish them, you have to pretend not to notice it. Stramfest. It is not for you to taunt me with that if it is so. The Grand Duchess. Haughtily. Taunt. I condescend to taunt. To taunt a common general. You forget yourself, sir. Stramfest. Dropping on his knee submissively. Now at last you speak like your royal self. The Grand Duchess. Oh, Stramfest, Stramfest, they have driven your slavery into your very bones. Why did you not spit in my face? Stramfest. Rising with a shudder. God forbid. The Grand Duchess. Well, since you will be my slave, take your orders from me. I have not come here to save our wretched family and our blood-stained crown. I am come to save the revolution. Stramfest. Stupid as I am, I have come to think that I had better save that than save nothing. But what will the revolution do for the people? Do not be deceived by the fine speeches of the revolutionary leaders and the pamphlets of the revolutionary writers. How much liberty is there where they have gained the upper hand? Are they not hanging, shooting, imprisoning as much as ever we did? Do they ever tell the people the truth? No, if the truth does not suit them they spread lies instead, and make it a crime to tell the truth. The Grand Duchess. Of course they do. Why should they not? Stramfest. Hardly able to believe his ears. Why should they not? The Grand Duchess. Yes, why should they not? We did it. You did it, whip in hand, you flogged women for teaching children to read. Stramfest. To read sedition. To read Karl Marx. The Grand Duchess. Shaw. How could they learn to read the Bible without learning to read Karl Marx? Why do you not stand to your guns and justify what you did, instead of making silly excuses? Do you suppose I think flogging a woman worse than flogging a man? I, who am a woman myself. Stramfest. I am at a loss to understand your imperial highness. You seem to me to contradict yourself. The Grand Duchess. Nonsense. I say that if the people cannot govern themselves, they must be governed by somebody. If they will not do their duty without being half-forced and half-humbugged, somebody must force them and humbug them. Some energetic and capable minority must always be in power. Well, I am on the side of the energetic minority whose principles I agree with. The revolution is as cruel as we were, but its aims are my aims. Therefore I stand for the revolution. Stramfest. You do not know what you are saying. This is pure Bolshevism. Are you, the daughter of a panjandrum, a Bolshevist? The Grand Duchess. I am anything that will make the world less like a prison and more like a circus. Stramfest. Ah. You still want to be a circus star. The Grand Duchess. Yes, and be billed as the Bolshevik Empress. Nothing shall stop me. You have your orders, General Stramfest, save the revolution. Stramfest. What revolution? Which revolution? No two of your rabble of revolutionists mean the same thing by the revolution. What can save a mob in which every man is rushing in a different direction? The Grand Duchess. I will tell you. The war can save it. Stramfest. The war? The Grand Duchess. Yes, the war. Only a great common danger and a great common duty can unite us and weld these wrangling factions into a solid commonwealth. Stramfest. Bravo. War sets everything right, I have always said so. But what is a united people without a united army? And what can I do? I am only a soldier. I cannot make speeches, I have won no victories, 
they will not rally to my call. Again he sinks into his chair with his former gesture of discouragement. The Grand Duchess. Are you sure they will not rally to mine? Stramfest. Oh, if only you were a man and a soldier. The Grand Duchess. Suppose I find you a man and a soldier? Stramfest. Rising in a fury. Ah. The scoundrel you eloped with. You think you will shove this fellow into an army command, over my head? Never. The Grand Duchess. You promised everything. You swore anything. She marches as if in front of a regiment. I know that this man alone can rouse the army to enthusiasm. Stramfest. Delusion. Folly. He is some circus acrobat, and you are in love with him. The Grand Duchess. I swear I am not in love with him. I swear I will never marry him. Stramfest. Then who is he? The Grand Duchess. Anybody in the world but you would have guessed long ago. He is under your very eyes. Stramfest. Staring past her right and left. Where? The Grand Duchess. Look out of the window. He rushes to the window, looking for the officer. The Grand Duchess takes off her cloak and appears in the uniform of the Pandorobajinsky Hussars. Stramfest. Peering through the window. Where is he? I can see no one. The Grand Duchess. Here, silly. Stramfest. Turning. You. Great heavens. The Bolshevik Empress.